Section Zero of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Explanatory. How little we know about what we don't know. During my search for a map of the old trails and roads of Minnesota, public libraries were thoroughly investigated, but no book or map could be found showing these old highways. A few old maps in the historical library bore snatches of them, but in their entirety they had disappeared from books and maps, as well as from our state. They might be the foundations for modern roads, but only the names of those modern roads survived, so they were lost. Months of research work failed to resurrect them, although a map was made from the fragmentary pieces on old maps, filled out by what the pioneers who had traveled those roads could furnish. All old maps seemed to have disappeared from the state. We had one of the new territory of Minnesota when it was admitted in 49, but just threw it out when we cleaned house lately. I think it came from Washington, said one dear old pioneer woman. What do you want of those old roads anyway, said another. If you had been over them as I have, you would know how much better these roads are, and be glad they are gone. It was hard to locate them from hearsay, for when we asked, did it go through Alexandria, the answer was, there was no town on it after leaving St. Cloud, so I can't say just where it went but we went to Fort Gary and crossed the river at Georgetown. Finally, after nearly a year's hard work, as we were on our way to the capital to look over the first government surveys, Mr. George Ralph was met, became interested, and drew part of these trails from the old plats for this map. When a surveyor goes into a new country to make a government survey, he is required to place on that plat every trail, road, or plowed field. John Ryan, who worked in the forties, was the only one we found who always followed these directions. He would survey several townships, and there would be the much-wanted road. Some other surveyor would do the one below, and there would be a break. But John would take hold a little further on, and the trail could be joined from the direction shown. Later this map made was compared with old maps since destroyed at the Army Building in St. Paul, and found correct. The three great routes for the Red River carts to St. Paul, the great fur market, which used to come down by the hundreds from the Pembina and Fort Gary country, are shown. One through the Minnesota Valley, one through the Sauk Valley, and the most used of all through the Crow Wing Valley by way of Leaf Lake. They used to come to the headwaters of the Mississippi in 1808. Footnote From Captain Alexander Henry's diary about the Red River country in 1801, presented to Ottawa. He also says that there were 1,500 of these carts there in 1808. End footnote. The Wabasha Prairie Road, called Winona Trail on this map, was a very old one, as also were those leading to the sacred pipestone quarries and the sacred spirit lake. There is a tradition that there was a truce between all tribes when these trails were followed. Mrs. J. T. M. The Book Committee A subcommittee of the Old Trails and Historic Spots Committee, Daughters of the American Revolution, appointed by the Chairman. Mrs. James T. Morris Mrs. William J. Morehart Mrs. E. C. Chatfield Mrs. S. R. Van Sant Miss Beatrice Longfellow Miss Rita Kelly Mrs. F. W. Little Mrs. O. H. Shepley Mrs. Alonzo Phillips, Mrs. Guy Maxwell, Miss Marion Moyer, Mrs. E. A. Welch, Miss Ida Wing, Mrs. Mary E. Partridge, Mrs. L. Torrance, Miss Stella Cole, Mrs. C. A. Bierman, Mrs. Charles Keith, Miss Emily Brown, Mrs. G. C. Lyman, Mrs. A. B. Kercher, Mrs. W. S. Woodbridge, Miss K. Maud Clume.
THE REASON When I was a child, my grandmother, Lucy Leavenworth Sherwood, used to show us a little map drawn on the back of a cotillion invitation by her cousin Henry Leavenworth, the first officer at Fort Snelling. He was there in 1819. It was yellow with age, but showed Fort Snelling, Lake Harriet, named for his wife, other lakes, and two rivers. That yellow bundle of letters read to us, and the stories she told of this, her favorite cousin, as he had told them to her, never failed in breathless interest. Few of them remain with me. The painted Indian in his canoe on the river, the Indian runner, stand out vividly. But the valuable stories contained in those old letters are gone. Nothing was ever a greater surprise than the loss of those stories when I tried to recall them years later. The Bible with the map, and all those letters were burned when the home was destroyed by fire. These valuable data have disappeared. The knowledge that this was so made me listen with the greatest attention to stories told by the old settlers and record them. All at once the realization came that they, too, were fast disappearing, taking their stories with them. It was impossible for me to get all these precious reminiscences before it was too late. It must be done at once by a large number of interested women. These were found in our committee, who have gathered these data most lovingly, and financed this book. The proceeds are for patriotic work in Minnesota, as deemed best by the committee. It is hoped that our first work will be the raising of a monument to the pioneer women of our state. Those unsung heroines, should not their heroism be heralded while some still live? We thank these dear friends who have made this little volume possible by their warm interest. Every item in this book has been taken personally from a pioneer. Each one is a mesh in a priceless lace fabric, that fabric, Minnesota history. If each mesh is not flawless, if age has weakened them, does not the pattern remain? Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris End of Section Zero Section 1 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Old Trails Chapter. Minneapolis. Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. J.T. Morris. Mr. Eli Pettijohn, 1841. Mr. Pettijohn, now 95 years old, footnote. All pioneers over 90 are so introduced as we feel that no state can show so large a number who have the same mentality. End footnote. Clear in memory, patriarchal in looks, says, I came to what is now Minnesota, but it was then part of Wisconsin Territory, April 16, 1841. I was on my way to work for the Williamsons, missionaries at Lackey Parle. I landed from the large steamer, the Alhambra, at the Fort Snelling Landing. I climbed the steep path that led up to the fort, circled the well, and came to the big gate. A sentinel guarded it. He asked me if I wanted to enlist. I said, no, I want to see the fort and find a boarding place. He invited me in. I looked around this stone fort with much interest and could see Sibley House, and the Faribault House across the Minnesota River at Mendota. There were no large trees between the two points, so these houses showed very clearly. The ruins of part of the first fort, which was of wood, was still on the bluff about one block south of the new fort. I asked where I could find a boarding place and was directed to the St. Louis House, near where the water tower now stands. Before proceeding there, I stood and watched the Indians coming to the fort. I was told that they were from Black Dogs, Good Roads, and Shakopee's villages. The trail they followed was deeply worn. This seemed strange as they all wore moccasins. Their painted faces looked very sinister to one who has never before seen them, but later I learned to appreciate the worth of these Indians, who as yet were unspoiled by the white men's firewater. I was told that the St. Louis house had been built after the fort was, by Mr. Baker, a trader, to accommodate people from the south who wanted to summer here. 
it was now deserted by its owners and any one of the sparse settlers or traders would occupy it he said a trader by the name of martin mcleod was living there and that kitson another trader lived at his trading post about fifty yards away from the house there was a good wagon road about where the road is now my friend for such he later became told me it led to the government mill at the falls of st anthony but it took longer to walk it than it did the indian trail that led along the bank of the mississippi so i took this as advised there were many indians on the trail going and coming all at once i heard a great commotion ahead of me indians were running from every direction when i came to a place where they all were i heard lamentations and fierce imprecations i saw the reason there two of their warriors were lying dead and scalped while clambering up the opposite bank of the river three of the sioux's sworn enemies three chippewas could be seen the slain were head men in the tribe the guns and arrows of the sioux could not carry across the river so they escaped for the time being i was afraid the sioux vengeance would fall on me but it did not i soon came to the st louis house while there i saw walter mcleod then a baby mcleod the father had fled from canada at the time of one of the rebellions in company with others but was the only one to survive a terrible blizzard and reach mendota mr sibley at once employed him as he was well educated when he was married later he gave him some fine mahogany furniture from his own home to set up housekeeping with while at the st louis house i walked with the soldier along the indian trail that followed the river bank to the government mill at the falls of st anthony on our way we went down a deep ravine and crossed the creek on a log we could hear the roaring of the falls and walked over to see them they were the most beautiful i have ever seen and were called brown's falls but general leduc in 1852 gave them the name minnehaha i thought i had never seen anything quite so pretty looking as the river and the woods the deer were everywhere and game of all kinds bountiful the soldier told me that no white man could settle here anywhere for ten miles as it was all in the fort snelling reservation that is why the town of st anthony was built on the east side of the river instead of on the west side and why there was no town on this side of the river for many years after we saw some sioux tepees and met the indians constantly they were a fine sturdy race with fine features and smiling faces the soldiers said they could be depended on and never broke a promise the old mill was on the river bank about where we used to take the cars in the old union station it was not then in use as the rocks had broken off leaving it perhaps forty or fifty feet from the falls a flume had to be constructed before it could again be used the falls were a grand sight we heard their roaring long before we could see them and saw the spray sparkling in the sunlight there was a watchman living in a little hut and he gave us a nice meal a few sioux wigwams were near on the other side we could see smoke way up above where the suspension bridge is now he said some frenchmen and half-breeds lived there the place was called st anthony we did not go over he also said there were many white people french scotch and english living in the country upon the red river some were called selkirk settlers he did not know why he said martin mcleod had been one of these we passed some squaws in a big dugout it was thirty feet long there were fourteen of them in the boat there was no boat leaving the fort for some time so i went to mendota crossing the minnesota river in a canoe ferry my business at mendota was to present a letter of introduction to mr sibley manager of the american fur trading company from the missionary board of ohio and see how i could reach laqui parle i arrived at mr sibley's home just about noon he told me he had a boat leaving in two weeks and that i could go on her he said he had several of these boats plying to traverse the sioux he was a gentlemanly looking man and very pleasant spoken with the courtliness that always distinguished him he asked me if i had dined and being informed that i had not invited me to do so i replied i am obliged to you sir i was told that the furniture of massive mahogany had been brought up the river by boat the table was waited upon by an indian woman the meal was bountiful i had a helping of meat very juicy and fine flavored much like tenderloin of today a strip of fat and a strip of lean my host said i suppose you know what this is i replied yes it is the finest roast beef i have ever tasted no said mr sibley this is what we call boss of buffalo and is the hump on the back of a young male buffalo whatever it is it is the best meat i have ever tasted i declared some dried beef on a plate on the end of the table was also delicious 
Mr. Sibley again challenged me to tell what this was, my reply being dried beef. No, said Mr. Sibley, this too is something you have never tasted before. It is bone dried beaver's tail. Over five thousand of them, as well as the skins, have been brought in here during the year. There was also O'Donnell crackers and tea, but no bread. The tea, I was told, had been brought hundreds of miles up the river. I bade my host farewell, thanking him for his entertainment, and thinking I had never met a more courteous gentleman. Mr. Sibley, too, had told me that the St. Louis house was the best place I could stay, so I returned there. For my journey down the river, I had brought with me a tarpaulin and a few of my worldly goods. I hired a man with an ox-cart to take these to the boat before dawn the day it was to leave, preparatory to my early start at sunup. The boat was about sixty feet long, and propelled only by hand-power, furnished by French half-breeds, who pushed it with long poles from the front, running rapidly and then taking a fresh start to push it again. These boats could make about twenty miles a day. They almost reached Shakopee the first day. At ten o'clock the boat tied up and breakfast was served. This was very hot thick soup made of peas and pork, which had been cooked all night over hot coals in a hole in the ground, covered snugly over with earth. It had been wrapped in a heavy tarpaulin and buffalo robe, and when served was piping hot, as it came from this first fireless cooker. Hardtack was served with his soup, and made a most satisfactory meal. The other meal consisted of bacon and hardtack, and at the end of the eighth day had become quite monotonous. Whenever these meals were prepared, the boat was tied to the bank. The mosquitoes, even in the daytime, were so terrible that it was almost impossible to live. I look forward to the time when we could tie up at night, with great apprehension on this account. However, the clerk of the boat came to me and asked if I had a mosquito net with me, and when I said no, invited me to sleep under his, as he said it would be unbearable without one. Just before they tied up for the night, the clerk came to me, saying that he was sorry, but he had forgotten that he had a wife in this village. I spent the night in misery under my tarpaulin, almost eaten alive by the mosquitoes. The half-breeds did not seem to mind them at all. I again looked forward to a night under the mosquito bar, and was again told the same as the night before. During the eight days which this journey consumed, I was only able to sleep a night under the friendly protection of this mosquito bar, as it was always required for a wife. When the boat tied up at Travis the Sioux, Mr. Williamson met me. The trader sent a man to invite the three white men to dine with him. The invitation was accepted with great anticipation. The trader's house was a log cabin. The furniture consisted of roughly hewn benches and a table. An Indian woman brought in the first wooden bowl full of maple sugar, which she placed on one end of the table with bowls and wooden spoons at three places. We were all eyes when we saw these preparations. At last she brought in a large bowl of something which I could see was snow white, and put that in the center of the table. All were told to draw up to the table and help themselves. The bright anticipations vanished when the meal was seen to consist solely of clabbered milk with black-looking maple sugar. Mr. Williamson left me at Travers to go east. Before going, he helped me load all our supplies into the two Red River carts which he had brought. There were six hundred pounds on each. The trail was very easy to follow, and I walked along by the side of the slow-going oxen. By keeping up until late, and getting up at daybreak, I made the trip in seven days. For the first four days, I was followed by a great gaunt shape that made me uneasy. I knew if it was a dog, it would have come nearer. I slept under the cart the first night, but was conscious of its presence as the cattle were restless. On the fourth day of its enforced company, I met a little caravan of carts owned by a Frenchman who was with the half-breeds. I told him of my stealthy companion, and he sent some of the half-breeds after it with their bows and arrows. They followed it four miles into a swamp and then lost it. They seemed suspicious about this particular animal, and went after it half-heartedly. The trader gave me a piece of dough, and told me if it came again to put this in meat and drop it. He said, kill him quick as one gun. My sister, Mrs. Huggins, wife of the farmer at Lackey Parle, was overjoyed to see me. Think what it must have meant to a woman way off in the wilderness in that early day to see anyone from civilization, let alone her brother. I had not seen her in several years. They had a nice little garden and quite a patch of wheat, which I was told was fine for the climate. The seed came from the craw of a wild swan that they had shot. 
it was supposed to have come from the pembina country for those people had wheat long before the missionaries came it was always called red river wheat pemmican which i first tasted on this journey was made by boiling the flesh of any edible animal usually that of buffalo or deer pounding it fine and packing it tight into a sack made of the skin of a buffalo calf then melting the fat and filling the interstices when sewed up it was absolutely air tight and would keep indefinitely it was the most nourishing food that has ever been prepared for many years it was the chief diet of all hunters trappers explorers and frontiersmen pemmican was also made by drying the meat and pulverizing it the bones were then cracked and the marrow melted and poured into this no white man could ever make pemmican right it took a half-breed to do it the red river people had cattle very early the stock at the mission at lackey parle came from there i returned to illinois in the summer of forty three and threshed in the fall i returned and built a house for gideon pond it was a wooden house where their brick one now stands in eighteen forty four i was building a mission building at travers an indian came in one day and told me there was a very sick man about twenty miles away at his camp i went back with him and he brought the white man to the mission after he was better he told me that he was one of six drovers who had been bringing a herd of three hundred cattle from missouri to fort snelling they had lost their compass and then the trail and wandered along until they found a road near what is now sock center there they met a band of sioux the indians killed the cow and when the drovers remonstrated they killed one of them and stampeded the cattle the drovers all ran for their lives two of them managed to elude the indians and took the road leading east our man was one the other was drowned while crossing the river on a log raft the rest were never found many of the cattle ran wild on the prairies the indians used often to kill them and sell the meat to the whites one of the claims at traverse de sioux was for these cattle from the owners of the herd end of section one Section 2 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Missouri Rose Pratt, 1843. In 1842 my father was going to the Wisconsin pineries to work, so mother and we children went along to keep house for him. We came from Dubuque to Lake Pepin. Mr. Fresnel from the camp had heard there were white people coming, so he came with an ox team down the tote road to meet us and our baggage and take us to camp. We found a large log house which we thought most complete. We lived there that winter and Mr. Fresnel and some others boarded with us. A romance was started there. The next spring we took our household goods in a cabin built on a raft, floated down to Nauvoo, and sold the lumber to the Mormons. Joseph Smith was a smart speaker, Mother said, when she responded to the invitation to hear the prophet of the Most High God preach. The children of these people were the raggedest I have ever seen. Mr. Fresnel had his raft lashed to ours and sold his lumber to them, too. We went to St. Paul on the Otter. Mr. Fresnel went with us. When mother saw pig's eye, as St. Paul was then called, she did not like it at all. She thought it was so much more lonesome than the pineries. She begged to go back, but father loved a new country. On landing, we climbed up a steep path. We found only six houses there. One was Jackson's. He kept a store in part of it. In the kitchen, he had three barrels of liquor with spigots in them. The Jacksons were very kind and allowed us to live in their warehouse, which was about halfway down the bluff. We only slept there nights, for we were afraid to cook in a place with powder stored in it, the way that had, so we cooked outside. My sister Caroline had light hair, very, very blue eyes, and a lovely complexion. The Indians were crazy about her. It was her fairness they loved. She was engaged to Mr. Fresnel and wore his ring. The Indian braves used to ask her for this and for a lock of her hair to braid in with theirs, but of course she would never let them have it. She was afraid of them. The interpreter told her to be careful and never let them get a lock of her hair, for if they did and braided it in with theirs, they would think she belonged to them. One day when she was alone in the warehouse, an Indian came in his canoe and sat around watching her. When he saw she was alone, he grabbed her and tried to cut off some of her hair with his big knife. She eluded him by motioning to cut it off herself, but instead ran shrieking to father at Jackson's. He came with a big cudgel, but the Indian had gone in his canoe. 
in the election of forty three in st paul every man there got drunk even if they had never drunk before and many of them had not early in the evening mr august larpenter came into mrs jackson's kitchen to get a drink of liquor he was a very young man she said august where's the other men just as he was turning the spigot in the barrel he tried to look up and tell her but lost his balance and fell over backward while the liquor ran over the floor then he laughed and laughed and told her where they were we built a cabin a few miles out of town our nearest neighbors were the denoyers who kept a halfway house in a three-roomed log cabin their bar was in the kitchen. Besides this, there was a scantily furnished sitting-room and bedroom. Mrs. DeNoyer was a warm-hearted Irish woman when she had not been drinking, but her warm heart never had much chance to show. They bought their liquors at Jackson's. Our house was made from logs, hewed flat with a broad axe. My father was a wonder at hewing. The axe was eight inches wide and had a crooked hickory handle. Some men marked where they were to hew, but father had such a good eye that he could hew straight without a mark. The cracks were filled with blue clay. For windows we had chinkins of wood. Our bark roof was made by laying one piece of bark over another, kind of like shingles. Our floor was of puncheons. This was much better than the bark floors many people had. I used to take much pleasure in watching and hearing the Red River carts come squawking along. They were piled high with furs. The French half-breed drivers would slouch along by them. It seemed as if the small, rough-coated oxen just wandered along the trail. Sometimes a cow would be used. I once saw one of these cows with a buffalo calf. It seemed to be hers. Was this the first cattle When I was nine years old, my father sent me to the spring for a pail of water. I was returning with it, hurrying along as father had just called to me to come quick, when I was surrounded by a band of Sioux warriors on their way to Shakopee to a scalp dance. They demanded the water, but I would not let them have it and kept snatching it away. It tickled them very much to see that I was not afraid. They called to the chief, Little Crow, and he too ordered me to give it to them, but I said, No, my father wants this, you can't have it. At this the chief laughed and said, Tonka Squaw, meaning brave woman, and they left. They had on everything fancy that an Indian could, paint and war bonnets and feathers. They always wore every fancy thing they had to a dance, but in actual war they were unpainted and almost naked. The first soldiers I saw in 1843 were from Fort Snelling. They had blue uniforms with lots of brass buttons and a large blue cap with a leather bridle that they used to wear over the top. Their caps were wide on top and high. The soldiers used to come to Denoyer's to dinner so as to have a change. Mrs. Denoyer was a good cook if she could stay sober long enough. We had split-bottom chairs made out of hickory and brooms made by splitting it very fine, too. These were all the brooms we had in 43. Our hickory brooms were round, but Mr. Fresnel made a flat one for my sister. Once when father was roofing our house, a storm was coming, and he was very anxious to get the shakes on before it came. We had had a bark roof that was awful leaky. Some Indians came along on the other side of the river and made motions that he should come and get them with his boat, the Red Rover. He sometimes ferried the soldiers over. As he did not answer or get off the house, they fired several shots at him. The bullets spattered all around him. He got down from the house and shot at them several times. After that my mother was always afraid that they would come and shoot us when father was not home. I have seen Indians run from Jackson's at the sight of a soldier. They were afraid of them always. My father brought some beautiful pieces of red Morocco to Minnesota, and the last piece of shoemaking he did was to make that into little shoes for me. They had low heels, such as the children have today. My sister was married the first day of January in 44. We lived on the main road between St. Paul and St. Anthony. It just poured all day so that none of the guests could come to the wedding. Mr. Jackson did get there on horseback to marry them, but Mrs. Jackson had to stay at home. The bride, who was a beautiful girl, wore a delaine dress of light and dark blue with a large white lace fichu. Her shoes were of blue cloth to match and had six buttons. She wore white kid gloves and white stockings. Her bonnet was flat, with roses at the sides and a cape of blue lute string. The strings were the same. Wasn't she stylish for a girl who was married New Year's Day in 1844? The wedding dinner was fish, cranberry sauce, and bread and butter. One day a lot of Sioux Indians who were on their way to fight the Chippewas borrowed my sister's wash tub to mix the paint in for painting them up. They got their colored clay from the Badlands. They were going to have a dance. Hole in the Day used to stay all night with us. He always seemed to be a friend of the whites. When the Indians first came to the house, they used to smoke the peace pipe with us, but later they never did. Bears and wolves were very plentiful. We had an outdoor summer kitchen where we kept a barrel of pork. 
one night a bear got in there and made such an awful noise that we thought the indians were on a rampage we often saw timber wolves about the house they would come right up to the door and often followed my father home a french woman by the name of mrs Traverse lived near us she came from little canada her husband bought some dried apples as a treat and she served them just as they were poor thing she was very young when her baby came and she used to get wildly homesick one day she started to walk to little canada carrying her baby a cold rain came on and she was drenched when she was only halfway there she took cold and died in a few weeks from quick consumption strange how so many who had it east came here and were cured while she got it here in the spring when the wheat was sprouting the wild ducks and geese would light in the field and pull it all up they would seize the little sprouts and jerk the seeds up they came by battalions i have seen the fields covered with them they made a terrible noise when rising in the air i have seen the sun darkened by the countless myriads of pigeons coming in the spring they would be talking to each other making ready to build their nests in the woods nothing else could be heard we had one pair of almost unbroken steers and a yoke of old staid oxen the only way my father could drive the steers was to tie ropes to their horns and then jump in the wagon and let them go they would run for miles i was always afraid of them they were apt to stampede and make trouble in finding them if there was a bad storm one evening my father was away and a bad storm approached i took the ropes and told mother i was going to tie the oxen she begged me not to as she feared they would hurt me i had a scheme i opened the front gate and as they came through the partly opened gate threw the ropes over them and quickly tied them in the barn the old oxen i got in without any trouble i tied them and went to reach in behind one to close the barn door and bolt it he was scared and kicked out, knocking me with his shod hoof. I did not get my breath for a long time. The cock of the iron shoe was left sticking in the barn door. Some drovers stayed near us with a large drove of cattle in 45 or 46. They were on their way to the Red River of the North Country. We kept the cattle in our yard and used to milk them. I picked out a cow for Mr. Lapranteur to buy, as I had milked them and knew which gave the richest milk. He put her in a poorly fenced barnyard. She was homesick and bellowed terribly. The herd started on and was gone two days when she broke out and followed them, and the Larpenteurs never saw her again. They had paid thirty dollars for her. I was very anxious to see the falls of St. Anthony, so in the summer of 1844 my brother borrowed an old Red River cart and an old horse from Mr. Francis, who lived in St. Anthony. He drove it over to our house in the evening. The next day, Sunday, we put a board in for a seat, and all three climbed into it. We drove over and saw the falls, which roared so we could hear them a long way off, and were high and grand. We did not see a person either going or coming the six miles, although we were on what was called the main road. The French people always kissed all the ladies on the cheek on New Year's Day when they made calls. In the early day, Irvine built a new house of red brick. A little boy, Alfred Furnell, took a hatchet and went out to play. He got to hewing things, and finally hewed a piece about a foot long out of the corner of that red brick house, making it look very queer. His father asked him who did it. Unlike George Washington, he could tell a lie, and said, A little nigger boy did it. His father tended to the only little boy that was near, regardless of color. Once there was a Sunday school convention in St. Paul. When lunch was called, Mr. Cressy, the minister, said, Now we will go out and have refreshments provided by the young girls who will wait on us. May God bless them, the young men catch them, and the devil miss them. They used to call my sister-in-law Sweet Adeline Pratt. End of section 2. Recording by Denise Nordell of Modesto, California. Section 3 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Gideon Pond. 1843. 90 years old. In 1843, in Lac we had a cow. We paid $30 to the Red River men for her. She had short legs and a shaggy black and white coat. She was very gentle. She was supposed to have come from cattle we bought to Hudson Bay by the Hudson Bay traders. In 1843, we visited the Falls of St. Anthony. There was only a little mill there with a hut for the soldier who guarded it. The Falls were wonderful. I thought I had never seen anything more beautiful. The spray caught the sun, 
and the prismatic colors added to the scene the roaring could be heard a long way off we raised a short-eared corn that was very good and grew abundantly i have never seen any like it since our flour was sent to us from way down the mississippi when we got it it had been wet and was so moldy that we had to chop it out with an axe it took so much soleratus to make anything of it we learned to like wild rice it grew in the shallow lakes an indian would take a canoe and pass along through the rice when it was ripe shaking it into the boat until he had a boat full then take it to the shore to dry i was out to dinner with mr schofield and his wife who came in forty nine it was dark and stormy mrs schofield was first taken home and then mr schofield started for our home we soon found we were lost and drove aimlessly around for some time we came to a rail fence i said perhaps i can find the way i examined this fence carefully and saw that one of the posts was broken then said to mr schofield i know just where we are now i noticed this broken post when i was going to meeting sunday i soon piloted the expedition home in 43 when I was mrs. Hopkins I was standing with mrs. Riggs and mrs. Huggins on the steps of the st. Louis house the Gideon ponds were then living in vacant rooms that anyone could occupy in this old hotel Little three-year-old Edward pond was standing with us He and the little Riggs boy had new straw hats that we had bought of the sutler at the fort the wind blew his hat off suddenly we did not see where it went, but we did hear him cry. We could not find it in the tall grass. Mrs. Riggs took her little boy and stood him in the same place, and we all watched. When the wind blew his hat off, we went where it had blown, and sure enough, there lay the other little hat too. The Indians standing around laughed long and loud at this strategy. Captain Stephen Hanks 1844 94 years old Captain Hanks now in his 95th year hale hearty a great joker and droll storyteller as an own cousin of Abraham Lincoln should be says in the spring of 1840 when a youth I came north from Albany Illinois with some cattle buyers and a drove of 80 cattle for the lumberjacks in the woods north of st. Croix Falls we came up the east bank of the river following roads already made in the thick woods near the chippewa falls i found an elk's antlers that were the finest i ever saw i was six feet and holding them up they were just my height the spread was about the same of course we camped out nights and i never enjoyed meals more than those on that trip the game was so delicious in our drove of cattle was a cow with a young calf when we came to a wide river we swam all the cattle across but that little calf would not go we tried every way that we knew of to make it then thought we would let it come over when it was ready we rested there two days the mother acted wild and we tied her up the morning we were going to start just as it was getting light she broke away and swam the river the calf ran to meet her but the mother just stood in the water and mooed all at once the calf took to the water and swam with the mother to the other side where it made a hearty breakfast after its two days fast i thought i had never seen any animal quite so human as that cow mother when we got to st croix falls i thought it was a metropolis for it was quite a little town i was back and forth across the river on the Minnesota side too in 1843 I helped cut the logs saw them and later raft them down the river to st. Louis This was the first raft of logs to go down the st. Croix River Lumber rafts had gone before our mill had five saws four frame and one muley a muley saw was a saw without a frame It took a good raftsman to get a raft over the falls it took four st. Croix rafts to make one Mississippi raft. I got sixteen dollars a month and found working on a raft I was raised to twenty after a while and to two dollars a day when I could take charge 
In 1844, we had been up in the woods logging all winter on the Snake River. The logs were all in Cross Lake, in the boom waiting for a rain to carry them down to the boom of St. Croix. There was a tremendous amount of them, for the season before the water had been so low that it was impossible to get many out, and we had an unusual supply just cut. One day in May, there was a regular cloudburst. We had been late in getting out the logs as the season was late. The Snake River overran its banks, and the lake filled so full that the boom burst, and away went all those logs with a mighty grinding, heading straight for the Gulf of Mexico. They swept everything clean at the falls, took a mill race even. The mill was pretty well broken up too. We found some of them on the banks along, and some floated in the lake. We recovered over half of them. We built a boom just where still water is today, in still water. Joe Brown had a little house about a mile from there. There were the logs, and the mill at St. Croix was useless. McCusick made a canal from a lake in back and built a mill. The lumbermen came, and soon there was a straggling little village. I moved there myself, one of the first. I used to take rafts of lumber down the river, and bring back a boat for someone loaded with supplies. The first one I brought up was the amulet in 1846. She had no deck, was open just like a rowboat. She had a stern wheel. In 1848, Wisconsin Territory was to be made a state. The people there wanted to take all the land into the new state that was east of the Rum River. We fellows in Stillwater and St. Paul wanted a territory of our own. As we were the only two towns, we wanted the capital of the new territory for one, and the penitentiary for the other. In the spring, in May, I think, I know it was so cold that we slept in heavy blankets, the men from St. Paul sent for us, and about forty of us fellows went over. We slept that night in a little hotel on one of the lower bluffs. It was a long building, with a door in the middle. We slept on the floor, rolled up in blankets. The next day we talked over the questions before mentioned, and it was decided that we should vote against the boundary as proposed, and have a new territory, and that St. Paul should have the capital, and we the penitentiary. The decision was ratified at the convention in Stillwater, the last of August, 1848. The hottest time I ever had in a steamboat race was in May, 1857, running the Galena from Galena to St. Paul. A prize had been offered, free wharfage for the season, amounting to a thousand dollars, for the boat that would get to St. Paul first that year. I was up at Lake Pepin a week before the ice went out, waiting for that three-foot ice to go. It was dreadful aggravating. There was an open channel kind of along one edge, and the ice seemed to be all right back of it. There were twenty boats all waiting there in Bogus Bay. I made a kind of harbour in the ice by chopping out a place big enough for my boat, and she sat in there, cosy as could be. I anchored her to the ice, too. The Nelson, a big boat from Pittsburgh, was there, with a big cargo, mostly of hardware, nails, pretty much. There were several steamers that had come from down the Ohio. When the ice shut in, it cut the Arcola in two, just as if it were a pair of shears and she a paper boat. She sank at once. It shoved the Falls of St. Anthony, a good-sized steamer, way out of the water, on the niggerheads the pioneer sank it broke the wheels of the nelson and another boat and put them out of commission i stayed in my harbor until morning then steamed away up the little new channel the war eagle locked us at the head of the lake and held on i was at the wheel when we came to sturgeon bay i took a cut in through the bar i found it when i was rafting so I knew they did not know about it. That little advantage gained the day for us. As it was, we burned several barrels of resin and took every chance of meeting our maker. We got to St. Paul at two o'clock in the morning. Such a hullabaloo as there was, such a big tar barrel fire. We could plainly see the Kaposia six miles away. 
Christmas the company sent me one hundred dollars which came in handy as I was just married End of section three Section four of old rail fence corners. This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Phil Schempf Old Rail Fence Corners Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris Mr. Caleb Dorr, 1847, 90 years old I came to St. Anthony in 1847 and boarded at the mess house at first. Later I was boarding with the Godfreys and trouble with the Indians was always feared by the new arrivals. One night we heard a terrible hullabaloo, and Mrs. Godfrey called, For Lord's sake, come down! The Indians are here! All the boarders dashed out in scant costume, crying, The Indians are upon us! But it turned out to be only the first chivalry in St. Anthony given to Mr. and Mrs. Lucian Parker. Mrs. Lucian Parker was a Miss Hughes. Mrs. Dorr was never afraid of the Indians, although they seemed very ferocious to her, with their painted faces, stolid looks, and speechlessness. One day she was frying a pan of doughnuts, and had finished about half of them when she glanced up to see seven big braves, hideously painted, standing and watching her with what she thought was a most malevolent look. She was all alone, with nobody even within calling distance. One of the number looked especially ferocious, and her terror was increased by seeing him take up a knife and test it, feeling the edge to see if it was sharp, always watching her with the same malevolent look. Quaking with fear, she passed the doughnuts, first to him. He put out his hand to take the whole pan, but she gave him a jab in the stomach with her elbow and passed on to the next. This occasioned great mirth among the rest of the Indians, who all exclaimed, Tonka Squaw, and looked at her admiringly. When they had finished, they left without trouble. Once I was spending the evening at Birchino's place, when a number of the Red River cart men were there. As they were part Indian and part white, I looked down on them. One of them challenged me to see who could dance the longest. I would not let him win on account of his color, so I danced until my teeth rattled and I saw stars. It seemed as if I was dancing in my sleep, but I would not give up, and I jigged him down. I remember a dance in the mess house in 48, when there were ten white girls who lived in St. Anthony there. They were wonderfully graceful dancers, very agile and tireless. The principal round dance was a three-step waltz without the reverse. It was danced very rapidly. The French four danced in fours, facing, passing through, all around the room was most popular. The square dances were exceedingly vigorous, all jigging on the corners and always taking fancy steps. We never went home until morning, dancing all the time with the greatest vim. This mess house stood between the river and the front door of the old exposition building. The Red River carts used to come down from Fort Garry loaded with furs. There had been a white population in that part of the country and around Pembina long before there was any settlement in what is now Minnesota. The drivers were half-breeds, son of the traders and the hunters. They always looked more Indian than white. In the early days, in remote places, where a white man lived with the Indians, his safety was assured if he took an Indian woman for his wife. These cart drivers generally wore buckskin clothes, tricked out so as to make them gay. They had regular camping places from 12 to 15 miles apart, as that was a day's journey for these carts. As there was not much to amuse us, we were always interested to see the carts, and their squawking was endured, as it could not be cured. It could be heard three miles away. They came down the main road, afterwards called the Anoka Road. The lumber to face the first dam in 47 came from Marine. There had been a mill there since 1834, I believe. We used to tap the maple trees in the forest on Nicollet Island. We had to keep guard to see the Chippewas did not steal the sap. The mess house where I boarded was of timber. It was forty feet square. It had eight or ten beds in one room. Mrs. Malin Black, 1848 when I came to Stillwater in 1848, I thought I had got to the end of the line. I came up on the Sentinel with Captain Steve Hanks. He was a captain of a raft boat then. It took ten days to come from Albany, Illinois. There was nothing to parade over in those days. We took it as it come and had happy lives. Stillwater was a tiny struggling village under the bluffs. Just one street. A little later, 
a few people built in the bluffs and we would climb up the paths holding on to the hazel brush to help us up stillwater was headquarters for minnesota lumbering then we would all gather together and in about two minutes would be having a good time playing cards or dancing the mill boarding house had the largest floor to dance on and we used to go there often we used to waltz and dance contra dances none of these new jigs and not wear any clothes to speak of we covered our hides in those days no tight skirts like now you could take three or four steps inside our skirts and not reach the edge one of the boys would fiddle a while and then some would spell him and he could get a dance sometimes they would dance and fiddle too we would often see bears in the woods they were very thick when we staged it to st paul down the old government road we would go down a deep ravine and up again before we really got started we paid a dollar each way once they charged me a dollar for my little girl sitting in my lap we used to pass jack morgan's once we moved out on the government road three miles from morgan's it was a lonesome place the chippewas and sioux were on the warpath as usual a large party of sioux camped right by us they were dressed for what they were going after a war dance and were all painted and feathered they were looking in the windows always it used to make me sick to see their tracks where they had gone round and round the house my husband was on the survey most of the time so i was there alone with my baby a great deal one sunday i was all alone when a lot of bucks came in i was so frightened i took my baby's little cradle and set it on the table she had curly hair and they would finger it and talk in their lingo when they left i took the baby and hailed the first team going by and made them come and stay with me it was the cormacs from st anthony i made my husband move back to stillwater the next day the sioux killed a chippewa father and mother and took the son twelve years old captive they had the scalp dance in stillwater and the poor child in the center of the circle with his father's and mother's gory scalp dangling from a pole above him i never was so sorry for a young one old dr carley was our doctor our bill was only one dollar for a whole year if he had not had money laid back he could never have lived once in the winter mrs durant and i were going along i was behind her the boys were coasting and went way out on to lake st croix they struck me full tilt and set me right down in one of their laps and away we went i have always gone pell-mell all my life if it comes good luck i take it if bad luck i take it mrs durant went right on talking to me finally she looked around and i had disappeared she was astonished finally she saw me coming back on that sled drawn by the boys and could not understand it she only said lucky it did not break your legs when i explained end of section four chapter five of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phil schempf old rail fence corners by lucy leavenworth wilder morris chapter five mr james mcmullen eighteen forty nine mr mcmullen in his ninetieth year says i started from maine by the steam cars taking them at augusta as i look back now i see what a comical train that was but when i first saw those cars i was overpowered to think any man had been smart enough to make a great big thing like that that could push itself along on the land it seemed impossible but there we were going jerkily along much faster than any horse could run the rails were wood with an iron top and after we had bumped more than usual up came some of that iron through the floor one lady was so scared that she dropped her traveling basket and all the most sacred things of the toilet rolled out she just covered them quickly with the edge of her big skirt and picked them up from under that the piece of iron was in the coach but we threw it out we went by boat to boston and then by rail to the erie canal we were ten days on a good clean canal boat and paid five dollars for board and our ticket i don't remember how long we were on the lakes or what we paid i should say two weeks we landed at chicago it was an awful mud hole the town did not look as big as anoka a man was sending two wagons and teams to galena so i hired them put boards across for seats and took two loads of passengers over we got pretty stiff before we got there i was glad to get that money as i was about strapped i just about bought my ticket up the river 
we bought tickets to st paul three of us took passage on the yankee she was really more of a freight than a passenger boat she only made three trips to st paul that year we bought wood along the way anywheres we could see a few sticks that some settler had cut the indians always came down to see us wherever we stopped i did not take much of a fancy to them devils even then it was so cold the fifteenth day of october that the captain was afraid that his boat would freeze in so would go no further and dumped us in still water cold well i should say it was pretty durn cold i'd been a sailor so knew little about other work on the way up i kept wondering am i a painter blacksmith shoemaker carpenter or farmer on voyages the sailors always got together and discussed the farm they were to have when they saw fit to retire said farm was to be a lot with a vine wreathed bungalow on some village street having talked this question over so much with the boys i felt quite farmerfied though i never used a shovel hoe or any farm tool i said to myself i must find out what i am for once for i only have four shillings my brother-in-law borrowed this for it was agreed that he should go on to st paul as i walked along the one street in stillwater with its few houses i saw a blacksmith's shop with the smith settin and smokin and stopped to look things over there were three yoke of oxen standing ready to be shod they were used to haul square timbers the smith asked me if i could shoe an ox and then slung one up in the sling way off the ground i did not see my way clear to shoe this ox so i saw i was not a blacksmith i could see that there were not houses enough around to make the paintin trade last long so gave that up too in a little lean-to i saw a man fixin a pair of shoes i watched him but saw nothin that looked possible to me so i said to myself surely i'm no shoemaker further i met a young man sauntering along the road and asked him about farming said he you can't raise nothing in this here country it would all freeze up besides the soil's too light well thinks i it takes money to buy a hoe anyway so i guess i'm no farmer i went up to the hotel and stayed all night my brother-in-law had left a tool chest with me i was much afraid that they would ask for board in advance but they did not in the morning the proprietor said i have a job of work i want done is that your chest i said here's the key then he said you are a carpenter i worked a little at boat building so i let him say it i worked sixteen days for him building an addition out of green timber at the end of that time he asked what i wanted for the work i did not know so he gave me twenty-five dollars in shin plasters it was grocer's bank bangor main money all of the money here was then as soon as i got it i hiked out for st anthony where i took to building in earnest i helped build the tuttle mill on the west side in fifty and fifty one tuttle moved from the east side over to the government log cabin where it was building and i boarded with them there i also built the mill at elk river the first fourth of july i was driving logs up above what is now east minneapolis we had a mill with two sash saws that is saws set in a sash settlers were waiting to grab the boards they came from the saw how long it took those saws to get through a log a mill of today would do the same work in one tenth the time we could only saw five thousand feet a day working both saws all the time i helped build the governor ramsey which plied above the falls and up the river she was loaded with passengers each trip going to look over sites for homes i also helped build the h m rice after the railroad was built these boats were moved on land over the falls and taken by river to the south where they were used in the war i first boarded at the mess house of the st anthony water power company this mess house was on a straight line with the front door of the exposition building on the river bank all butter and supplies of that nature were brought a long distance and were not in the best of condition when received so this mess house was called by the boarders the soap grease exchange and this was the only appellation it was known by in old st anthony the first sawmills put up in st anthony could saw from thirty to forty logs apiece a day as there were absolutely no places of amusement the men became great wags one of the first things that was established by them was a police court of regulations with dr murphy as judge as there were no sidewalks a stranger would run in and have to pay a fine such as cigars for the crowd 
if he was found spitting on the sidewalks lawyer whittle was fined two pecks of apples and cigars for wearing a stovepipe hat and so the fun went on day after day mr wells ran for mayor and as there was no opposition the before-mentioned wags decided to have some a colored man named banks had a barber shop that stood up on blocks the boys told him he must run for mayor in opposition they told him he must have a speech so they taught him one which said down 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 and he was to stand in the door and deliver this just as he got to the last down these wags put some timbers under the little building and gently turned it over in the sand it took them a half a day to get it up and everything settled again but at a town where nothing exciting was going on this was deemed worth while if you had half a pint of whiskey in those days and were willing to trade with the indians you could get almost anything they had but money meant nothing to them i remember seeing tame buffalo hitched to the red river carts they seemed to have much the same disposition as oxen when they were tame the oxen on the red river carts were much smaller than those of today and dark colored the most carts i remember having seen passing along at one time was about one hundred these carts were not infrequently drawn by cows the drivers were very swarthy generally dressed in buckskin with a bright colored knit sash about the waist and a coonskin cap with a tail hanging down behind or a broad-brimmed hat in fifty one i built the mill at oak river lane was the only white man living there it was right among the winnebagoes they were harmless but the greatest thieves living they came over to our camp daily and would steal everything not nailed down we used to feed them when we had a barrel full of rounds of salt pork by rounds of pork i mean pork that had been cut clear around the hog it just fitted in a big barrel eli salter was cooking for us one night he had just put supper on the table it was bread tea and about twenty pounds of pork about two rounds there were seven of us and just as we were sitting down four squaws came in nowadays they sing all coons look alike to me but at this time all squaws looked alike to us we could never tell one from the other they ate and ate and ate eli said they seemed like rubber women the table was lighted with tallow dips four of them just as salter was going to pick up that pork each squaw like lightning wet her fingers and put out the candles when we got them lighted again them squaws and the pork was together but not where we were we just charged it to profit and loss among them indians was ed the greatest thief of all he had been for years at a school in chicago and had been their finest scholar the indians were all making dugout canoes and found it hard with their tools i had a fine adze and ed stole it i could not make him bring it back i used to feed the chief well and one day i told him ed had stolen my ads he said i'll make him bring it back sure enough the next day at dusk ed sneaked up and thinking no one was looking threw it in a pile of snow about two feet deep we saw him do it so got it at once we never knew how the chief made him do it once when i was building a mill up at rum river we had to go to princeton to get some things so i started i had to pass a camp of those dirty winnebagoes they had trees across for frames and probably two hundred deer frozen and hanging there i was sneaking by but the old chief saw me and insisted on my coming in to eat i declined hard and said i had had my dinner but i knew all the time they knew better i had on a buffalo overcoat and a leather short coat inside in the teepee they had a great kettle of dog soup as it was a feast each one had a horn spoon and all ate out of the kettle they gave me a spoon and i started in to eat i did not touch it but poured it inside my inside coat for a couple of times when i left the chief went and picked out one of the thinnest poorest pieces of venison there was and insisted on my taking it i was disgusted but did not dare refuse a short distance away i threw it in the snow which was about two feet deep off the trail shortly afterward i met the chief's son and was frightened for i thought he would notice the hole and find what i had done i watched him but he was too drunk to notice and as soon as it began to snow i was safe i guess the dogs got it end of chapter five section six of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. James McMullen, 1849. Mrs. McMullen says, when I first came to St. Anthony in 1849, there were no sand burrs. They did not come until after a flock of sheep had been driven through the town. We always thought that they brought them. The sand was deep and yielding. You would step into it and it would give and give. It would seem as if you never could reach bottom. It would tire you all out to walk a short distance. We soon had boards laid down for walks. Lumber was hard to get, for the mill sawed little and much was needed. The sidewalk would disappear in the night. No one who was building a board house was safe from suspicion. They always thought he had a sidewalk in his house. When we first built our house I wanted a garden. My brother said, you might as well plant seeds on the seashore. But we did plant them and never have I seen such green stuff. I measured one pumpkin vine and it was thirty feet long. Whenever the Red River carts came by, I used to tie the dog to the door latch. I did not want any calls from such rough-looking men as they were. Those carts would go squawking by all day. Later they used to camp where the Winslow house was built. There would be large numbers there, a regular village. Once when I was driving with Mr. McMullen, one of them stopped by us and I said, Oh, see that ox is a cow. In 49 or 50, the old black schoolhouse was the site of an election. I lived near enough to hear them yell, To hell mit Harry Sibley! Hurrah for Lewis Robert! If those inside did not like the way the vote was to be cast, they would seize the voter and out the back window he would come feet first, striking on the soft sand. This would continue until the voter ceased to return or those inside got too drunk or tired to throw him out. The town was always full of rough lumberjacks at these early elections, and for the day they run the town. I used always to make twenty-one pies a week, one for every meal. I had two boarders who were friends of ours. Not that I wanted boarders, but these men had to stay somewhere, and there was no somewhere for them to stay. Each took her friends to help them out. I was not very strong, and cooking was hard on me. There was no one to hire to work. After a very hot day's work, I was sick and did not come down to breakfast. One of the boarders was not working. I came down late and got my breakfast and set a half a berry pie on the table, and went to get the rest of the things. When I came back, it was in the cupboard. The boarder sat reading. I thought I had forgotten and not put it on, so set it on again and went for the tea. When I came back again, the pie was again in the cupboard, and the boarder still studying the almanac. I said, What are you doing to that pie? He said, Keeping it from being et. After this, you make seven pies instead of twenty-one. The other thing's the same. You won't be all wore out. We'll only have them for dinner. And so it was. I suppose there were more pies on the breakfast tables of that little village of St. Anthony than there would be now at that meal in the great city of Minneapolis, for it was then a New England village. Dr. Lysander P. Foster, 1849. I came to Minneapolis on the Ben Franklin. She was a wood burner, and every time her captain would see a pile of wood that some new settler had cut, he would run ashore, tie up, and buy it. A passenger was considered very haughty if he did not take hold and help. My father built his house partly of lumber hauled from Stillwater, but finished with lumber from here, as the first mill at the foot of First Avenue Southeast was then completed. It had one saw only, and so anxious were the settlers for lumber that each board was grabbed and walked off with as soon as it came from the saw. The first school I went to as a boy of fourteen was on Marshall Street Northeast, between Fourth and Sixth Avenues. I was taught by Miss Bacchus. There were two white boys and seven half-breed Bottinos. It was taught much like kindergarten of today, object lessons, as the seven half-breeds spoke only French and Miss Bacchus only English. McGuffey's reader was the only textbook. The Indians were much like white people. The Sioux boys at their camp at the mouth of Bassett Creek were always my playfellows. I spent many happy days hunting, fishing, and playing games with them. They were always fair in their play. The games they enjoyed were mostly shinny and a game played on the ice in the winter. A stick with a long handle and a heavy smooth curved end was thrown with all the strength possible. Some could throw it over a block, the one throwing at the farthest beat. I suppose what I call shinny was really lacrosse. What is now Elwell's addition was a swamp. 
I have run a twelve-foot pole down in many parts of it without touching bottom. Mr. Seacombe, the father of Methodism in Minneapolis, was going to St. Paul to preach. He took a dugout canoe from the old board landing. His friend, Mr. Draper, was with him. It was below the falls where the river has rapids and rocks. They tipped over and were so soaked that St. Paul had to get along that day without them. It was considered a great joke to ask the Domine if he was converted to immersion now that he had practiced it. The peculiarity of the swamp land in St. Paul was that it was all on a ledge and was only about two feet deep. You could touch rock bottom anywhere there, but here a swamp was a swamp and could be any depth. In 1848, half-breeds had gardens and raised famous vegetables up in what is now northeast Minneapolis. I once took my sister over on the logs to pick strawberries on the end of what is now Eastman Island. They were large, very plentiful and sweet. Almost every tree that grew anywhere in the new territory grew there. Black walnut grew there, and on Nicollet Island. Mrs. Silas Farnham, 1849 Mrs. Silas Farnham says, I came to St. Anthony in 1849. My husband had a little storehouse for supplies for the woods, across from our home on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 2nd Street Southeast. A schoolhouse was much needed, so they cleared this out, and Miss Backus taught the first school there. It was also used for Methodist preaching. Our first aid society was held there in 49. I well remember the first 4th of July celebration in 1849. The women found there was no flag, so new one must be made. They procured the materials from Fort Snelling, and the flag was made in Mrs. Godfrey's house. Those working on it were Mrs. Caleb Dorr, Mrs. Lucian Parker, Mrs. Julia and Margaret Farnham, Mrs. Godfrey and myself. I cut all the stars. Mr. William Marshall, who had a small general store, was orator, and no one could do better. That reminds me of that little store. I just thought I'd laugh out loud the first time I went in there. There were packs of furs, all kinds of Indian work, hats and caps, tallow dips and more elegant candles, and a beautiful piece of delaine for white woman, and shoddy bright stuff for the squaws. A barrel of rounds of pork, most used up, but no flour. That was all gone. There was a man shawl, too, kind of draped up. You know men wore shawls in them days. Some hulled corn the Indians done, too, I saw. But to return to that first fourth, it seemed a good deal like a Farnham fourth, for the music, which was just soul-stirring, was sung by them, and the Gould boys. When the Farnhams all got out, it made a pretty big crowd for them days. Perhaps their voices weren't what you call trained, but they had melody. Seems to me nowadays, some of the trained highfalutin voices has just got that left out. Seems so to me. Seems so. All the Farnhams just sung natural, just like birds. Old Dr. Kingsley played the bass viol, so it was soul stirring too. Margaret Farnham, the president of our first aid society, married a Hildreth, Julia Dickerson. In 49, my husband paid a ten cent shin plaster for three little apples, no bigger than crabs. I tried to make these last a long time by just taking a bite now and then, but of course they couldn't hold out forever. The Indians was always around, but we never minded them, always looking in the windows. End of section 6section seven of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil schempf old rail fence corners edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris general william g leduc 1850 92 years old I arrived at St. Paul on the steamboat Dr. Franklin. Among the travelers on board the boat were Mr. and Mrs. Lyman Dayton, and a brother of Goodhue, the editor of the Pioneer Weekly newspaper. The principal, if not the only hotel at that time, was the Central, a frame building about 24 by 60 feet, two stories kept by Robert Kennedy. It was used as a meeting place for the legislature, court, and public offices until something better could be built. Here I found quarters, as did Mr. and Mrs. Dayton. A few days after my arrival, I was walking along the high bank of the river in front of the central house in conversation with a large, robust lumberman who had come out of the woods where he had been all winter logging and was feeling very happy over his prospects. 
Suddenly he stopped, and looking down on the flowing waters of the Mississippi, he exclaimed, See those logs? A number of logs were coming down with the current. What mark is on them? My God, that is my mark! The logs are mine! The boom has broken! I am a ruined man! He went direct to the hotel and died before sundown of cholera, the doctor said. He was hurriedly buried, and there was a cholera panic in St. Paul. The next day, while walking in front of the hotel, Mrs. Dayton called from an open window excitedly to me. Come and help me quick. Mr. Baker has the cholera. Mr. Baker was a boarder at the Central, and a school teacher at that time. Mrs. Dayton was frightened, and said she had given him all the brandy she had, and must have some more. I got more brandy, and she insisted on his taking it, although he was then drunk. He recovered next day, and I have never heard of a case of cholera in Minnesota since that time. I hired a little board shack, about twelve by sixteen feet, at the northeast corner of Third and Robert Street, St. Paul, and put out my sign as attorney and counselor at law, but soon discovered there was little law business in St. Paul, not enough to sustain the lawyers already there, and more coming with every boat. My business did not pay the monthly rent, nine dollars, so I rented a large house on the northwest corner and started a shop selling books and stationery and then this succeeded in making a living on the twenty-second day of july fifty a number of citizens of st paul and some travelers chartered a little stern-wheel steamboat the yankee and intended to explore the st peter river now the minnesota if possible to its source big stone lake we invited the ladies who wished to go and promised them music and dancing a merry time was anticipated and we were eager to see the fertile valley knowing it was to be purchased of the Indians, and opened for settlement to the frontier settlers. The passengers were men mostly, but enough women went to form three or four cotillion sets. The clergy was represented by Reverend Edward Newfield Neal, the medical fraternity by Dr. Potts, statesman by one who had been an aide to General Harrison, and later ambassador to Russia. Another was a graduate of Yale Law School, and of West Point Military Academy. Another, one of the Renvilles, had been interpreter for Nicollet. Another was an Indian trader, Joe Laframbois, who was returning to his post at the mouth of Little Cottonwood. He was noted for his linguistic ability and attainments, and could acquire a talking acquaintance with an Indian language if given a day or two opportunity. Another was a noted Winnebago half-breed, Baptiste, whose Indian dress and habits attracted much attention. As we entered the sluggish current of the St. Peter's at Mendota, the stream was nearly bank full, and it seemed like navigating a crooked canal. The first stop was at an Indian village, fifteen or twenty miles from the Mississippi, called Shakopee, or Little Six Village. Our boat attracted a crowd of all kinds and conditions of Indian village population, not omitting Little Six, who claimed toll for permission to navigate his river. His noisy demand was settled by the trader by some trifling presents, including some whiskey, and we proceeded on our voyage up the river. The next stop was at Traverse de Sioux. Here there was a missionary station, in charge of Mr. Hopkins, from whom we bought the rails of an old fence for fuel. Next we landed at the beautiful level grassy meadow called Belle Prairie, where we tried to have a dance. The next landing was at the mouth of the Blue Earth River, called Mankato where a tempting grove of young ash trees were cut for fuel. Here the passengers wandered about the grove while the boat hands were cutting and carrying the wood. Leaving the blue earth, we slowly ascended the stream, hoping to arrive at the cottonwood where La Frambois promised some fuel for the boat. But night overtook us and Captain Harris tied up to the bank and announced the voyage ended for want of fuel, and that early in the morning he would return. Millions of mosquitoes invaded the boat, Sleep was impossible. A smudge was kept up in the cabin, which gave little relief, and in the morning all were anxious to return. I stationed myself on the upper deck of the boat, with watch and compass open before me, and tried to map the very irregular course of the river. It was approximately correct, and was turned over to a map publisher in New York or Philadelphia, and published in my yearbook. Sometime during this summer I had occasion to visit the falls of St. Anthony, a village of a few houses on the east side of the Mississippi River, ten miles northwest of St. Paul. I crossed the river to the west side in a birch bark canoe, navigated by Tapper, the ferryman for many years after, until the suspension bridge was built. 
Examining the falls, I went down to an old sawmill built by and for the soldiers at Fort Snelling, and measured the retrocession of the fall by the fresh break of the rock from the water raceway, and found it had gone back 103 feet, which seemed very extraordinary until examination disclosed the soft sandstone underlying the limestone top of the falls. Events and persons personally known to me, or told me by my friend, General Henry Hastings Sibley, who was a resident of Minnesota, years before it was a territory. He was the great trader of the Indians, a partner of the American Fur Company, and adopted into the Sioux tribe or nation, the language of which spoke as well or better than the Indians. He told me that Little Crow, chief of the Kaposia Band of Sioux, located on the west side of the Mississippi River, six miles below St. Paul, was a man of unusual ability and discernment, who had chivalric ideas of his duty and that of others. As an instance, he told me the following story. A medium of the tribe had a dream or vision and announced that he would guide and direct two young members of the tribe who were desirous of winning the right to wear an eagle's feather as a sign to all that they had killed and scalped an enemy to the place where this would be consummated. He conditioned that if they would agree to obey him implicitly, they would succeed and return safely home to their village with their trophies. Little Crow's eldest son, a friend of the whites, much beloved by all, and another young man were interested in the venture. He took them into the Chippewa country. They concealed themselves in some dense bushes along a trail used by the Chippewas traveling from camp to camp. Instructions were given that they should fire from cover and on no account show themselves or pursue the Chippewa. They awaited silently in their ambush until two Chippewas came unsuspectedly along the path. When opposite, the Sioux boys fired, and the Chippewa in the lead fell dead. The one in the rear fled with his gun over his shoulder, and was pursued instantly by young little crow with tomahawk in hand. The Chippewa discharged his gun backward as he ran, and killed the young man as he was about to bury his tomahawk in the Chippewa's brain. Little crow's comrade took the scalp of the dead Chippewa, returned to Kaposia, reported to little crow the death of his son, and that his body had been left where he fell. Little Crow at once summoned a number of his tribe, and went to the place where the body lay, dressed it in Indian costume, placed the corpse with his face to the Chippewa country in sitting position against a large tree, laid across his knees the best double-barreled gun in the tribe, and left the body in the enemy's country. When he came to Mendota, and reported the facts to the great trader, Sibley said, Little Crow, why did you give your best gun and fine blankets and all that your tribe prized so highly to the Chippewas? Your son was dead. Why leave his body to his enemies? Little Crow replied, He was killed in the enemy's country, and according to the custom of Indian warfare, his enemies were entitled to his scalp. Therefore I left his body. I left the gun and blankets, that they might know they had killed a man of distinction. Some years subsequently, Little Crow came to his death by carelessness on returning from a duck-hunting expedition. Having stepped ashore from his canoe, he drew his gun out of the canoe, taking it by the muzzle. The gun was discharged into the bowels of the unfortunate chieftain. He was carried to his tent, and sent a message to Sibley to come to him, and bring with him the surgeon then stationed at Fort Snelling. When they arrived, he said, First I will see the surgeon, to whom he said, I am not afraid of death examine my wound and tell me truly if there is a chance for life the surgeon told him he had no possible chance for recovery that he could do nothing but give him some medicine to relieve the pain for that i care not i will now talk with the great trader to whom he said my friend i wish you to be present while i talk with my son to whom i must leave the care of my tribe the son the little crow, who was known as the leading devil in the massacre of the whites in 1862, was then a grown boy. The old chieftain said to him, My boy, I must now die, and you will succeed to the chieftaincy of the tribe. I thought it would have been the duty of your older brother, who was a good boy, in whom I trusted and whom I hoped would prove a good leader to the people. But he is dead, and I also must die, and leave you to succeed me. You have always been a bad boy, and I have asked the great trader, my friend, to attend and listen to my last instructions to you, and to advise you in all matters of interest to the tribe. And I wish you to take heed to his advice. He is my friend, and the friend of my people, 
and in all matters of importance i desire you to listen to his advice and follow his directions especially i charge you never to quarrel with the whites you may go now my son and remember what i have said to you then to sibley he said my friend you have heard me talk to my wayward son for my sake look after his conduct and the welfare of my people for i feel impressed to tell you that the boy will be the ruin of his people the boy was the leader in the massacre of twelve hundred white men women and children on the minnesota frontier in eighteen sixty two and was shot and killed near the town of hutchinson in eighteen sixty three another story of early time i had from general sibley concerning the claimant of the land and property which afterwards became and is now part of the city of st paul but was then known as pig's eye so called because the eyes of the old voyageur for whom it was named were inclined somewhat in the manner of a pig joseph r brown had a trading post on gray cloud island sixteen miles below st paul and was a justice of the peace with unlimited jurisdiction pig's eye an old toughened voyageur and a young fellow both claimed the same quarter section of land and agreed to refer the quarrel to brown accordingly both appeared at his place on gray cloud and stated their cases to brown brown knowing that he had no jurisdiction over land titles and seeing an opportunity for a joke informed them that the one who first put up a notice that he would write and give them would be entitled to possess the land they must strip for the race and he would give them a fair start which accordingly he did by marking a line and causing them to tow the line and then solemnly giving the word go started the sixteen-mile race and retired to his cabin to enjoy the joke the young man started off at his best speed thinking he had an easy victory before him but the experienced old pig's eye knowing it was a sixteen-mile race took a stride he could keep up to the end and placed his notice first on the property hence the first name of st paul was pig's eye the second and real name was given by the missionary priest father gaultier who told me that having occasion to publish the marriage notice of vitale guerin he had to give the little log confessional on the hill some name and as st croix and st anthony and st peter had been honored in this neighborhood he thought st paul should receive the distinction end of section seven Section 8 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. Reuben Robinson, 1850. Mr. Reuben Robinson, 95 years old, says, I came to St. Anthony and worked at the mill near St. Anthony Falls. A fine bathing place had been discovered near the mill, and was much used by the few women and men of St. Anthony, who came over in boats for the purpose. One day when I was at work, I heard hollering and thought someone must have gone beyond his depth. I went out and looked around, saw nobody, but still heard the calling. I finally looked at a pile of logs near the falls, and there saw a man who was calling for help. I threw a rope to him several times, which he finally was able to grasp, and I hauled him in hand over hand. His clothing was all wet and bedraggled, but a straw hat was still on his head, although it was so wet that the green band had run into the straw. No trace of his boat was ever found. As soon as he landed, he took a whiskey flask from his pocket and took a long pole, which disgusted me very much. I discovered that these long poles were what was accountable for his trouble as he had taken a boat when he was drunk and had gone too near the falls. When we came through Chicago, the mud was up to the hubs everywhere. Much of the time, the bottom of the stage was scraping it. In one deep hole, where the old road had been, a big scantling stuck up with these words painted on it. They leave all hope who enter here. I remember killing a snake over seven feet long down near Minnehaha Falls. Snakes were very abundant at that time. When I was in the Indian War, one of the Indian scouts showed me how to find the Indians' underground storehouses. Only an Indian could find these. The soldiers had hunted for days without success, but the Indians succeeded in a short time, 
and found a community storehouse holding several hundred bushels of corn this was six feet under the ground and looked exactly like the rest of the ground except that in the center a small tuft of grass was left which to the initiated showed the place i had a serious lung trouble and was supposed to have consumption as i was always coughing after i was married my wife induced me to take the water cure she kept me wrapped in wet sheets for several days at the end of that time an abscess of the lungs was relieved and my cough was cured this climate has cured many of lung trouble i have to laugh when i think how green i was about these western places before i left my old home at troy new york i bought twelve dollars worth of fishing tackle and a gun also quantities of cartridges i never used any of them for the things here were much more up to date when i went to church i was astonished i never saw more feathers and fancy dressing anywhere in eighteen sixty hogs were two dollars a hundred and potatoes fourteen cents a bushel mrs samuel b dresser eighteen fifty we took a steamer from galena to stillwater as everyone did in those days they were paying the sioux indians at red wing a noble-looking chief in a white blanket colored band with eagle feathers colored and beautifully worked buckskin shirt leggings and moccasins was among them he stands out in my mind as the most striking figure i ever saw there was so much majesty in his look we took a bateau from stillwater to claus creek my uncle came the year before and had a blockhouse where troutmere now is four miles from osceola and we visited him a little later when i was seven years old we went to taylor's falls minnesota to live there were only three houses there we rented one end of a double block house and school was held in the other end our first teacher in fifty one and fifty two was susie thompson there were thirty five scholars from st croix falls and our own town boats came up the river to taylor's falls on regular trips in our house there was a large fireplace with crane hooks to cook on these hooks were set in the brick we hung anything we wanted to cook on them the fire was directly under them my mother brought a crane that was a part of andirons with her but we never used that i was married when i was sixteen my husband built a house the next year the shingles were made by hand and lasted forty years the enamel paint came from st louis and was as good as new fifty years afterward the paper too which was a white background with long columns of flowers depending from the top was good for forty years in osceola there was a grist mill that cracked the grain the dell's house looks the same now as it did in fifty two when i first remember it in fifty two i saw a party of chippewa indians hiding in the rough ground near taylor's falls they said they were going to fight the sioux some white men came and drove them away they killed a chippewa a sioux warrior looking for chippewa scalps found the dead indian skinned his whole head and rode away with the white men with the scalp in his hand whooping and hollering there was a road from point douglas through taylor's falls to fond du lac it went through stillwater and sunrise prairie too i used to watch it as the indians passed back and forth on it and wish i could go to the end of it it seemed to me that adventure waited there we used to go to dances and dance the three-step waltz and the french four with circle of fours all around the room and many other old-style dances too we put in all the pretty fancy steps in the cotillion no prettier sight could be than a young girl with arms circled above her head jigging on the corners my wedding dress was a white muslin made very full around the bottom and plaited in at the waist my traveling dress was made the same it was brown and white shepherd check and had eight breadths of twenty-seven inch silk that silk was in constant wear for fifty years and if it was not all cut up would be just as good today my shoes were brown cloth to match and had five or six buttons i had another pair that laced up on the outside nothing has ever fitted the foot like those side lace shoes my traveling cape was of black net with bands of silk very ample looking i wore a white straw bonnet trimmed with lavender the strings were white lute string and the flowers in front of that flaring rim were small and dainty looking there was a wreath of them on the crown too when i tied this bonnet on i felt very grown up for a sixteen-year-old bride 
Mr. Luther Webb, Indian agent, used to visit us often. The Indians were always very curious, and spent much of the time before our windows watching everything we did. In time we were as calm with those glittering black eyes on us as we would have been if a gentle old cow had been looking in. Mrs. Rufus Farnham, 1850 I moved to the farm on what is now Lindale Avenue North sixty-four years ago. The Red River carts used to pass along between my home and the river, but I was always holding a baby under one arm and drawing water from the well, so could not tell which way they went. I only saw them when they were straight in front of me. Women in those days never had time to look at anything but work. Sugar came in a large cone. It was cracked off when needed. When purchased, a blue paper was wrapped around it. This, when boiled, made a dye of a lovely lavender shade. It was used to dye all the delicate fabrics, like fringe or silk crepe. I have a silk shawl, which I dyed in this way in 56, that still retains its color. Later I paid 50 cents for three teacups of sugar. This just filled a sugar bowl. My mother used to live on First Street North. Once, when I was spending the day with her, a dog sled from Fort Garry, now Winnipeg, passed the house. There were never many of these after we came, for it seemed that the Red River carts had taken their places. There were six dogs to this team. They laid down and hollered just in front of the house. I suppose they were all tired out. The half-breed driver took his long rawhide whip and gave them a few cracks, and they got up and went whimpering on to St. Paul. When they were rested, they would come back from St. Paul like the wind. It took only a few days for them to come and go, to and from the fort while it took the carts many weeks. The drivers would have a suit of skins with the hair inside. They never forgot a bright-colored sash. A bridal couple came with a dog team once, after I moved here, but the sled I saw only had a load of fine furs. I made sour emptyings bread. Very few could make it. I stirred flour, sugar, and water together until it was a little thicker than milk, and then set it aside to sour. When it was thoroughly sour, I put in my saleratus, shortening and flour enough to make it stiff. It took judgment to make this bread, but everyone thought there was nothing like it. Captain John Vanderhork, 1850 I always relied on an Indian, just as I did on a white man, and never found my confidence misplaced. I often went hunting with them on the sloughs out of St. Paul. Game was very plentiful. My Indian companion and I would both have a gun. He would paddle the frail canoe. We would see the game. Bang would go my gun. Bang would go his. I would be loading while he was shooting. All game was plenty, plenty. Well, I remember the woodcock. Long bill, big, big eyes. Look at you so trustingly, I never could shoot them. There were such mighty flocks of ducks and geese in season that their flight would sound like a train of cars does now. Once I went deer hunting and saw six does. They turned their beautiful faces towards me and showed no fear. I could not shoot them. I have seen strings of those Red River carts, and many, many in a string, loaded with furs coming from Fort Garry or Pembina. End of section 8section nine of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org old rail fence corners edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris mrs james pratt 1850. My father moved to Minnesota Territory in 50. We lived with my uncle, Mr. Tuttle, who had a mill for some time on this side. He was living in a small house belonging to the government, but my father and he added two more rooms so we could stay with them. In the spring, my father took up land and built a house down by the river not far from the Minnehaha Falls. He began to work on the Godfrey Mill at Minnehaha. My mother was very timid. The sight of an Indian would nearly throw her into a fit. 
you can imagine that she was having fits most of the time for they were always around timber wolves too were always skulking around and following the men but i never knew them to hurt anyone father said it used to make even him nervous to have them keep so near him they would be right close up to him as close as a dog would be he always took a lively gait and kept it all the time one night father was a little late and mother had seen more terrifying things than usual during the day so she was just about ready to fly she always hated whippoorwills for she said they were such lonesome feeling things this night she stood peering out listening intently then she who had tried so hard to be brave broke into wild lamentations saying she knew the wolves or indians had killed father and she would never see him again my grandmother tried to calm her but she would not be comforted until father came then he had a great time getting her settled down she said the whippoorwills seemed to say as she looked out in the blackness of the night oh he's killed oh he's killed what these timid town-bred women used to all the comforts of civilization suffered as pioneers can never be fully understood after that whenever father was late little as i was and i was only four i knew what mother was going through and would always sit close to her and pat her our home only had a shake roof and during a rain it leaked in showers my little sister was born just at this time during an awful storm we thought it would kill mother but it did not seem to hurt her the indians used to come and demand meat all we had was bacon we gave them all we had but when they ate it all up they demanded more we were much frightened but they did not hurt us father used to tap the maple trees but we could not get any sap for the indians drank it all that winter we lived a week on nothing but potatoes our nearest neighbor was mrs wass she had two little girls about our ages they had come from ohio we used to love to go there to play and often did so once when i was four her little girls had green and white gingham dresses i thought them the prettiest things i had ever seen and probably they were for we had little when mother undressed me that night two little green and white scraps of cloth fell out of the front of my little low-necked dress mother asked at once if mrs wass gave them to me and i had to answer no then she said in the morning you will have to take them back and tell mrs wass you took them i just hated to and cried and cried in the morning the first thing she took me by the hand and led me to the edge of their ploughed field and made me go on alone when i got there mrs wass came out to meet me i said i've come to bring these she took me up in her arms and said you dear child you are welcome to them but my mother would not let me have them i never took anything again we had a newfoundland dog by the name of sancho a most affectionate faithful beast a neighbor who had a lonely cabin borrowed him to stay with his wife while he was away someone shot him for a black bear no person was ever lamented more in fifty four my father built the first furniture factory at minnetonka mills our house was near it 
the trail leading from anoka to shakopee went right by the house and it seemed that the indians were always on it there were no locks on the doors and if there were it would only have made the indians ugly to use them late one afternoon we saw a big war party of sioux coming they had been in a scrimmage with the chippewas and had their wounded with them and many gory scalps too we ran shrieking for the house but only our timid mother and grandmother were there the sioux camped just above the house and at night had their war dance i was only seven years old at the time but i shall never forget the awful sight of those dripping scalps and those hollering whooping fiends as they danced i think they must have been surprised in camp by the chippewas for they had wounded squaws too with them one old one was shot through the mouth the men were hideously painted one side of one's face would be yellow and the other green it seemed no two were exactly alike one sunday morning i was barefoot playing in the yard there were bushes around and i heard a queer noise like peas rattling in a box i could not see what made it so finally ran in and told father he came out and lifted up a wide board over two stones he jumped back and called to me to run in the house then grabbed an axe and cut the head off a huge rattlesnake it had ten rattles we never saw its mate the first school taught in minneapolis proper was taught by clara tuttle a niece of calvin tuttle in one of the rooms of the government log cabin where we were living in fifty one the pupils were her cousins miss tuttle returned to the east the next summer and died of consumption my cousin luella tuttle the next year used to go over to st anthony to school on the logs jumping from one to the other rather than wait for the ferry in fifty eight we returned to minneapolis to live old dr ames was our doctor he was one of the finest men that ever lived i had terrible nosebleeds his treatment was to whittle pine plugs and insert them in the nostrils it always cured no matter how poor a patient was dr ames always did his best no child was ever afraid of him he was very slow in his movements end of section nine section ten of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Denise Nordell. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth, Wilder Morris. Mrs. Mary Harrison, 1850. I came to Minnesota from Maine. I had never been on the railroad or seen a train, so when I saw what I thought then was the most awe inspiring and stupendous mechanism there was ever going to be in the world, I took my seat with elation and bumped along on that crazy track with the greatest joy. I took no thought of danger now i should want an insurance of a hundred thousand dollars to ride a block under those circumstances the rails were of wood with an iron top i have heard my friends say that these iron pieces sometimes came up through the floor we went by water to boston again by rail and then by the erie canal and great lakes we landed at milwaukee it was a little town they were just building their first sidewalks then i can shut my eyes and see those little narrow walks now we drove in wagons with boards across for seats from milwaukee to galena weren't those seats easy somewhere in wisconsin we stopped at a little log hotel overnight we knew that rattlesnakes abounded in this region as we had seen them on our way 
there were holes all around the base of the room we took off our petticoats of which every little girl had several and stuffed them in the holes shaking them carefully the next morning to see that there were no inquiring friends of the snake tribe rolled up in them we took the nominee at galena after the high bluffs began the scenery was magnificent at a trading station called la crosse fifty indians came on board one chief in a white blanket i have always remembered he was certainly majestic looking a little two-year-old tot had his ears pierced from top to bottom and common wire with three cornered pieces of shiny tin run through all the places his eyes were very black shiny and bright but we could not raise a smile from him that chief was all porcupine quill and bead embroidery he was painted too as were all the rest st paul after we had climbed that awful flight of stairs up the bluff looked like a little town that had been left our carriage to st anthony was a light express wagon with more boards across for seats when we came to university hill in st paul there were no houses in sight but oh what a beautiful place it was we did enjoy that drive we stopped at denoyer's to water the horses this was a little tavern between the two little towns when we came to the ravine in st anthony with its little cascades father said i have not a doubt that the time will come when it will be settled through here we all thought it was very grand of father to take such a long shot as that when we reached st anthony's the people were lovely to us we did begin to feel at home at once we had to find a place to live one of them went with us to the stranger's house a slab house standing near the falls any one who came and had no place to live was welcome to live in this house until they had a home of their own this was why it was called the stranger's house the Massos, a french red river family were living in one half of it we scrubbed it out and moved in mother sewed some loops on some quilts and made two bedrooms we told her she was a fine carpenter we did have lots of fun in our family the floor was rough boards but we planed them off by scrubbing with white sand when the floor was dry we always sprinkled it with white sand the slabs were put on lengthwise and there were always rows of bright indians eyes like beads on a string watching us through those cracks my brother had smallpox in this house we never knew how it came but come it did dr murphy when he first saw him said it was measles or smallpox but he vaccinated us all it took just lovely in those days they used a scab from the arm of someone who had been vaccinated my brother took quantities of pennyroyal tea and no other medicine he came through fine on the fourth of july we went to a dancing party or ball at the hotel we did have a beautiful time mrs northrop was a lovely cook i remember the butter was in the shape of a pineapple with leaves and all we danced contra dances such as the tempest and spanish dances the waltz too with three little steps danced very fast was popular we took hold of our partners elbows i taught the first school at shingle creek when i was a girl of seventeen my schoolhouse was a claim shanty reached by a plank from the other side of the creek my boarding place was a quarter of a mile from the creek the window of the schoolhouse was three little panes of glass which shoved sideways to let in air one afternoon just before time to dismiss the school the windows were darkened by the faces of savages looking in each carried a gun and the terror inspired by them was very great as they were not the friendly faces of the indians we were used to the children all flocked around me i went on hearing their lessons and then told them to sing the indians appeared delighted with this and laughed and talked with each other after school with the children clustered around me i took an atlas and went out and showed the indians the pictures i knew they were very fond of looking at pictures they all stayed until the last picture had been shown and the leaves turned again and again and then with a friendly glance at me and my little flock strode off and i never saw them again the only time I ever fished was when I was teaching in this school. I went with friends to the mouth of Shingle Creek. I did not know how to go at it when the pole and line were given to me. I asked what I should do, and they told me if I felt my line pulling to throw it over my head as quickly as I could. I was standing before some thick hazel brush, and when I felt a tug I did as I was told, landing on my back in the hazel brush at the same time. However, the largest black bass that the fisherman had ever seen was on my hook in the hazel brush they thought it weighed over four pounds my little sister was taken to a revival meeting in the old church in st anthony she was about as big as a minute and understood nothing of what was going on but was very wise looking the minister did not slight even this adam but asked her if she had found jesus she said hastily i didn't know he was lost end of section ten recording by denise nordell of modesto california
Section 11 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. William W. Ellison, 1850. Mr. Ellison, now in his ninety-third year, with a perfect memory, says, I came to Minnesota with a determination to lead an outdoor life, as my lungs were giving me much trouble. One of the first things I did was to take a yoke of oxen to Traverse, to meet Mr. Williamson, who was a missionary at Lackey Parle. It was in November. I was new at this kind of work. The oxen were delivered to me at Fort Snelling. I crossed the river in a canoe and swam the oxen across to Mendota. Then I went on towards Chocopee. There was a well-worn Indian trail leading along the Minnesota River, and I followed that. I went through Black Dog's village. I started late in the afternoon. A young couple had been married at Mendota a few days before, and had gone on ahead. I expected to catch up with them. My oxen were most tractable, and the country through which I passed very beautiful. The trail led along a ridge. My uncle, Mr. Williamson, had always told me to make my camp early while there was plenty of daylight so not seeing or hearing anything of the other wagon i made my camp where an old indian camp had been and prepared to spend a comfortable night in the woods i cooked my supper and then turned in the wind had come up and i soon became very chilly so i looked around for a warmer place i found a windfall and made myself a nice little fire by crossing the trunks and building a fire under them I spent the next four hours in comfort, though it was very cold. My uncle had told me to start with the first rays of the sun. I had no timepiece, so when I saw a glow in the east, I got up, ate my breakfast, and started. It was not long before I saw that my dawn was a prairie fire. I had not gone far when I heard a horse neighing, and soon found my Mendota friends. They had not understood how to camp, so were nearly frozen to death. Their wagon had broken down when they were in a swamp. They had taken what little bedding they had and camped on a knoll in this swamp. I surely was sorry for that bride. Her husband had had a chill early in the evening before they camped. She had been up with him all night and now thought he was dying. I thought he was too. I tried to make a fire out of the wet willow wood there, but could not, and he got bluer and bluer. We used all the blankets we had. Finally, I said, you lie down on one side of him and I on the other. After some time his teeth stopped chattering and his color returned. I think it would have been the last of him if I had not found them as I did. I tried to fix the cart but could not. A half-breed who was driving for them had gone on to Shakopee for help, taking one horse the night before. I started on with my oxen to bring help. When I got nearly to Shakopee I met a half-breed, John Moores, going to their help. I waited for them at Shakopee. McLeod's boat came along, and they took that, as they could not get their cart mended well. I made about twenty miles a day walking with my oxen. I stayed one night in the big woods at Belle Plaine. The wolves were very thick, so I hung my food on a sapling and leaned it against a tree. When I got to the crossing at Traverse, it was dark. I hollered. I could hear someone say, That must be Ellison. Then they came over to me. The Hopkins and Huggins had the mission station there then. It did seem good to get where I had a square meal. I had been living principally on sweet biscuit my aunt, Mrs. Williamson, the missionary's wife at Caposia, made. Don't ever take anything sweet to eat for any length of time. Martin McLeod met the boat with a string of Red River carts. They were loaded with furs and were to take supplies back. It was very interesting to me to watch the loading and unloading of this boat. I was not yet familiar with those half-breed drivers. They seemed sociable fellows, among themselves, laughing and joking and talking in their lingo. The boat had brought a barrel of flour, one of pork, and other supplies for the mission at Lackey Parle. So after spending a week at Traverse waiting for the train to start, I took these in a cart drawn by one ox and started with the rest on Monday morning. The dressers had their cart, which I had managed to fix, and their team of horses. I started with them and the string of carts. I could see the trail two miles ahead. It had to go around the sloughs. The cart train, of course, followed it. I soon saw the sloughs were frozen and could bear my ox and wide-wheeled cart where it was not deep, so I cut across. When Mrs. Dresser was getting dinner, I appeared and ate with them. They could not understand how I could keep up with horses. The train was several miles back. 
we all camped together at night the first night was spent on the border of swan lake the trail followed a straight line from traverse to lackey parle except for these sloughs saturday night we camped at black oak lake twelve miles from lackey parle in the morning mcleod and his train went on but we stayed and kept the sabbath arriving the next day the first indian i ever shook hands with was little crow at Kaposia, his village he was common looking even for an indian my uncle dr williamson said he is the smoothest indian i know usually when i am told a lie once i look out for that liar and never trust him again but little crow has fooled me with his lies a dozen times and i suppose he will a dozen times more when i first met john other day he was a savage with all a savage's instincts my uncle mr williamson said to me one night we'll lock the cattle up tonight upeto topeka later other day is back from washington and feels very much abused he might kill them when he became a christian all this was changed he never forgot his religion for a moment at the time of the outbreak he led a party of refugees at the greatest risk to himself through the back country to shakopee i think there were over forty in the party i used to walk fifty miles a day with ease and could keep it up for several days i never walked in moccasins for they gave no support to the feet but a soldier's shoe bought at the fort for two dollars was ideal to wear it had a long heavy leather sole a very low heel and heavy leather all hand sewed for the uppers the northwestern fur company's trail started from new cave now st paul and followed the mississippi river through st anthony to anoka it forded the rum river at anoka near the mississippi following as nearly as possible that river to st cloud where it crossed at a ford it then followed the Sauk River about eleven miles, then turned to the right and crossing Big Bend forty five miles, striking the river again four miles north from Sauk Center. Then it passed through the timber to Alexandria. It crossed the Red River near Fort Abercrombie, then went directly north to Pembina, passing from point to point of the Red River of the North. The Red River carts had wheel rims eight inches wide. I have seen them with solid wheels cut from a single round of a tree. I have heard the carts around Pembina were formerly all like this, but in my day they generally had spokes. I suppose they were lighter. It was the width of the wheel and the sagacity of the animal that made it possible to go with security over the most impossible roads. They usually carried 800 pounds. When they reached St. Paul, they camped where Larpenter's home is now. I never knew an Indian who had been converted to go back on the whites. Some people would sell them a pair of pants for a christian indian could vote and then say as they saw them so dressed there is a christian indian it took more than a pair of pants to christianize an indian but when they were once converted they stayed so as the many people who were saved by them in the massacre could testify end of section eleven section twelve of old rail fence corners this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reed All Day. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. D. E. Dow, 1850. In 1850, when I first came to Minnesota, I took a claim at Lake Harriet near where the pavilion now stands. The ruins of the old Stevens mission were on my claim. It had been built in 1834. I did not keep this claim long, though I built a log cabin there and kept bachelor's hall, but soon took a claim where my present house stands in Hopkins. I built a cabin here, but boarded with a widow and her children. All the food we had was game, pork, and buckwheat cakes. The buckwheat they had brought from their home and it was all ground in the coffee mill, then sifted through a horsehair sieve before it could be used. There were seven in the family to grind for, so it kept one person grinding all the time. I was supposed to live alone in my cabin, but hardly ever spent a night without the companionship of some Sioux Indians who were hunting around there. I gladly received them as they were friendly, and their company was much better than none. One winter they came in such numbers that at night the floor was entirely covered by their sleeping forms. Early in the morning, they would go out and all day hunt the deer, with which the woods abounded. It was very cold, and the slain deer froze immediately. They stacked them up, making a huge pile, 
Suddenly all the Indians left. One morning shortly after, I was working in the clearing round my cabin when I saw a line of squaw, which I think was a block long, coming over the trail which led from Shakopee to Hopkins. The squaw went to the pile of deer. Each took one on her back and silently trudged away over the trail toward Shakopee. Some of the squaw were so small that the frozen carcass had to be adjusted by another squaw, or it would drag on the ground. They were two weeks removing this pile of deer and had to walk 28 miles with each one before they got home with it. When I first made my way to Minnetonka, I came out at Gray's Bay. There were vast numbers of Indian mounts there, and bark sheds for drying fish. This was in 53. An Indian trail led along the shore of Lake Calhoun, just above where the streetcar track is now. It continued on the high ground to the mission at Lake Harriet. I killed a deer at what had been the mission ground the first time I ever saw the lake. The trail continued on the high ground around Lake Harriet. There were fishing trails too, around the lakes near the water, but the trails ordinarily used were on high ground where there was no fear of ambush. Another trail was north of Lake Calhoun and led to Hopkins, then to Shakopee, Little Six Village. The opposite shore was a big swamp. Another much used trail followed along the highlands of the Mississippi River to the Fort Sawmill which stood near where the old Union Station was in Minneapolis. The reservation on which the fort stood was 10 miles square and included all the present site of Minneapolis. This is why that city was so long without settlers, although the water power was the finest to be found anywhere. Mrs. Elizabeth Clifford, 1850. My father had asthma terribly and was advised to come to Minnesota for his health. He arrived in Stillwater with his family and a stock of goods in 1850. He exchanged these for land six miles out of that town and two and one half miles off the main traveled road leading to Marine. We had a very fine barn and comfortable home made of lumber from the Stillwater mills. Our nearest neighbor was two and one half miles away, Mr. Morgan, who kept the halfway house, but I cannot remember that I was ever lonesome. We spent much time in the woods where we found the most wonderful wild flowers. There was not a tame flower known to us whose counterpart we could not find in our woods. Of vegetables, I remember best a small pink-eyed potato, the most delicious I have ever tasted. As they baked, they could be heard popping in the oven. They are not raised now. The wild plum found in the woods my father cultivated, and they were as large as small eggs and looked like small peaches. One day, as I glanced from the window, I saw a body of Indian warriors coming on the trail that led around the lake near us. As they came up, I saw they were in full war paint and feathers. They entered, examined everything, but took nothing. They asked for and ate bread and molasses, as they had seen the children doing when they came in. They all had guns and big bowie knives sticking in their belts. One particularly villainous looking one took out his knife and felt the edge, looking wickedly at us. One was exceptionally pleasant looking, and I thought he would protect us if the rest got ugly. They finally went away. They were followed in the afternoon by a band of Chippewa braves who asked if the Sioux warriors had been that way that day. When told they had, they rode hurriedly after them. They said the Sioux had taken some Chippewa scouts. Mrs. Richard Shute, 1851. I came to Minnesota a bride in 1851, and with my husband shortly afterwards, took the steamer but traversed the Sioux, where a great treaty with the Indians was to be signed. With us we took a tent, provisions, and a Frenchman to cook. I was the only woman in all the company. It was also wonderful to me, the beautiful country through which we passed and the preparations made for all the company on landing. The Indians, a great concourse of them, were down to see the boat come in. To see them scamper when the boat whistled was a sight to be remembered. Some fell in the water, but fled as soon as they could get themselves out. I think this was the first steamboat they had ever seen. They were frightened and curious at the same time. Ten years before, at my home in Ohio, I had seen the Indians often, as they would stop at our house for food on the way to Fort Maine. My mother always cooked corn dodgers for them and gave them milk to drink. They loved her and knew she was their friend. They always gave me strings of very colored glass beads. I think I had one of every color. These Indians at Traverse made me feel at home at once, and I gave them a friendly smile. The glances they returned were shy but friendly. 
Their painted faces and breasts and gaudy clothes were different from our Indians. Their teepees stretched as far as the eye could see. It seemed that the squaw must have had instruction in embroidery from some civilized teacher. Their patterns were so intricate, their colors so well placed, their moccasins were always beautifully done with beads and colored porcupine quills. Their best petticoats too. As for their liege lords, their best suits, if suits they might be called, were beautifully done. A young squaw, instead of pouring out her love in song, would pour it out in embroidery, and her husband would be very gay indeed. Mrs. Hopkins, wife of the missionary, met us and took us home with her, where we were very well cared for. She was a charming little woman, full of missionary zeal, and greatly loved. I never heard her complain. Her husband, too, was greatly loved by the Indians. We took our stores and cooked there, and with fresh vegetables from the little farm worked by Mr. Huggins, fish and game, we had choice meals. I used to ride horseback, or rather ponyback, every day always with my husband and frequently with Mr. Sibley. My pony was borrowed from the Indians. Mr. Shute and Mr. Sibley rode large horses. Every Indian brave who came, came on a pony. His teepee, household goods, and children were drawn by one. There were so many that they seemed more than the blades of grass. Literally thousands of these ponies were grazing some distance back of the encampment. We three rode out to see them. As we neared them, and they smelled my pony, that vast herd, with one accord, started towards us, and almost at once, literally engulfed me. The men called, For God's sake, don't get off. Hold on for your life. I took the pony around the neck with both arms, and did hold on. The men came after me, as fast as they could, and rode their big horses on either side of me. The Indians rushed in on their ponies, and after some time succeeded in turning their vast multitude, and letting the prisoner escape. I was cool and collected while the danger menaced, but when it was over, trembled and shook. My taste for horseback riding at Traverse was gone. Mr. Sibley, Mr. Shute, and I, with the guide, went to see a miniature Minnehaha. We walked all day going there and back crossing the little stream many times. My husband took off his boots to ford the stream. He always carried me over. He cut his foot badly and could hardly get to the commission tent. Mr. Sibley urged us not to go to the Hopkins, but to stay there. But Mr. Shute wanted to go. It was bright moonlight, and I walked three quarters of a mile to Mr. Hopkins to get a pony to take my husband back. I passed a little lake on the prairie. Mr. Shute and I always walked arm in arm, as was then the custom for married people. Mirrored in the lake, I could see reflected many, many Indian lovers, walking as they had seen the palefaces do. I laughed at myself as I thought what mimics these children were. It was their following the customs of the white man drinking as they saw him drink, that degraded them so. On the 4th of July, there was to be a great celebration. The Indians would have all their dances. Early in the morning, Mr. Hopkins went out to bathe in the river. He did not return. A little Indian girl said she had seen him go under the water, and only two hands come above it. His body was not found for two days. A great crowd of squaw surrounded the house, showing by their sad looks what the loss was to them. At the burial, the Indians, a vast number of them, sang the hymns in Sioux. This funeral, way off in the wilderness, with these crowds of savage mourners, would never be forgotten. End of section 12。Section 13 of Old Rail Fence Corners。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. Charles Bohannon, 1851. I moved to the farm where I am now living in 53. My father first took up a claim in 1851, where the central market now stands. But while he was in the woods, old man Stimson squatted on that, so he took a claim at what is now Camden Place. He built a small house there. The farm was covered with brush and oak openings. Every one of these trees had to be grubbed out. One of my earliest recollections is the Red River carts that used to go squawking by on this side of the river, as well as on the St. Anthony side. They were called the Red River Band. 
they were one of the loudest bands ever brought together as their music that of wood rubbing against wood could be heard three miles while my father was in the woods the indians used to come and sleep in the dooryard sometimes it would be full of painted sioux they never stole anything or begged but would gratefully take anything offered them they were very friendly and kind and full of curiosity as their looking in the windows at all times showed my father had brought a pair of fine horses from galena one day when he was mowing wild hay on the meadow he left them unhitched and was excitedly told by a neighbor that they had got in the river he ran and saw one swimming near the other shore but as the other had turned over with his feet in the air the combined weight of the horse and wagon was too much for him and before help came he sank we recovered the running gear of the wagon later when all came upon a sandbar but the harness had been stolen what the loss of this team was to a pioneer farmer we can hardly conceive the countless number of pigeons which migrate here every spring could never be estimated at all hours of the night their cry of piggy 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 could be heard they could be seen in countless numbers on slab trees that is old dead trees any one could kill hundreds in a day and thousands killed seemingly made no impression they flew very low and in dense masses ducks and geese were exceedingly plentiful i have never seen wild swan here but many in minnesota in the red river country on our farm was a thicket of plums which probably came up from the stones from one tree some were blue some were red others yellow and red some were sour some bitter others tasteless while others still were sweet and of an exquisite flavor these trees soon ran out and i think all of this best variety are gone I remember picking raspberries, blackberries, and wild strawberries in quantities. Every summer we would go up to Anoka and spend a week camping and picking blueberries. We sold our corn, which was our first crop, to Alexander Moore in St. Anthony. At that time, he was the only one buying corn. Two bushel baskets made a bushel. This sold for fifteen cents. Mr. Moore had much larger baskets than those ordinarily in use, and measured the corn in these. When the farmers demurred he said if you don't like my measure take your corn home he knew there was no one else for us to take it to so was very brave there were very few scales so farm produce was generally sold by measure i never saw a pair of shoes until after the war everyone wore boots in the northern part of the state i have seen men starting out in the morning with an ox team and returning at night blind themselves and the oxen too from the sting of the buffalo gnat the mosquitoes came in great clouds and were everywhere. Every little clear space of a hundred acres or more was called a prairie. When I first saw Duluth, it was only a cotton town, that is, log houses with canvas roofs or tents. Most mail carriers used dog teams. Three dogs hitched tandem was the common sight. I have seen three dogs haul a dead horse. In our expedition against the Indians, only thirty-seven of eight hundred horses we took came back with us. The rest starved to death. Unlike the Red River stock, which would paw through deep snow to the long grass, fill themselves, and then lie down in the hole and sleep, they knew nothing of this way and so could not forage for themselves. This campaign was with Hatch's independent battalion. Lieutenant Grosner, who was new to the Red River country, was married, and on his wedding trip was to stop at Macaulayville. He sent word ahead that he wanted a private room. When he got there, he was shown into the only room there was, full of half-breed sleepers. He hastened to the proprietor and said, I ordered a private room. His answer was, There are only six bed in there. What more could you want? Mr. Austin W. Farnsworth, 1851. We came to Fillmore County in the fall of 1851 from Vermont. We were strapped. Not one cent was left after the expenses of the trip were paid. A neighbor took my father with him and met us at McGregor Landing with an ox team hitched to a prairie schooner. We were four days getting to Fillmore County, camping on the way. The nearest town, only a post office, was Wakapee. Father had come the previous spring and planted two acres of wheat, two acres of corn, and one half acre of potatoes. The potatoes all rotted in the ground. I was only nine years old and my brother thirteen, but we made all the furniture for that cabin out of a few popple poles and a hollow basswood log. For beds, beams were fitted in between the logs and stuck out about a foot above the floor and were six feet long. 
to these we fastened cross pieces of popple and on this put a tick filled with wild hay and cornstalk leaves it made a wonderful bed when you were tired as every one was in those days for all worked after we had cut off a section of our big log by hand we split it in two and in one half bored holes and fitted legs of the unpeeled popple for the seat the other half made the back and our chair was done as we had no nails we fitted on the backs with wood pegs our table was made of puncheons split with a wedge and hewed with a broad axe the cabin would have been very homelike with its new furniture if it had not been for the smoke my mother had to do all the cooking on a flat stone on the floor with another standing up behind it she nearly lost her sight the first winter from the smoke our attic was filled with cornstalks to make the cabin warmer our fare was good as game was very plentiful and we had cornmeal and coarse ground wheat more like cracked wheat there was a little grist mill at caramona a tiny town near my mother made coffee from cornmeal crusts it would skin postum three ways for sunday when i was nine years old i killed a buffalo at buffalo grove near us that grove was full of their runs elk were very plentiful too and deer were so plenty they were a drug in our home market i have counted seventy-five at one time and seven elk pigeons were so thick that they darkened the sky when they flew geese and ducks too were in enormous flocks in season they seemed to cover everything we used the eggs of the prairie chickens for cooking they answered well once my brother shot a coon and my mother made him a cap with a tail hanging behind and made me one too but she put a gray squirrel's tail at the back of mine she knitted our shoes and sewed them to buckskin soles i was twelve when i had my first pair of leather shoes they were cowhide and how they did hurt but i was proud of them none of the country boys wore underclothing i was nineteen before i ever had any our pants were heavy lined and if it was cold we wore more shirts i never had an overcoat until i went in the army before we left vermont my mother carted and spun all the yarn and wove all the cloth that we wore for a long time after coming to minnesota we found the most delicious wild red plums half the size of an egg and many berries and wild crab apples timber wolves were plenty and fierce my sister was treed by a pack from nine o'clock until one by that time we got neighbors enough together to scatter them i was chased too when near home but as I had two bulldogs with me, they kept them from closing in on me until I could get in the house. There was a rattlesnake den near us, and once we killed seventy-eight in one day. They were the timber rattlesnakes, great big fellows. I caught one by holding a forked stick over its head and then dropped it in a box. I kept it for a pet. It was seven feet one and a half inches long. I used to feed it frogs, mice, and rabbits. I thought it was fond of me, but it struck at me and caught its fangs in my shirt when I was careless, so I killed my pet. The only time I ever went to school was for two months in 55, to John Cunningham. Wilbur made our desks out of black walnut lumber, cut in Buffalo Grove. It was very plentiful there. Later, we used to go to dances. I was great for cutting pigeon wings and balancing on the corner with a jig step. We used to dance the whirl waltz, too. Some call it the German waltz. We spun round and round as fast as we could go, taking three little steps. End of section 13section 14 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. Elijah Nutting, 1852. We came to Faribault in 1852 and kept the first hotel there. It was just a crude shanty with an upstairs that was not partitioned off. Very cold, too. I rather think there was never anything much colder, but it was well patronized, as it was much better than staying outside. There were many Indians whose home was in our village. We used to have good times with them and enjoy their games and seeing them dance. Families were moving in all the time. Finally winter was over and spring with us. We began to think how near the fourth was and how totally unprepared we were for its coming. We decided to have a minstrel show. We had seen one once. My brother was to be end man and black up for the occasion. 
but he was a little towhead and we did not see our way clear to make nice kinky black wool of his hair unfortunately for her a black sheep moved into town in an otherwise white flock we boys would take turns in chasing that sheep and every time we could get near her we would snatch some of the wool when sewed on to cloth this made a wonderful wig the proceeds from this entertainment we saved for firecrackers then we bought some maple sugar of the indians very dark and dirty looking it looked very inadequate for a young merchant's whole stock of goods but when it was added to by scrapings from the brown sugar barrel when mother's back was turned it sold like wildfire we felt like rockefeller when we entrusted the stage driver with our capital to buy the coveted firecrackers in cannon city which then was much larger than faribault they cost forty cents a bunch and we only got three bunches the size of the crackers depressed us considerably for they were the smallest we had ever seen we feared that they would not make any noise we put them away in a safe place brother was a natural investigator every time i was gone he would fear those crackers were not keeping well and try one he wanted no grand disappointment on the fourth joe bemis son of dr bemis always trained with us fellows and never backed down we were going to have a circus in the barn joe said i'll ride a hog the hogs were running around loose outside they were as wild as deer we laid a train of corn into the barn and so coaxed one old fellow with great tusks into it and then closed the door joe ran and jumped on his back like lightning the hog threw him and then ripped him with his tusk joe yelled for god's sake let him out we did we laid joe out on a board and dr bemis came and sewed him up he said joe won't ride a hog very soon again boys neither were you i guess mr charles rye 1853 mr rye 86 years old hale and hearty who still chops down large trees and makes them into firewood for his own use says i left england in a sailing vessel in 1851 and was five weeks on the voyage my sister did not leave her bunk all the way over and i was squeamish myself but i see the sailors drinking sea water every morning so i joined them and was never sick a minute after we brought our own food with us and it was cooked for us very well and brought to us hot we did not pay for this but we did pay for any food furnished extra some ships would strike good weather all the way and could make a rapid voyage in three weeks but it usually took much longer i stayed in the east two years and came to st anthony in eighteen fifty three the best sower in our part of england taught me to sow grain after three days he came to me and said rye i don't see how it is but i can see you beat me sowing i hired out to sow grain at a dollar a day as soon as i came here and had all the work i could do i would put the grain about a bushel of it in a canvas lined basket shaped like a clothes basket and fastened with straps over my shoulders then with a wide sweep of the arm i would sew first with one hand and then with the other it was a pretty sight to see a man sewing grain seemed like he stepped to music once i saw twenty-five deer running one after another like indians across my sister's farm where st louis park is now i was watchman for the old mill in st anthony the winter of fifty three it was forty degrees for weeks i kept fire in wales bookstore too to keep the ink from freezing i made thirty-four dollars an acre on the first flax i sowed a man had to be a pretty good worker if he got fifteen dollars a month and found in fifty three most farmhands only got twelve dollars i used to run the ferry with captain tapper it was a large rowboat once i had eight men aboard when i got out in the river i saw the load was too heavy and thought we would sink boys i said don't move if you do we'll all go to the bottom the water was within one inch of the top of the boat but we got across i graded some downtown on hennepin avenue when it was only a country road there was a big pond on bridge square the ducks used to fly around there like anything early in the morning i cut out the hazel brush on the first fairground it was on harmon place about two blocks below loring park we cut a big circle so we could have a contest between horses and oxen to see which could draw the biggest load the oxen beat i don't remember anything else they did at that fair mr james m gillespie 
1853. I remember that our first crop on our own farm at Camden Place in 1853 was corn and pumpkins. The Indians would go to the field, take a pumpkin, split it, and eat it as we do an apple with grunts of satisfaction. There was an eight-acre patch of wild strawberries where Indians had cultivated the land on our new claim about where our house stands today. They were as large as the small cultivated berries with a most delicious flavor. Everyone that we knew picked and picked, but wagon loads rotted on the ground. A good, strong, quick-stepping ox could plow two acres a day, but much oftener they plowed one and one-half acres only. The pigeons flew so low in fifty-four we could kill them with any farm implement we happened to be using. They seemed to be all tired out. We killed and dried the breasts for winter. Miss Nancy Gillespie, 1853 I remember a pear-shaped wild plum which grew along the river bank. It was as large as the blue California plum, and of a most wonderful color and taste. I have never seen anything like it, and have not seen this variety of late years. Mr. Isaac Lehman, 1853 My father came to Minnesota in 52, and bought the land where Lehman's Cemetery now is, for a thousand dollars of Mr. Dunbar. He returned for us January 1st, 53 snow was two feet on a level and the cold was terrible we went with our horses and wagon to chicago from peoria there we bought a bobsled and put the wagon box on it adding a strong canvas top we put in a stove and made the twenty-one day journey very comfortably we came up through wisconsin the only spot i remember was black river falls the woods abounded with game there were thousands of deer and partridges we killed what we could eat only. We saw many bear tracks. We crossed the Mississippi at St. Anthony and arrived at our cabin. Our house was only boarded up, but father got out and banked it with snow to the eaves, pounding it down hard so it would hold. It made it very comfortable. In the early days, ammunition was very expensive for the farm boys who loved to shoot. They found that dry peas were just as good as shot for prairie chickens, quail, and pigeons, so always hunted them with these. The passenger pigeons were so plentiful that the branches of trees were broken by their numbers. They flew in such enormous flocks that they would often fly in at open doors and windows. They obscured the sun in their flight. Looked at from a distance, they would seem to extend as far up as the eye could reach. I have brought down thirty at a shot. They could be knocked off the branches with a stick while roosting, and thousands of them were killed in this way. In these early days, they brought only ten or twenty cents a dozen. The ducks used to congregate in such large numbers on Rice Lake that their flight sounded louder than a train of cars. End of section 14For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Mary Weeks, 1853, 90 years old. We came to Minnesota in 1853. My husband went up to our claim and broke from 25 to 40 acres and sowed rutabagas it was on new breaking and virgin soil and they grew tremendous we moved there and bought stock they never seemed to tire of those turnips and grew very slick and fat on them we too ate them in every form and i thought i had never tasted anything so good they were so sweet and tasty the children used to cut them in two and scrape them with a spoon we said we had Minnesota apples when we took them out to eat. It did seem so good to have real brooms to use. In Maine, we had always made our brooms of cedar boughs securely tied to a short pole. They were good and answered the purpose, but a new-fangled broom made of broom straw seemed so dressy. I can well remember the first one of this kind I ever had. It was only used on great occasions. Usually, we used a splint broom, which we made ourselves. 
I used to do all the housework for a family of seven besides making butter and taking care of the chickens. If help was short, I helped with the milking too. I made all the clothes the men wore. A tailor would cut out their suits and then I would make them by hand. I made all their shirts too. You should have seen the fancy bosomed shirts I made. Then I knit the stocking and mittens for the whole family and warm woolen scarves for their necks. My husband used to go to bed tired to death and leave me sitting up working. He always hated to leave me. Then he would find me up no matter how early it was. He said I never slept. I didn't have much time to waste that way. We lived on beautiful Silver Lake. In season, the pink lady slippers grew in great patches and other flowers to make the prairie gay. For amusement, we used to go visiting and always spent the day. We would put the whole family into a sleigh or wagon and away we would go for an outing. We had such kind neighbors, no one any better than the other, all equal. Mrs. E. A. Merrill, 1853, Minneapolis. My home was where the old Union Station stood. In 1853, my father, Mr. Keith, learned that the land near where the Franklin Avenue Bridge now is was to be thrown open to settlement. He loaded his wagon with lumber and drove onto the piece of land he wanted and stayed there all night. In the morning, he built his home. In the afternoon, the family moved in and lived there for three years. Mrs. Martha Thorne 1854 we started from davenport iowa for minnesota territory in 1854 we had expected to be only two weeks on the trip to the junction of the blue earth and minnesota rivers but were six weeks on that terrible trip with our ox teams there had been so much rain that all dry land was a swamp all swamps lakes and the lakes and rivers all over everywhere Sometimes we worked a whole day to get 100 feet through one of the sloughs. We would cut the tallest and coarsest rushes and grass and pile in to make a road bed. We would seem to be in a sea, but finally this trip ended, as all trips, no matter how bad, must, and we came to Lake Crystal, where we were to stay. Such a beautiful spot as it was, this home spot. We camped for three weeks, living in our prairie schooner, while the men put up the wild hay. We built a log cabin with chinkins to let in the air. We filled in the cracks except where these chinkins were, with mud. The roof was made by laying popple poles, so they met in the middle and fastening them together. Over this we laid a heavy thickness of wild hay, and over that the popple poles again well tied with hand-twisted ropes of wild hay to those below. It was a good roof, only it leaked like a sieve. The floor was just the ground. Over it we put a layer of the wild hay, and then staked a rag carpet over it. A puncheon shelf to put my trunk under, and the furniture placed, made a home that I was more than satisfied with. It took my husband over two weeks with a pair of trotting oxen to go for the furniture to St. Paul. My baby was born three weeks after we moved in. There was no doctor within a hundred miles. I got through, helped only by my sister-in-law. What do you women nowadays, with your hospitals and doctors, know of a time like this? When it rained, and rain it did, plenty, that October, the only dry place was on that trunk under the shelf, and many an hour baby and I spent there. Whenever there was sunshine, that carpet was drying. We were much troubled with what the settlers called prairie dig, it was a kind of itch that seemed to come from the new land. It made the hands very sore and troublesome. We did everything but could find no cure. The Dakota Sioux were our neighbors and were very friendly. They had not yet learned to drink the white man's fire water. A squaw came in one day and when she saw how I was suffering, went out and dug a root. She scraped off the outer bark, then cooked the inner bark and rubbed it on my hands. I was cured as if by magic. She buried all parts of the root, so I think it was poison. The next year we raised the first wheat on the Des Moines River. We put the sacks in the bottom of the wagon, then our feather beds on top of them. 
The children were put on these, and we started for the mill at Garden City, 130 miles away. We had two yoke of oxen. The leaders were white with black heads and hoofs and great wide spreading horns. They were Texas cattle and were noble beasts, very intelligent and affectionate. I could drive them by just calling gee and haw. They went steadily along. My husband and I spelled each other and went right along by night as well as day. We were about 40 hours going. The moonlight with the shadows of the clouds on the prairie was magnificent. We never saw a human being. We had our wheat ground and started back. As I was walking beside the oxen while my husband slept, I started up a flock of very young geese. I caught them all and they became very tame. They once flew away and were gone three weeks, but all returned. When we got home, we had a regular jubilation over that flower. Twenty of the neighbors came in to help eat it. They were crazy for the bread. I made three loaves of salt rising bread, and they were enormous, but we never got a taste of them. The Indians were always kind neighbors. They learned evil from the whites. The father of Inkpaduta used to hold my little girl and measure her foot for moccasins. Then he would bring her the finest they could make and would be so pleased when they fitted. The Indians always had wonderful teeth. They did not scrub the enamel off. They used to ask for coffee, and one who had been to school said, Could I have a green pumpkin? and ate it raw with a relish. We had a carpet sack for stockings, an Indian orator used to look at it with covetous eyes one day he came in laid two mink skins on the table took the stockings out of the bag and stepping right along with victory in his eye bore that sack away we lived on salt and potatoes for five weeks that first winter we paid one dollar for three pounds of sugar and eighteen dollars for a barrel of musty flour that we had to chop out with an axe and grate that was the winter of 55. During the Inkpaduta outbreak, the soldiers ate everything we had. During the outbreak of 62, we moved to Mankato. I belonged to the ladies' aid, and we took care of the wounded and refugees sent from New Ulm. We made field beds on the floor for them. One poor German woman went to sleep while carrying a glass of water across the room to her husband, who was wounded. She just sank down in such a deep sleep that nothing could rouse her. I never could imagine such exhaustion. Old Man Ireland had sixteen bullet holes, but had never stopped walking until he got to us. Mrs. Eastlake, that wonderful woman, was in this hospital. She was the woman who crawled all those miles on her hands and knees. End of section 15「Section sixteen of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Nancy Lowell, 1854. I came to Faribault in 1854 and boarded at the hotel kept by the Nuttings the first winter. One evening I stepped to the door to throw out a wash basin of water and saw a large dog standing there. I put the dish down and was going out to call him. When my husband saw me going toward the door, he said, What are you going to do? I said, Call in a dog. It was bright moonlight. He said, Let me see him. He looked and hastily closed the door, saying, the biggest kind of a timber wolf. Be careful what kind of pets you take in here. The upper part of the hotel where we lived the first winter was all in one room. I was the only woman, so we had a room made with sheeting. Sometimes there were twenty people sleeping in that loft. We did not have to open the windows. Most windows in those days were not expected to be opened anyway. The air just poured in between the cracks, and the snow blew in with gusto. It was not at all unusual to get up from under a snowbank in the morning. I brought many pretty dresses and wore them, too. 
Those who first came, if they had money and were brides, were dressed as if they lived in New York City. We had a dance one night in our little log hotel. It was forty degrees below zero, and very cold anywhere away from the big stove. The women wanted to dance all the time, and so set the table and put on the bread and cake before the company came. Five hours afterward, when we went to eat, they were frozen solid. The dish towels would freeze, too, as they hung on the line in the kitchen over the stove, while the stove was going, too. One morning, after we were keeping house, my husband said, I guess we have some spring company. You better go in and see them. I did, and in the parlor was the biggest kind of an ox standing there chewing his quid. He had just come in through the open door to make a morning call. All kinds of animals ran at large then. Mrs. William Dow 1854. Little Falls. We came to Little Falls and built this house we are now living in, in 1854. It was built right on the Indian Trail that paralleled the Red River Cart Trail. You see that road out there? That is just where the old Red River Cart Road went. That is Swan River, and it went between us and that. Our back door was right on their foot trail. You could step out of our door onto it. There is a big flat rock on the river up about four miles, where the Chippewa and Sioux signed treaties to behave themselves. After this, they were killing each other before they got out of town. You know our Indians were the Chippewas. They were woods Indians. The prairies belonged to the Sioux. They had always been enemies. Hole in the Day was the head chief here, and a pretty good chief, too. His tribe got suspicious of him. They thought he was two-faced, so shot him as they did his father before him. He had married a white woman, so the real chief now is a white man. I think he was on the square, though. He used often to drop in for a piece of pie or anything to eat. He is buried upon the bluff here. Swan River Ferry was three miles from Little Falls. It was on the direct road through Long Prairie to Fort Abercrombie. The Red River Cart Trail crossed the Mississippi River at Bell Prairie. There is a mill at that little place. When the lumberjacks were driving logs, they used to have their wamigans tie up in the river just outside that front door. The Indians were camped all around here. They used to fill their moccasins with rabbit hair to take the place of stockings. Once I was standing by the river and I saw a squaw come out with a newborn baby. She wasn't making any fuss over it. First, she took it by the heels and plunged it in the river, then by the head and soused it in that way. Mrs. Solemn was a squaw who had married a white man. Her husband went to the war. I used to write her letters to him, and she would sign them with her cross. She became very fond of me. At the time of the outbreak, she said to me, Kinesagus, meaning, Are you afraid? I did not reply. Then she said, If you are, I'll hide you. She made a wigwam by the side of hers and wanted me to go into it with my children, but I would not. I liked her but I remembered how when the Indians had had a scalp dance, I had seen her shake one of the scalps in her teeth. This was after she had married a white man. I asked her if she did not like the Indians better than the whites, and she said in Chippewa, If I do, why do I not stay with them? At the beginning of the outbreak, the Sioux were sending runners all the time to get the Chippewas to join them. One of our men, William Nichols, spoke the Indian language as well as English, he had lived with them when he was a fur trader. He used to disguise himself as an Indian and go to the councils, so we all knew just what was going on. Old Buffalo, a chief, said, If you go to war, I'll be a white man. I won't be an Indian any more. I'll go away and stay by myself always. We knew at once when they fully decided not to join the Sioux. Finally, I yielded to the entreaties of my friends and went down to St. Cloud to stay with friends until the danger should be over. My husband was in the war. One day someone coming from Little Falls said, There's someone living in your house. Well, said I, if anyone can, I can. So back I went. I found an old friend from further up the country there. We joined forces and lived there until the war was over. One day in wartime I looked out of my window and could see Mr. Hall milking his cow in the pasture. It had a rail fence around it. I could see what he could not some Indians sitting in one of the corners of the fence stretching Sioux scalps over whites. When they finished, they got up all at the same time giving a blood-curdling war-whoop. The cow kicked over the milk and fled bellowing. 
I think that Mr. Hall made even better time, and he never even looked around. The squaws would often have earrings made of wire, with three cornered pieces of tin dangling all around their ears. It was not how good, but how much with them. How these Indians ever lived through a winter the way they were dressed, I don't see. They wore only leggings, shirts, breech clouts, and a blanket. Their legs were no bare than a Scotchman's, though. Our Indians used to tuck things in the bosom of their shirt, as well as in their belts. They used to tuck butcher knives in their leggings. If they were ever going to go on a tear and get drunk when we first came, they would always get my husband to take charge of all their guns and knives. When the squaws wore mourning, they were all painted black and always slashed themselves with knives. During the last of the fifties, we never had any money. It would not do you any good if you had, for if you took the money to the store, they would just give you an order for more goods instead of the change. The Red River carts used to camp in that little grove of trees over there. We used to sell them supplies, and they would give us English silver money. Once we took some to the store, and they were terribly surprised to see money. They could not understand how we came by it. Thought we must have hoarded it but we told them that it came from the Red River drivers. End of section 16。Section 17 of Old Rail Fence Corners。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. William J. White, 1854. My husband, Mr. White, started for Lake Addy, Minnesota Territory in May to join some friends and take up a claim. Mr. Hogue had named this lake in honor of his daughter. The settlement, if you could call it that, was called Grimshaw Settlement. It is now Brownton. He got up his cabin and began clearing the land. He and his friends did their cooking and only had two meals a day, breakfast at eight and dinner at three. One hot day they had just cooked a big pan of applesauce and set it out to cool. Some Indians on their way to a war dance at Shakopee came streaking along all painted up. First one and then another plunged his fist in that applesauce and stuck it down his throat. It must have skinned them all the way down, but not one made a sound, only looked hard when they saw the next one start in. My husband wrote for me to come to him. I had no pilot, so could not start at once. My boy fell and broke his arm, and I thought he was badly hurt inside, so I wrote for father to come home. It generally took so long for a letter to go through that when two weeks later I got a chance to go with company, I started, thinking I could get there before the letter would, as they were generally much longer in going than one could travel. When I got on the Northern Bell, a fine boat, one of my children was taken with croup. Dr. N., a Universalist minister, got off at Dubuque and bought medicine for me. This saved the child, but he was sick all the way. We were stuck in beef slough for several days. I never left the cabin as my child needed me, but some time during the first day, a boat from St. Paul was stuck there too, so near us that passengers passed from one boat to the other all day. It was only when I got to Hastings, where I had thought to meet my husband, that I found he had been on that other stranded boat. Later I learned that he had spent some time on my boat, but of course did not know I was there. The letter I had written him had gone straight, as a man who was going to their settlement had taken charge of it from the first. I had to wait six weeks in Hastings until he went clear to Pennsylvania and back. Evangeline wasn't in it with me. Finally he came and we went on to our new home. I thought I had never seen such wonderful wildflowers. Mr. Grimshaw came after us with his horses. We had supper at his house the night before we got to our home, and I never tasted anything so good, pheasants brown so beautifully and everything else to match. The most wonderful welcome, too, went with that meal. We passed fields just red with wild strawberries, and in places where the land had been cultivated and the grass was sort of low, they grew away up and were large with big clusters, too. We did just revel in them. 
they were much more spicy than any we had ever eaten. The wild grass grew high as a man's head. When we came in sight of our home, I loved it at once and so did the children. It was in the bend of a little stream with stepping stones across. I knew at once that I had always wanted stepping stones on my place. About two feet from the floor, a beam had been set in the whole length of the room. It was roped across and a rough board separated it into two sections. These were our beds, and with feather beds and boughs made a fine sleeping place. Wolves used to howl all around at night, but with the stock secure and the home closed up tightly, we were happy. Our walls were plastered with mud and then papered by me with paper that was six cents a roll back east. We made a barrel chair and all kinds of homemade furniture out of packing boxes. Our rooms looked so cozy. Father was a natural furniture maker, though we never knew it before we came here. Game was very plentiful, and as we never had enough back home, we did not soon tire of it. My husband once killed a goose and eleven young ones with one shot. The first year our garden was looking fine when the grasshoppers came in such swarms that they obscured the sun. They swooped on everything in the garden. There was no grain as the squirrels, blackbirds, and gophers had never tasted this delicacy before and followed the sower, taking it as fast as it fell. We planted it three times and we had absolutely no crop of any kind that first year. We bought four horses later and had them for the summer's work. They came from Illinois and were not used to the excessive cold of Minnesota. That winter it was 40 degrees below zero for many successive days. It seems to me we have not had as much cold all this winter as we had in a week then. Christmas time it was very cold. We wanted our mail so one of the men rode one of the horses 12 miles to get it. When he arrived there, the horse was very sick. He was dosed up and was seemingly all right. When the man wanted to start for home, he was warned that it would be fatal to take a horse which had been dosed with all kinds of hot stuff out in the terrible cold. He took the risk, but the horse fell dead just as he entered the yard. We lost two others in much the same way that winter. We then bought a yoke of young steers. They were very little broken and the strongest animals I ever saw. Their names were Bright and Bill. Once the whole family was going to a party at New Auburn, a kind of a city, my husband had made an Indian wagon. He held them in the road while we all got in. They started up with such a flourish that everything that could not hold itself on fell off. The road was full of things we wanted with us. They ran on a keen jump for nine miles until we came to the house where we were going. It was the first house we came to. When they saw the barn, they must have thought it looked like home, for they ran in there and brought up against the barn with a bang. As soon as Mr. White could, he jumped out and held them, but their fun was all gone, and they stood like lambs. I never saw anything funnier than those steers and a huge snapping turtle. They found him near the creek when they were feeding. They would come right up to him, they always did everything in concert, then look at him at close range. The turtle would thrust out his head and snap at them. Then they would snort wildly and plunge all over the prairie, returning again and again to repeat the performance, which only ended when the turtle disappeared in the brook. Wolves were very fearless and fierce that winter. They ran in packs. They would look in at our windows. Once we sent a hired boy six miles for 25 pounds of pork for working men. When he was near home, a pack of wolves followed him, but he escaped by throwing the pork. Mr. Pollock and Mr. White were followed in the same way. Once one of our friends killed the steer. We were all anxious for amusement, so any pretext would bring on a party. All the neighbors had a piece of the meat, but we thought the friends who had killed the steer should have a party and have roast beef for us all, so we sent word we were all coming. Mrs. Noble, my neighbor, worked all day to make a hoop skirt. She shirred and sewed together a piece of cloth about three yards around. In these shirrings she run rattan, a good heavy piece so it would stand out well. I made a black silk basque and skirt. My finery was all ready to put on. One of the neighbor's girls was to stay with the children. The baby had been quite restless, so according to the custom I gave her a little laudanum to make her sleep. 
I did not realize that it was old and so much stronger. Just before going, when I was all dressed, I went to look at the baby. I did not like her looks, so took her up to find her in a stupor. Needless to say, there was no party for us that night. It took us all to awaken her and keep her awake. I never gave laudanum after that, though I always had before. End of section 17. Recording by Andrea. Section 18 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Paulina Starkloff, 1854. My name was Paulina Lenchka. I was 12 years old when I came to Minneapolis in 1854. We intended to stay in St. Paul, but were told that this was a better place, so came here and bought an acre and a half just where the house now stands, Main Street Northeast. The town then was mostly northeast. The St. Charles Hotel on Marshall Street Northeast was just below us, and so were most of the stores. Morgan's Foundry and Orth's Brewery were just on the other side of us. We paid $600 in gold for the land, and half of it was in my name, as my mother paid $350 that I had made myself. I think I was probably the only 12-year-old child that came into the state with so much money earned by herself. It was this way. We went to Australia to dig gold in 1847. We drove an ox team into the interior with other prospectors doing the same until we came to diggings. The men would dig and then cradle the soil for the gold. This cradle was just like a baby's cradle, only it had a sieve in the bottom. One man would have a very long-handled dipper with which he would dip water from a dug well. He only dipped and the other man stirred with a stick and rocked. Most of the soil would wash out, but there would always be some dumplings caused by the clay hardening, and nothing but hard work would break them. The miners would take out the gold, which was always round, and dump these hard pieces. After a day's work, there would be quite a pile that was never touched by them. I would take a can and knife and go from dump to dump gathering the gold in these dumplings. One day my father went prospecting with a party of men and was never seen again. After months of fruitless search, my mother took me and my little tin can of nuggets back to Germany. She sold them for me for $350 in gold. Then we came to Minnesota and bought this place. The Red River carts used to be all day passing our house. They would come squeaking along one after another. Sometimes the driver would take his wife and children with him. These carts had no metal about them. One man would have charge of several. Mrs. Anna E. Balser, 1855, 94 years old. I was the only girl in our family that ever worked, but when I was 10 years old, I laid my plan to get myself out of my mother's tracks. She had so much to do with her big family. I could cry when I think of it now. So... When I was fourteen, my father, scared for me and holding back every minute, took me to the city to learn the trade I had chosen. I was through in six months and could do the heaviest work as well as the finest. I wish you could see the fancy bosomed shirts I used to make when I was fourteen. No one could beat me. I always had a pocket full of money for I got two and six a day. That would be thirty-eight cents now. I went from house to house to work and always had the best room and lived on the fat of the land. It was a great event when the tailoress came. I came to Lakeland in 1855. The prairies around there looked like apple orchards back home. The scrub oak grew just that way. I would bet anything I could go and pick apples if I had not known. I had thought of buying in Minneapolis, but my friends who owned Lakeland thought it was going to be the city of Minnesota, so I bought here. I was a tailoress and made a good living until the hard times came on. 
Money was plenty one day, the next you could not get a bit even anywhere. Then, after that, I had to trade my work for anything I could get. I brought a blue-black silk dress with mutton-leg sleeves among my things when I come. It was the best-wearing thing I ever see. Cheaper to wear than calico because it would never wear out. I paid a dollar a yard for it. It was 27 inches wide. It took 12 yards to make the dress. For a wrap, we wore a long shawl. I had one of white lace. We got three yards of lace webbing and trimmed it with lace on the edge. Or we would take one width of silk and finish that fancy on the edge. The ruffles on everything was fluted. When you shirred them, you would hold them over the first and third finger, passing under the second finger. That would make large flutings. If you had an Italian iron, you could do it fast, but there wasn't many so fortunate. An Italian iron was a tube about as big as your finger on a standard. Two rods to fit this tube come with it. You could put these heated inside, then run your silk ruffle or whatever you were making over it, and there was your flute quick as a wink. Mrs. Mary E. Dowling, 1855 As Miss Watson, I came from Pennsylvania in 1855 and took a school to teach back of Marine. I got $36 in gold a month and so was well paid had from five to twenty-five children who came to learn, and so behaved well. When I would walk through the woods, I would sometimes see a bear leisurely sagging around. When I did, my movements were not like his. All kinds of wild animals were very plenty. The foxes were the cutest little animals and so tame. They would seem to be laughing at you. A band of Indians was encamped at a lake near. One brave, all dressed in his Sunday best, used to come and sit in the kitchen day after day. He used to talk to the men, but never said a word to us. He could speak good English. One day the chief came in and went for him. Said he had been away from his teepee for days and his squaws wanted him. Like lightning he crossed the room to where I was and said, Me got Sioux squaw. Me got Winnebago squaw. Me want white squaw. You go? I was very earnest in declining. Mrs. Robert Anderson, 1854 I was the first white woman in Eden Prairie. I came in 1854 with my husband and small children and settled there in one of the first log houses built. We paid for our farm the first year from the cranberries which grew in a bog on our land and which we sold for a dollar a bushel. I had never seen Indians near to, and so was very much afraid of them. One day, a big hideously painted brave marched in, seated himself, and looked stolidly around without making a sound. His long knife was sticking in his belt. I was overpowered with fright and for a few moments could do nothing. My children, one two years old and the other a baby, were asleep behind the curtain. Realizing that I could do nothing for them and that his anger might be aroused if he saw me run away with them, I fled precipitately in the direction where my husband was working. I had run about a quarter of a mile when my mother heart told me I might not be in time if I waited for my husband, so I turned and fled back towards the cabin. Entering, I saw my little two-year-old boy standing by the Indian side playing with the things in his belt while the Indian carefully held the baby in his arms. In his belt were a tobacco pouch and pipe, two rabbits with their heads drawn through, two prairie chickens hanging from it by their necks, a knife, and a tomahawk. His expression remained unchanged. I gave him bread and milk to eat, and ever after he was our friend, oftentimes coming and bringing the children playthings and moccasins. When he left, he gave me the rabbits and prairie chickens, and afterwards often brought me game. One day Mr. Anderson was at work in the field, a long distance from the house. He was cutting grain with a scythe and told me he would just about get that piece done if I would bring him his supper. I had never been over on this knoll which was on the other side of a small hill from the house. I got his supper ready, taking all the dishes and food in a basket and carrying a teapot full of tea in my hand. I had to pass a small cranberry bog and could see squaws at work picking berries. 
As I came to a clump of trees, ten or twelve Indians with their faces as usual hideously painted, the whole upper part of their bodies bare and painted, rose from this clump of trees and looked at me. I waited for nothing, but threw my basket and teapot and made for the house. As I got to the top of the hill, I looked back and could see the Indians feasting on my husband's supper. Upon his return home to supper that evening, he brought the dishes and the teapot with him. We had been in Eden Prairie about six years and had never been to church, as there was no church near enough for us to attend. We heard there was to be preaching at Bloomington and determined to go. We had always been church-going people and had felt the loss of services very keenly. We had nothing but an ox team and thought this would not be appropriate to go to church with, so, carrying my baby, I walked the six miles to church and six miles back again. The next Sunday, however, we rode nearly to church with the ox team, then hitched them in the woods and went on foot the rest of the way. Mr. Anderson was always a devoted friend of Mr. Pond, the missionary, and attended his church for many years. One of Mr. Anderson's sons took up a claim in the northern part of the state. When Mr. Pond died, he came down to the funeral. Upon his return, he saw a teepee pitched on the edge of his farm and went over to see what it was there for and who was in it. As he neared it, he heard talking in a monotone and stood listening, wondering what it could mean. He pushed up the flap and saw Indians engaged in prayer. He asked them who taught them to pray, and they replied, Grizzly Bear taught us. He told them Grizzly Bear, which was the Indian name for Mr. Pond, was dead and would be seen no more. He took from his pocketbook a little white flower which he had taken from the casket, told them what it was, and each one of them held it reverently with much lamentation. This was twenty years after these people had been taught by Grizzly Bear. End of section 18. Recording by Andrea. Section 19 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Section 19. Mrs. Wilder, 1854. We settled on a farm near Morristown. There was an Indian village near. We always used to play with those Sioux children, and always found them very fair in their play. We used to like to go in their teepees. There was a depression in the middle for the fire. The smoke was supposed to go out of the hole in the top of the tent. An Indian always had a smoky smell. When they cooked game, they just drew it a little, never took off the feathers much, or cut the head or feet off. Some of our Indians got into a fuss with a band from Faribault, and one of our Indians killed one of them. He brought a great knife that he had done the killing with, and gave it to my father all uncleaned as it was. He said it was Sichi knife, meaning bad. As they were still fighting, my father took it just as it was, and stuck it up in a crack above our front door in our one room. Then he sent to Morristown for Mr. Morris to straighten out the fight. He had lived among the Indians for a long time, and knew their language. He brought them to time. Later they came and wanted the knife, but my father would not give it to them. Geese and ducks covered the lakes. Later we had the most wonderful feather beds made from their feathers. We only used the small fluffy ones, so they were as if they were made from down. Wild rice, one of the Indians' principal articles of diet, when gathered was knocked into their canoe. It was often unhulled. I have seen the Indians hull it. They would dig a hole in the ground, line it with a buffalo skin, hair side down, then turn the rice in this, jumping up and down on it with their moccasined feet until it was hulled. 
I could never fancy it much after I saw this. We had great quantities of wild plums on our own place. Two trees grew close together, and were so much alike, we always called them the twins. Those trees had the most wonderful plums, as large as a small peach. We used to peel them and serve them with cream. Nothing could have a finer flavor. Just before the outbreak, an Indian runner, whom none of us had ever seen, went around to all the Sioux around there. Then with their ponies loaded, the teepee poles dragging behind, for three days our Indians went by our place on the old trail going west. Only a few of Bishop Whipple's Christian Indians remained. Mr. Warren Wakefield, 1854 My father came to Wayzata with his family, settling where the Sam Bowman place now is. We had lived over a year in southern Minnesota. As the hail took all our crops, we had lived on thin prairie chickens and biscuits made of sprouted wheat. It would not make bread. The biscuits were so elastic and soft that they could be stretched way out. They were the first playthings that I can remember. A trader came with cows into the country where we were living, just before the hailstorm, and as there was nothing to feed them on, my father traded for some of them. He traded one of his pair of oxen for forty acres of land in Wezada, and the other for corn to winter the stock. The first meal we had in our new home was of venison from a buck which my father shot. It was very fat and juicy, and as we had not had any meat but ducks and prairie chickens in two years, it tasted very delicious. I have counted thirty-four deer in the swamps at one time near our house. They were so abundant. We lived the first winter in Wezada on fish, venison, and cornmeal, and I have never lived so well. I was sixteen years old before I ever had a coat. We wore thick shirts in the winter, and the colder it was, the more of them we wore. In the east my mother had always spun her own yarn, and woven great piles of blankets and woolen sheets. These were loaded in the wagon and brought to our new home. When there was nothing else, these sheets made our shirts. We never wore underclothing, but our pants were thickly lined. My mother was a tailoress, and that first year in Minnesota we could not have lived if it had not been for this. She cut out and made by hand all kinds of clothing for the settlers. My father used to buy leather, and the shoemaker came to the house and made our shoes. One spring we had a cellar full of vegetables that we could not use, so father invited all the squaws who lived near us to come and get some. They came and took them away. In the cellar also was a keg and a two-gallon jug of maple vinegar. Cut nose, one of the finest specimens of manhood I have ever seen. Tall, straight, and with agreeable features, in spite of the small piece gone from the edge of one nostril, was their chief, and came the next day with a large bottle, asking to have it filled with whiskey. Father said he had none but Cut Nose said he knew there was a jug and keg of it in the cellar. Father told him to go and take it if he found any. He sampled first the jug, and then the keg with a most disgusted expression, and upon coming upstairs, threw the bottle on the bed and stalked out. This maple vinegar was made from maple sugar, and none could be better. Cut Nose was often a visitor at our home. He was a great brag, and not noted for truth-telling. He was very fond of telling how he shot the renegade, Ink Paduta. This was all imagination. He had an old flintlock musket with the flint gone, and would illustrate his story by crawling and skulking, generally to the great delight of the boys. One rainy day, my mother was sick and was lying in her bed, which was curtained off from the rest of the living room. As Cut Nose, who did not know this, told his oft-repeated story, illustrating it as usual he thrust his gun under the curtains and his face and shoulders after it to show how he shot the renegade chief from ambush my mother dashed out with a shriek but was no more frightened than cut nose at the apparition of the white squaw one day my brother and i took a peck of potatoes each and went on to an indian camp to trade for two pairs of moccasins the usual trade we left the potatoes with the squaws for a moment and ran outside to see what some noise was. When we returned, there were no potatoes to be seen, and no moccasins to be traded. We began looking about, but could see nothing. 
the fire was burned down well and was a glowing bed of coals in its depression in the center of the teepee after a while one of the old squaws went to the ashes and digging them with a stick commenced to dig out the potatoes as the fire was about four feet in diameter the usual width there was plenty of room for our half bushel of potatoes they gave us some of them which had a wonderful flavor but we never got any moccasins among the indians living at the lake one winter was a white child about three years old my father tried to buy her but they would not let go of her or tell who she was they left that part of the country later still having her in their possession if it had not been for ginseng in minnesota many of the pioneers would have gone hungry but mr shelton of virginia came early and built a small furnace and drying house in Wayzata. every one went to the woods and dug ginseng for the crude product they received five cents a pound and the amount that could be found was unlimited it was dug with a long narrow bladed hoe and an expert could take out a young root with one stroke if while digging he had his eye on another plant and dug that at once he could make a great deal of money in one day an old root sometimes weighed a half pound i was a poor ginseng digger for i never noticed quickly but my father would dig all around my feet while i was hunting another chance the tinge of green of this plant was different from any other so it could be easily distinguished when we sold it we were always paid in gold after ginseng is steamed and dried it is the color of amber end of section 19 recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section 20 of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reed All Day. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Leroy Sampson. 1854. Six families of us came together from Rhode Island and settled on Minnewashta Lake in 54. There was only a carpenter shop in Excelsior. We spent the first few months of our stay all living together in one log shack which was already there. The first night, the man who had driven us from St. Paul sat up all night with his horses, and we none of us slept a wink inside that little windowless cabin on account of a noise we heard. In the morning, we found it was the mournful noise of the loons on the lake that had kept us awake, instead of the wolves we had feared. Mrs. Anna Simmons Apgar, 1854 When our six families got to the springs near Excelsior, it was near dark and we struck the worst road we had found in the swampy land by it. The mosquitoes were dreadful too. How dreadful? No one today can ever believe. One of the tired out men said, This is hell. No, said another, not hell, but purgatory. The spring took its name from that. When my father had put up his cabin, he made our furniture with his own hands out of basswood. He made one of those beds with holes in the side piece for the ropes to go from side to side instead of our springs of today. They used to be very comfortable. When father got ready for the rope, he had none. So he made it by twisting basswood bark. Then mother sewed two of our homespun sheets together for a tick, and my uncle cut hay from the marsh and dried it to fill it, and we had a bed fit for a king. Our floor was of maple, split with wedges, and hewed out with a broad axe. Father was a wonder at using this. A broad axe was, you know, twelve or fourteen inches wide, and the handle was curved a little. A man had to be a man to use one of these. It took strength and a good trained eye to hew timber flat with one of these axes. When I was playing, I tore my clothes off continually in the woods. Finally my mother said, This has gone far enough, and made me a blue denim with a low neck and short sleeves. Has anyone ever told you how terrible the mosquitoes were in the early days? Think of the worst experience you ever had with them, and then add a million for each one, and you will have some idea. My little face, neck, arms, legs, and feet were so bitten, scratched, and sunburnt that when I was undressed, I was the most checkered-looking young one you ever saw. Those parts of me might have been taken from a black child and glued on my little white body. 
such huge fish as overrun the lakes you have never seen. We thought the Indians numerous, and they had fished for ages in those lakes, but they only caught what they wanted for food. It took the white men with their catching for sport to see how many they could catch in one day, and right back east about it, to clean out the lakes. Father hewed a big basswood canoe out of a log. Eight people could sit comfortably in it, as long as they did not breathe, but if they did, over she went. We used to have lots of fun in that old canoe, just the same, and the fish got fewer after it came into commission. When we six families first came, we were all living in one little cabin, waiting for our homes to be built and our furniture to come. One of the women was very sick. Dr. Ames came out to see her and cured her all right. It took a day to get him and another day for him to get home. He wanted to wash his hands and my aunt, who was used to everything, said she thought she would drop dead when she had to take him the water in a little wooden trough that father had hewed out. He made such cute little hooded cradles for babies too, out of the forest wood. Mrs. Newman Woods, 1854, Excelsior. When we made our tallow dips or rough candles, we took the candle wicking and wound it around from our hand to our elbow, then cut it through. We held a short stick between our knees and threw one of these wicks around it, twisting it deftly, letting it hang down. When we had filled the stick, we would lay it down and fill another until we had wicks for about ten dozen dips. My mother would then fill the washer boiler two-thirds full of water and pour melted deer or other tallow on top of this. Two chairs had been placed with two long slats between them. She would dip one stick full of wicks up and down in the boiler a number of times, then place it across the slats to cool. This was continued until all the wicks were dipped. By this time, the first would have hardened and could be dipped again. We would work hard all day and make eight or ten dozen dips. Later, we had candle moulds made of tin. We would put a wick in the center where it was held erect, and then pour these moulds full of tallow and let them harden. Later, the moulds were dipped in hot water, and then a spring at the side pushed the candle out. This was very simple. We had our first kerosene lamp in 61. We were terrible frightened of it. It did smell terrible, but this did not keep us from being very proud of it. Once mother was frying pancakes for supper, a number of Indians going by came in and saw her. They were all painted or daubed. They kept reaching over and trying to get the pancakes. Finally, one of them stuck out his leg, acting as if it was broken. I ran madly to the back clearing where father and uncle Silas were working and told them there were Indians trying to get our pancakes and that one of them had a broken leg. They were not frightened, but they knew the Indians and their customs. I just waited to see father give them a pancake apiece, and that leg settled down naturally. Then ran and got under the bed. The Indians were very fond of father, who had a very heavy beard. It used to be stylish to shave the upper lip. The Indians used to watch him shave with great interest. The neighborhood was full of them, generally all painted for the war dance. They used to bother father to death, wanting to be shaved. One morning he did shave one of them, and you never saw such a proud Indian, or more disgusted ones than those who were left out. Nearly all of the Indians who came were Sioux and fine-looking. One of the greatest pests to the pioneers around here was the thousand-legged worms. They were very thick around where we were and very poisonous. My little sister nearly died from getting one in her mouth when she was lying on a quilt on the floor. Mother used to make mince pies by soaking pumpkin in vinegar. We dried the wild grapes for raisins. My, but those pies were good. Everybody bragged on Aunt Hannah's mince pies. My father and brother frequently went hunting for deer. They used to run their bullets, which were round, by melting lead in a ladle in the stove. Such a looking kitchen as they would leave. Ashes from the ladle all over everything. It wasn't much of a trick to shoot deer. They were so thick and so tame. They used to come right near the house. I did not like venison, for it seemed to me like eating a friend. All six of us families used to wash at the lake in summer. We used soft soap that we made ourselves and boiled the clothes in a big kettle. They were beautifully white. Mr. Chester L. Hopkins, 1854, Hopkins. When I was a little boy, we had a grindstone 
in our yard, which was used by us and our few scattered neighbors. One night we were awakened by hearing the grindstone going, and father went to the door to see who was using it. A party of forty Sioux braves on their ponies were standing around, while some of the braves ground their knives, which each in his turn put in his belt. It was a bright moonlight night, and we could see them as plainly as if it was day. The Indians were in full war paint and feathers, and after their task was accomplished, rode one after the other over the hill, where they stood out like black silhouettes, and finally disappeared. They were probably going to a war dance. End of section 20 Section 21 of Old Rail Fence Corners this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Section 21. Miss Florinda Hopkins Hopkins When I was a little girl, a number of Indians came in on a rainy day, and tired from a long tramp, lay asleep on the floor of the kitchen. The party consisted of a chief and seven braves. My mother was making dried apple pies. When she had finished, she cut two of them into six pieces each, and gave each Indian a piece which he ate with the greatest relish. All of them kept a watchful eye on the remaining pieces, which they regarded wistfully. The chief with a noble gesture motioned them all to leave the house, and remained himself. As soon as they were outside, he motioned for the rest of the pie, and ate it all with the greatest relish, while the rest of the band looked enviously through the window. Were these not indeed children? I remember a Sioux war party of ten or more going by our house, returning from a war dance at Shakopee. They were doing their war song business as they trotted along, and swinging one pitiful scalp on a pole. Their battles were generally like this. Ten was a small number to kill one Chippewa. When the Chippewa retaliated, they would go in the same proportion. One morning a party stopped here. They were very tired, had probably trotted a long, long way, for their endurance was wonderful. They just said, Chippewa, and as soon as they knew we had seen none, were flying on again. We often traded food with the Indians, as well as giving it to them, allowing them to make their own terms. They would bring a pair of fancy beaded moccasins, and trade them for six doughnuts. Mrs. J. W. Ladd, 1854 I remember seeing and hearing the Red River carts as they passed through St. Anthony. The cart was almost square with posts standing up along the sides to hold the furs which were piled high above the cart, and roped down in place. There was one swarthy man to five or six ox-drawn carts. He was dressed in a coonskin cap or broad-brimmed hat with buckskin trousers and jumper. He had a knit bright-colored sash about his waist, and his hat had a bright-colored band. One day my mother was sitting sewing while I was playing about the room, when the light seemed obscured. We looked up to see a number of Indian faces in the window. They made motions to mother to trade her earrings for moccasins, and failing in this, they asked for the bright-colored tassels which hung from the curtain. They also very much admired my mother's delaine dress, which was of triangles in blue, red, black, and white. When refused, they went away peaceably, but afterwards often returned trying to make a trade. Mrs. C. H. Pettit, 1854, Minneapolis. In 1854, I attended church in the Toothpick Church. This was a small church so called from its high, narrow tower. I had never seen Indians as we had just moved to town. I was walking along through the woods on what is now 4th Street, when I was surrounded by yelling, painted Indians on ponies. Seeing that I was frightened nearly to death, 
they continued these antics circling round and round me whooping and yelling until i had reached my home then they rode rapidly away undoubtedly taking great pleasure in the fright they had given the paleface mrs anna hennis huston eighteen fifty four i moved to st anthony in eighteen fifty four i was only a tiny tot but used to go with my brother along a path by the river to find our cow we usually found her in the basement of the university the roaring of the falls used to scare me and if the wind was in the right direction we would be all wet with the spray i remember that at one time in the early days potatoes were very scarce my mother traded a wash dish full of eggs for the same amount of potatoes mr henry favell eighteen fifty four with my family i lived thirty miles from carver my father died and as i had no money to buy a coffin i made it myself i had to walk thirty miles for the nails the boards were hand hewed and when the coffin was made it looked so different from those we had seen in its staring whiteness that we took the only thing we had a box of stove blacking which we had brought from the east with us and stained the coffin with this i walked twenty miles for potatoes for seed and paid three dollars a bushel for them i brought them home on my back i was three days making the journey on foot the wages for a carpenter at this time were thirty dollars a month and found mrs rebecca plummer eighteen fifty four we came to brooklyn center in eighteen fifty four mr plummer's father had come in fifty two and had taken a claim we did enjoy the game for we had never had much pigeons were very thick we used to stake nets for them almost touching the ground under these we scattered corn they would stoop and go in under and pick up the grain when they held their heads erect to swallow the corn their necks would come through the meshes of the net and they could not escape i saw the winnebagoes taken to their river reservation they camped at night on the island in the river they went through all the dances they knew and made every noise they knew how to make the most wonderful sight though was to see that vast flotilla of canoes going on the next morning there were hundreds of them with their indian occupants besides the long procession on foot mrs c a burdick 1855 we came to what is now st cloud settling near the junction of the little sauk and mississippi the sauk was a beautiful little river the strawberries were very sweet a much nicer flavor than tame ones the prairie was covered with them the winnebagoes who had lived on long prairie were transferred to their new home and we went to take care of the agency buildings they had left there were from seventy-five to a hundred of these buildings franklin steele and anton northrup owned them we were awfully lonesome but we braved it out the indians were always coming and demanding something to eat they were always painted and had bows and arrows with them they would everlastingly stand and look in the windows and watch us work we were so used to them that we never noticed them only it was troublesome to have the light obscured have i ever seen the red river carts my i should say i have seen them by the hundred my husband had charge of a fur store for kitson at fort garry now winnipeg and we lived there i used to go back and forth to st cloud where my parents lived with this cart train for protection the drivers were a swarthy lot of french half-breeds likely as not their hair would be hanging way down they wore buckskin and a fancy sash sometimes a skin cap and sometimes just their hair or a wide hat a tame enough lot of men fond of jigging at night they could hold out dancing seemed to never tire their carts had two wheels all wood and a cross piece to rest the platform on this platform had stakes standing way up at the sides they were piled high with goods furs and skins going down and supplies coming back i can shut my eyes and see that quaint cavalcade now where are all those drivers the tracks were wide and deep and could be plainly seen ahead of us going straight through the prairie it took twenty-one days to go from st cloud to pembina we used to go through sauk center just a hotel or roadhouse then through what is now alexandria a family by the name of wright 
used to keep a stopping place for travelers. I don't know just where it would be now, but I have stayed there often. We went by way of Georgetown, Swan River too, I remember. There used to be one tree on the prairie that we could see for two days. We called it Lone Tree. Mr. Peter Cooper, 1855. I moved to Vernon Center in the early 50s. I had never worn an overcoat in New York State, but when I came to Minnesota, particularly felt the need of one. The second year I was here, I traded with an Indian, two small pigs for a brass kettle, and an Indian blanket. Without any pattern whatever, my wife cut an overcoat from this blanket and sewed it by hand. This was the only overcoat I had for four years, but it was very comfortable. When I was in the Indian War in 1862, I had no mittens, and suffered greatly for this reason. In one of the abandoned Norwegian homes, I found some handmade yarn, but had no way to get it made into mittens. I carved a crochet hook out of hickory, and with this crocheted myself gloves, with a place for every finger, although I had never had any experience, and had only watched the women knit and crochet. End of section 21. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 22 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. Stephen Rochette, 1855, St. Paul. Indians used often to stop to get something to eat. They never stole anything and seemed satisfied with what we gave them. We were on the direct road from Fort Snelling to St. Paul. It was made on the old trail between those two places. This went right up 7th Street. The Indians often brought ducks and game to sell. I used to shoot pigeons and prairie chickens on what is now Summit Avenue. I used to make cushions for Father Rouveau's back. He had rheumatism very badly. He used to go by our house horseback. I wanted to give him the cushions, but he would never take anything he did not pay for. I bought a number of knockdown chairs in Chicago, all made by hand for $125, and sold them for much more. Those chairs would last a lifetime. The parts were separate and packed well. They could be put together easily. Mrs. Stephen Rochette, 1855 when we first came into St. Paul in 1855, we landed on the upper levee. It was used then more than the lower one. We thought we could never get used to the narrow, crooked streets. We lived with my father, Jacob Donnie, where the Milwaukee tracks now cross 7th Street. We soon had three cows. We never had any fence for them. Just turned them out and let them run in the streets with the other cows and pigs. Sometimes we could find them easily. Again, we would have a long hunt. Mrs. James A. Winter, 1855 We came to Faribault in 1855. My father had the first frame hotel there. The Indians had a permanent camp on the outskirts of the village. I was a small girl of sixteen, with very fair skin, blue eyes, and red cheeks. The squaws used to come to the house asking for food, which mother always gave them. Old Betts was often there. A young Indian, tall and fine-looking, used to come and sit watching me intently while I worked about the house, much to my discomfort. Finally, one day he came close to me and motioned to me to fly with him. I showed no fear, but led the way to the kitchen where there were others working and fed him, shaking my head violently all the time. He was the son of a chief and was hung at Mankato. Mrs. George E. Fisher, 1855. Mother's name was Jane DeBeau, 
Her father and mother were French. She came to Minnesota with the Stevens in 1834, when she was seven years old. They were missionaries, and when their own daughter died, induced Jane's family to let them have her. The Indians were always sorry for her, because her mother was away. They called her Small Crow That Was Caught. Mrs. Stevens never could punish her, for it made the squaws so angry. The first Indian child my mother ever saw was a small boy who stood on the edge of Lake Harriet, beckoning to her. She was afraid at first, but finally joined him, and always played with the Indian children from that time. The Stevens the next year had a little school near their cabin, not far from where the pavilion is now. The Indian children always had to have prizes for coming. These prizes were generally turnips. Often they give a bushel in one day. In 1839, some Chippewa Indians ambushed a Sioux father who was hunting with his little son. The child escaped and told the story. The Sioux went on the warpath immediately and brought home forty or fifty Chippewa scalps. They had been lucky as they found a camp where the warriors were all away. They massacred the old men, women, and children and came home to a big scalp dance. My mother had played with the Indian children so much that she was as jubilant as they when she saw those gory trophies. She learned and enjoyed the dance. She taught me the Sioux words to the scalp dance, and often sang them to us. Translated they are, You, Ojibwa, you are mean. We will use you like a mouse. We have got you, and we will strike you down. My dog is very hungry. I will give him the Ojibwa scalps. The Indian children would take a kettle full of water, make a fire under it, and throw fish or turtles from their bone hooks directly into this. When they were cooked slightly, they would take them out and eat them without salt, cracking the turtle shells on the rocks. The boys used to hunt with their bows and arrows, just as they did in later years. They were always fair in their games. My mother married Mr. Gibbs and moved to this farm on what was the territorial road near the present agricultural college. It was on the direct Indian trail to the hunting grounds around Rice Lake. The Indian warriors were always passing on it and always stopped to see their old playmate. By this time they had guns, and they would always give them to mother to keep while they were in the house. The kitchen floor would be covered with sleeping warriors. Mother knew all their superstitions. One was that if a woman jumped over their feet, they could never run again. I can well remember my gay, light-hearted mother running and jumping over all their feet in succession as they lay asleep in her kitchen, and the way her eyes danced with mischief as she stood jollying them in Sioux. We noticed that not one of them lost any time in finding out if they were bewitched. Our Indians, when they came to see mother, wanted to do as she did. They would sit up to the table and she would give them a plate and knife and fork. This pleased them much. They would start with the food on their plates, but soon would have it all in their laps. They were very dissatisfied with the way the whites were taking their lands. The big treaty at Traverse des Sioux was especially distasteful for them. They said their lands had been stolen from them. They were very angry at my father, because he put a rail fence across their trail, and would have killed him if it had not been for mother. The last time these good friends came was in May, 1862. A large body of them on horseback camped on the little knoll across from our house where the dead tree now is. They were sullen and despondent. Well do I remember the dramatic gestures of their chief, as he eloquently related their grievances. My mother followed every word he said, for she knew how differently they were situated from their former condition. When she first knew them, they owned all the country the whites nothing. In these few years the tables had been turned. Her heart bled for them, her childhood's companions. He said his warriors could hardly be kept from the warpath against the whites. That, so far, his counsel had prevailed, but every time they had a council it was harder to control them, that their hunting and fishing grounds were gone, the buffalo disappearing, and there was no food for the squaws and papooses. The great white father had forgotten them, he knew, for their rations were long overdue, and there was hunger in the camp. They slept that night in our kitchen, little beckoning boy and the other playmates. 
I can still see the sad look on my mother's face as she went from one to the other, giving each a big hot breakfast and trying to cheer them. She could see how they had been wronged. She stood and watched them sadly as they mounted their ponies and vanished down the old trail. Lieutenant Governor Gilman, 1855 The winter of 55 and 56 was 35 degrees below zero, two weeks at a time, and 40 degrees below was usual. I have often seen the Red River carts ford the river here. They crossed at the foot of Sixth Street, between where the two warehouses are now. Mrs. Austin W. Farnsworth, 1855 We came to Dodge County in 1855. The first year we were hailed out, and we had to live on rutabagas and wild tea. We got some game, too. But we were some tired of our diet before things began to grow again. When that hailstorm came, we were all at a quilting bee. There was an old lady, Mrs. Maxfield there, rubbing her hundred mark pretty close. She sat in a corner, and was not scared though the oxen broke away, and run home, and we had to hold the door to keep it from blowing in. We said, Ain't you afraid? She answered, No, I'm not. If I do go out, I don't want to die howling. The first time I worked out, when I was fourteen years old, I got fifty cents a week. There was lots to do, for there were twin babies. I used to get awful homesick. I went home Saturdays, and when I came over the hill where I could see our cabin, I could have put my arms around it and kissed it. I was that glad to see home. End of section 22. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 23 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Section 23. Mr. Theodore Curtis. 1855 Minneapolis When I was a little boy my father was building some scows down where the Washington Avenue bridge now is at the boat landing There were five or six small sluiceways built up above the river leading from the plat where the lumber from the mills was piled down to where these scows were These sluices were used to float the lumber down to the scows a platform was built out over the river in a very early day and was i should say three hundred feet wide and one thousand feet long as the lumber came from the mills it was piled in huge piles along this platform each mill had its sluice way but they were all side by side it was very popular to drive down to this platform and look at the falls whose roaring was a magnet to draw all to see them we boys used to play under this platform jumping from one support to another and then finish up by running down the steps and cavorting joyously under the falls i used to get the drinking water for the workmen from the springs that seeped out everywhere along near where my father worked once he sent me to get water quickly i had a little dog with me and we unthinkingly stepped in the spring making the water royally Childlike I never thought of going to another but played around waiting for it to settle then as usual took it on top of the sluice ways It seemed father thought I had been gone an hour and acted accordingly. I shall always remember that whipping Mrs. Charles M. Godley 1856 My father mr. Scrimgeour came to Minneapolis in 1855 and built a small home between 1st and 2nd Avenues north on 4th Street. When my mother arrived, she cried when she saw where her home was to be and said to her husband, as he was cutting the hazel brush from around the house, You told me I would not have to live in a wilderness if I came here. Mr. Morgan lived across the street. He and my father decided to dig a well together and put it in the street so that both families could use it my father said to mr. Morgan 
Of course, there is a street surveyed here, but the town will never grow to it, so the well will be all right here. Mr. Morgan was a great bookworm and not at all practical. If his horse got out and was put in with other strays, he could never tell it, but had to wait until everyone took theirs, and then he would take what was left. There was a big sand hole at the corner of Second Avenue South and Fourth Street, where they had dug out sand. It was the great playground for all the children, for it was thought the town would never grow there, and so it was a good place for a sand hole. When I went to school, I always followed an Indian trail that led from Hogue's Lake to the government mill. It was bordered by hazel brush and once in a while a scrub oak. I was much disturbed one night on my way home to find men digging a hole through my beloved trail. I hoped they would be gone in the morning, but to my great disappointment they were not, for they were digging the excavation for the Nicolette house. My school was in an old store building at the falls and was taught by Oliver Gray. Dr. Barnard lived on the corner by our house. He was Indian agent and very kind to the Indians. One night, a number of them came in the rain. Mr. Barnard tried to get them to sleep in the house. All refused. One had a very bad cough, so the doctor insisted on his coming in and gave him a room with a bed. Shortly after, he heard a terrible noise with an awful yell like a war whoop. The Indian dashed down the stairs, out of the house and away. The slats in the bed were found broken, and the bed was on the floor. Later, they found that he had started for bed from the furthest side of the room, run with full force, and plunged in and through. In 1857, when the panic came, all stores in Minneapolis failed, and there was not a penny in circulation. Everything was paid by order. There was a small farmhouse where the Andrews Hotel now stands. Fourth Street North, that led to it from our house, was full of stumps. We got a quart of milk every night at this place. They never milked until very late, so it was dark. I used to go for it. My mother always gave me a six-quart pail, so that after I had stumbled along over those stumps, the bottom of the pail, at least, would be covered. No one who was used to an eastern climate had any idea how to dress out here when they first came. I wore hoops and a low-necked waist, just as other little girls did. I can remember the discussion that took place before a little merino sack was made for me. I don't remember whether I was supposed to be showing the white feather if I surrendered to the climate and covered my poor little bare neck, or whether I would be too out of style. I must have looked like a little picked chicken with goose flesh all over me. Once before this costume was added to by the little sack, my mother sent me for a jug of vinegar down to Helen Street and Washington Avenue South. I had on the same little hoops and only one thickness of cotton underclothing under them. It must have been twenty degrees below zero. I thought I would perish before I got there, but childlike never peeped. When I finally reached home, they had an awful time thawing me out. The vinegar was frozen solid in the jug. The boardwalk, six blocks long, was built from Bridge Square to Bassett's Hall on First Street North. It was a regular sidewalk, not just two boards laid lengthwise, and held by cross pieces as the other sidewalks were. Our dress parade always took place there. We would walk back and forth untiringly, passing everybody we knew, and we knew everybody in town. Instead of taking a girl out driving or to the theatre, a young man would ask, Won't you go walking on the boardwalk? Lucy Morgan used to go to school with us when we first came. She had long ringlets and always wore low-necked dresses, just as the rest of us did, but her white neck never had any goose flesh on it, and she was the only one who had curls. We went to high school where the courthouse now stands. It was on a little hill, so we always said we were climbing the hill of knowledge. I can well remember the dazed look that came on my father's face when, for the first time, 
he realized that there were horses in town that he did not know the town had grown so that he could not keep pace with it mr frank slocum 1856 when we drove from st paul to cannon falls in 56 we only saw one small piece of fence on the way a man by the name of baker at rich valley in dakota county had this around his dooryard he had dug a trench and thrown up a ridge of dirt on top of this he had two cross pieces and a rail on top you call it a rail fence we called it oftener stake and rider we followed the regular road from st paul to dubuque the original indian trail which was afterward the stage road started at red wing and went through cannon falls staunton northfield dundas cannon city and faribault my father had a store in cannon falls I was only 13 and small for my age, but I used to serve. One day, a big Indian came in when I was alone and asked for buckshot. They were large, and it did not take many to weigh a pound. He picked a couple out and pretended to be examining them. I weighed the pound, and when I saw he did not put them back, I took out two. You never saw an Indian laugh so hard in your life. You always had to be careful when weighing things for Indians, for if you got over the quantity and took some out, they were always grouchy and thought you were cheating them. The farmers used to come through our town on their way to Hastings with their grain on their ox-drawn wagons. They had a journey of 200 miles from Owatonna to Hastings and back. They would go in companies and camp out on the way. During the years of 56 and 57, Many people could not write home as they had no money to pay postage. Our business was all in trade. In 1854, a man whom we all knew who lived up above Mankato took an Indian canoe and paddled down the river to St. Paul. There he sold it for enough money to pay his fare back on the boat. He was a man of considerable conscience in his dealings with white men, but when a man was only an Indian, it had not caught up with him yet now for the sequel the man who bought it had it under the eaves of his house to catch rainwater during a storm his window was darkened he looked up to see an indian with his blanket held high to darken the window so he could see in the white man went out the savage said my canoe want him the man would not give it up but the indian and his friends went to the authorities and he had to they had traced it all that long way we bought an elevated oven cook stove in st paul and it was in use every day for fifty years we brought baker knock-down chairs with us and they have been in constant use for fifty-eight years have never been repaired and look as if they were good for one hundred years more we made coffee from potato chips sliced very thin and browned in the oven not such bad coffee either end of section 23librivox.org recording by greg giordano old rail fence corners edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris section 24 mrs t b walker minneapolis i remember going to market in the morning and seeing a wagon with all the requisites for a home drive up to a vacant lot on the wagon were lumber furniture and a wife and baby what more could be needed when i passed in the afternoon the rough house was up the stove pipe through the window sent out a cheery smoke and the woman sang about her household tasks one morning i was at church in st anthony the minister had just given out the text when the squeaking of the red river carts was faintly heard he hastily said to be discoursed on next sunday 
for nothing but this noise could be heard when they were passing. Mrs. Virginia Jones, 1856 I lived in St. Peter in 1856. The Sioux Indians were having a scalp dance at Traverse. Their yelling could be plainly heard in St. Peter. All of that town went over to see them dance. They had a pole decorated with several scalps. These were stretched on hoops and painted red inside. The Indians danced round and round this pole, jumping stiff-legged, screeching, and gesticulating, while the tom-toms were pounded by the squaws. I was frightened and wanted to leave, but could not, as I had been pushed near the front and the crowd was dense. Seeing my fear, the Indians seized me by the hands and drew me into their circle, making me dance round and round the pole. Some days later I started east to spend the summer with my mother. Distances were long in those days, as the trip was made by steamboat and stagecoach. I took one of the steamers which then ran regularly on the Minnesota River, sorrowfully parting from my husband, as I did not expect to see him again until fall. That anguish was all wasted, for we stuck on a sandbank just below town, and my husband came over in a boat, and lived on the steamer for nearly a week before we could get off the sandbar. Mrs. Georgiana M. Way, 1856 We moved to Minnesota from Iowa, came with a prairie schooner. The country was very wild. We settled on a farm five miles south of Blue Earth. We brought along a cow and a coop of chickens. The roads were awfully rough. We would milk the cow, put the milk in a can, and the jarring that milk got as those oxen drew that wagon over the rough roads gave us good butter the next day. Our first shack was not a dugout, but the next thing to it. It was a log shed with sloping roof one way. We had two windows of glass, so it did not feel so much like pioneers. The rattlesnakes were very thick. We used to watch them drink from the trough. They would lap the water with their tongues, just as a dog does. Many a one I have cut in two with the axe. They always ran, but I was slim in those days and could catch them. We used prairie tea, and it was good, too. It grew on a little bush. For coffee, we browned beets and cornmeal. Cornmeal coffee was fine. I'd like a cup this minute. Once a family near us by the name of Bone Trigger lived for four days on cottonwood buds, or wood browse, as it was called. We drove forty-five miles to Mankato to get our first baby clothes. When we got in our first crop of wheat, I used to stand in the door and watch it wave as the wind blew over it, and think I had never seen anything so beautiful. Even the howling of the wolves around our cabin did not keep us awake at night. We were too tired and too used to them. The years flew by. I had three children under five when my husband enlisted. I was willing, but oh, so sad. He had only three days to help us before joining his company. Our woodlot was near, so near I could hear the sound of his axe as he cut down all the wood he could and cut it into lengths for our winter fuel. You can imagine how the sound of that axe made me feel, although I was willing he should go. When he was gone, I used to put the children on the ox sled and bring a load of wood home. Pretty heavy work for a woman who had never seen an ox until she was married. I was brought up in New York City, but I did this work and didn't make any fuss about it either. I did all kinds of farm work in those days, for men's help wasn't to be had. They were all in the war. When I needed flour, there was no man to take the wheat to mill. The only one who could wanted to charge one dollar a day, and I did not have it. So I left my darlings with a neighbor, got him to hiss the sack aboard for me, for says I, I'm not dutchy enough to lift a sack of grain, and long before daylight I was beside those oxen on my way to the nearest grist mill, fifteen miles away, knitting all the way. It was tough work, but I got there. I engaged my lodging at the hotel, and then went to the mill. There were a number there, but they were all men. The miller, Mr. Goodnow, said, It's take turns here, but I won't have it said that a soldier's widow, as they called us, has to wait for men, 
so I'll grind yours first, and you can start for home at sun-up, so you can get home by dark. I want you to stay at our house to-night. After some demurring, for I wasn't no hand to stay where I couldn't pay, I accepted his most kind invitation. In the morning, when he saw me start, after he had loaded my sacks of flour on for me, he said, Get the man living this side of that big hill to put you down it. I said, I came up alone all right. He said, Woman, you had grain then. You could have saved it if it fell off and your sacks broke, but now you have flour. When my boy was three weeks old, I drove fourteen miles to a dance, and took in every dance all night, and wasn't sick afterward either. Of course, I took him along. When I came to sell my oxen after my husband died in the army, no one wanted to give me a fair price for them, because I was a woman. But Mr. S. T. McKnight, who had a small general store in Blue Earth, gave me what was right, and paid me two dollars and fifty cents for the yoke besides. We had company one Sunday, when we first came, and all we had to eat was a batch of biscuits. They all said they was mighty good, too, and they never had a better meal. We all raised our own tobacco. I remember once our probate judge came along and asked, Have you any stalks I can chew? It was hard to keep chickens for the country was so full of foxes. Seed potatoes brought four dollars a bushel. We used to grate corn when it was in the dough grade and make bread from that. It was fine. In 1856 and 1857, money was scarcer than teeth in a fly. We never saw a penny sometimes for a year at a time. Everything was trade. End of section 24 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 25 of Old Rail Fence Corners This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Duncan Kennedy, 1856. My father moved from Canada to Minnesota. He was urged to come by friends who had gone before, and wrote back that there was a wonderful piece of land on the lake. But when we got there with an ox team, after a two days trip from St. Paul, our goods on the lumber wagon, we thought it was a mud hole. We were used to the clear lakes of Canada, and this one was full of wild rice. It was near Nicolette Village. The road we took from St. Paul went through Shakopee, Henderson, and Le Sur. They said it was made on an old Indian trail. The turnips grew so enormous on our virgin soil that we could hardly believe they were turnips. They looked more like small pumpkins inverted in the ground. The wild flowers were wonderful, too. In the fall, prairies were gay with the yellow and sad with the lavender bloom the first party we went to was a housewarming we went about seven miles with the ox team i thought i would die laughing when i saw the girls go to their dressing room they went up a ladder on the outside there were two fiddlers and we danced all the old dances supper was served on a work bench from victuals out of a wash tub we didn't have hundred-dollar dresses, but we did have red cheeks from the fine clear air. One day, when I was alone at my father's, an Indian with feathers in his headband and a painted face and breast came quickly into the house, making no noise in his moccasined feet. He drew his hand across his throat rapidly, saying over and over, Tintanka, te tonka at the same time trying to drag me out. I was terrified as I thought he was going to cut my throat. Fortunately, my father happened to come in, and not fearing the Indian, whom he knew to be friendly, went with him and found his best ox up to his neck in a slough. 
It seemed Tatanka meant big animal, and he was trying to show us that a big animal was up to his neck in trouble. Afterward, I married Mr. Duncan Kennedy and moved to Traverse. I papered and painted the first house we owned there until it was perfect. I did so love this, our first home, but my husband was a natural wanderer. One day he came home announcing that he had sold our pretty home. We moved into a two-room log house on a section of land out near where my father lived. The house was built so that a corner stood in each quarter section and complied with the law that each owner of a quarter section should have a home on it. It was built by the four Hemingway brothers and was called Connecticut as they came from there. My husband worked for Mr. Sibley and was gone much of the time buying furs. Then he carried mail from Traverse to Fort Lincoln. Once in a blizzard he came in all frozen up, but he had outdistanced his Indian guide. You couldn't freeze him to stay. He was too much alive. He once traveled the seventy-five miles from Traverse to St. Paul in one day. He just took the Indian trot and kept it up until he got there. He always took it on his travels. He could talk Sioux French and English with equal facility. Mr. Cowan once said, when my husband passed, There goes the most accomplished man in the state. They used to tell this story about Mr. Cowan. He had cleared a man accused of theft. Afterward, he said to him, I have cleared you this time, but don't you ever do it again. When the outbreak came, my husband was storekeeper at Yellow Medicine. A half-breed came running and told him to fly for his life, as the Indians were killing all the whites. Mr. Kennedy could not believe this had come, though they knew how ugly the Indians were. After seeing the smoke from the burning houses, he got his young clerk, who had consumption, out, locked the door, threw the key in the river, then carried the clerk to the edge of the river and dropped him down the bank, where the bushes concealed him, and then followed him. The Indians came almost instantly, and pounded on the door he had just locked. He heard them say in Sioux, He has gone to the barn to harness the mules. While they hunted there, he fled for his life, keeping in the bushes and tall grass. All doubled up, as he was obliged to be, he carried the clerk until they came to the plundered warehouse, where a number of refugees were hiding. That night he started for the fort, arriving there while it was still dark. A call was made for a volunteer to go to St. Peter to acquaint them with the danger. My husband had a badly swollen ankle, which he got while crawling to the fort. Nevertheless, he was the first volunteer. Major Randall said, Take my horse. You can never get there without one. But Mr. Kennedy said, If the Indians hear the horse, they will know the difference between a shod horse and an Indian pony. I will go alone. Dr. Miller tried to make him take half the brandy there was in the fort, by saying grimly, If you get through, you will need it. If you don't, we won't need it. He started just before dawn, taking the Indian crawl. He had only gone a short distance, when the mutilated body of a white man interposed. This was so nauseating that he threw away the lunch he had been given as he left the fort, for he never expected to live to eat it. He passed so near an Indian camp that he was challenged, but he answered in Sioux in their gruff way, and so satisfied them. When he came near Nicolette village, he crawled up a little hill and peered over. He saw two Indians on one side and three on the other. He dropped back in the grass. He looked for his ammunition, and it was gone. He had only two rounds in his gun. He said, I thought if they have seen me there will be two dead Indians and one white man. When he came to what had been Nicolette Village, the campfires that the Indians had left were still burning. He reached St. Peter and gave the alarm. End of Section 25 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 26 of Old Rail Fence Corners. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Section 26 major s a buell eighteen fifty six major buell eighty seven years old whose memory is remarkable says i came to minnesota in eighteen fifty six settling in st peter and practicing law early in eighteen fifty six mr cowan one of the brightest lawyers and finest men minnesota has ever known came to traverse de sioux with his family to open a store he soon became a warm friend of Judge Flandrau, who urged him to study law with him. He was made county auditor, and in his spare time studied law and was admitted to the bar. He was much beloved by all, a sparkling talker, his word as good as his bond. He had never been well, and as time went on, gradually grew weaker. His house was a little more than a block from his office, but it soon became more than he could do to walk that distance. On the common, halfway between the two, was the liberty pole. He had had a seat made at this point and rested there. When he was no more, the eyes of his old friends would grow misty when they passed this hallowed spot. Soon after I made the acquaintance of Judge Flandrau at Traverse de Sioux, there was a young man visiting him from Washington. The judge took us both on our first prairie chicken hunt. We had no dog. On the upper prairie back of the town, going along a road, we disturbed an old prairie hen that attempted to draw us away from her young. The judge had admonished us that we must never kill on the ground, always on the wing, to be sportsmen. This hen scudded and skipped along a rod or two at a time. Finally, he said, Fellows, I can't stand this. I must shoot that chicken. You won't tell if I do. We pledged our word. He fired and missed. After we got home, we told everybody, for we said we had only promised not to tell if he shot it. We never enjoyed this joke half as much as he did. We always joked him about making tatting. Flandrau, dearest of men, true as steel, decided in character, but forgiving in heart, a warm friend, was one of the greatest men our state has ever known. He was a tall, dark man, and very active. He had often told me how he and Garvey, clerk for the Indian trader at Traverse de Sioux, used to walk the seventy-five miles to St. Paul in two days. He once walked one hundred and fifty miles in three days to the land office at Winona. In 1858 I built my own home in St. Peter and made my garden. The year before I had gone into a clump of plums when they were fruiting and tied white rags to the best. I had moved them into my garden, and they were doing fine. One day I took off my vest as I was working, and hung it on one of these trees. Suddenly my attention was attracted to the sky, and I never saw a more beautiful sight. A horde of grasshoppers were gently alighting, nothing more beautiful than the shimmering of the sun on their thousands of gold bronze wings could be imagined. They took everything, and then passed on, leaving gardens looking as if they had been burned. When I went for that vest, they had eaten it all but the seams. It was the funniest sight, just a skeleton, not a smitch of white rags left on the trees either. We people who lived in Minnesota thought there was only one kind of wild grape. A man by the name of Seeger, who had been in Russia, and was connected with a wine house in Moscow, came to St. Peter. In the Minnesota Valley were immense wild grape vines covering the tallest trees. Here he found five distinct varieties of grapes, and said one kind would make a fine red wine, Burgundy. He told me how to make this wine from grapes growing wild on my own farm. I made about ten gallons. When it was a year old, it was very heady. Edward Eagleston belonged to a debating society in St. Peter, and was on the successful side in a debate. Has love a language not articulate? He was a Methodist preacher here, but later had charge of a congregational church in Brooklyn, New York. 
he said when the methodists abolished itineracy and mission work he thought the most useful part of the church was gone in my boyhood days at home a little boy in the neighborhood had the misfortune to drink some lye fortunately the doctor was near and using a stomach pump saved his life for the time being however the child's stomach could retain nothing in a short time he was a skeleton indeed one day his father who carried him around constantly happened to be by the cow when she was being milked the child asked for some milk and was given it directly from the cow great was the father's astonishment when the little lad retained it milk given him two minutes after milking was at once ejected the father had a pen made just outside his son's bedroom window and the cow kept there and here many times a day the cow was milked and the milk instantly given after several months the child was restored to health one night in minnesota just as i was going to sit down to supper my wife told me that a man who had just passed told her that a child that lived ten miles back in the country had drank lye some days before and was expected to die as he could retain nothing without waiting to eat my supper i jumped on a horse and made the trip there in record speed this child followed the same formula and was saved it was easy for youngsters to get a lye for every house had the leech for the making of soap this lye was made by letting water drip over hardwood ashes in a barrel a cupful would be taken out and its strength tried if it would hold up an egg it was prime for soap it was clear as tea if it was left in a cup it was easily mistaken for it during the days when new ulm was expecting a second indian attack and the town was full of refugees i was ordered to destroy some buildings on the outskirts i started with a hotel and opened all the straw ticks that had been used for refugees beds and threw the contents all around i believed all the people had left but thought i would go in every room and make sure of this in one room i heard a queer noise and going to the bed found a small baby that had been tomahawked its little head was dented in two places i took it with me and went out its grandmother who owned the place came running frantically and took it from me its father and mother had been killed and it had been brought in by the refugees in the hasty departure it had been overlooked each one supposing the other had taken it on the twenty-fifth day of august after the massacre of the twenty-second around new ulm and in the vicinity a little boy who had saved himself from the indians by secreting himself in the grass of the swamps came into new ulm and said there were twelve people alive and a number of bodies to be buried sixteen miles from new ulm he said he had seen a man who was driving a horse and wagon shot and scalped but could not tell what had become of the woman and the baby that were riding with him the troops marched to the place having the boy as a guide buried a number of bodies and brought the twelve survivors to new ulm they could find no trace of the woman and baby although the father's body was found and buried later the troops marched to mankato stopping at an empty farmhouse sixteen miles from new ulm for the night this farmhouse was on a small prairie surrounded by higher land the sentries were ordered to watch the horizon with the greatest care for fear the skulking indians might ambush the troops it was a night when the rain fell spasmodically alternating with moonlight suddenly one of the sentries saw a figure on the horizon and watched it disappear in the grass then appear and crawl along a fence in his direction he called who goes there at the same time cocking his gun ready to shoot at the answer winnebago he fired at that moment there had been a little shower and his gun refused to fire later he found that the cap had become attached to the hammer and the powder must have been dampened by the shower he dashed for the figure to find a white woman and baby and was horrified to think that if the gun had fired she would have been blown to pieces this was woman for whom they had looked in the swamp thirty miles away he aroused the troops who took her in she held out her baby whose hand was partly shot away but said nothing about herself later they found that she had been shot through the back and the wound had had no dressing except when she lay down in the streams her greatest fear had been that the baby would cry but during all those eight awful days and nights while she lay hidden in the swamps or crawled on her way at night this baby had never made a sound 
as soon as it became warm and was thoroughly fed it cried incessantly for twelve hours the mother said that for three days the indians had pursued her with dogs but she had managed to evade them by criss-crossing through the streams she had said winnebago as she thought she was approaching a sioux camp and they were supposed to be friendly to the winnebagoes she would then have welcomed captivity as it seemed that the white people had left the earth and death was inevitable in may eighteen fifty seven eggs were selling in st peter for six cents a dozen butter at five cents per pound and full-grown chickens at seventy-five cents a dozen as game was so plentiful End of section twenty six. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section twenty seven of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Old Rail Fence Corners Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris Mrs. Jane Sutherland, 1856 Footnote A sister of Mrs. Duncan Kennedy End footnote Mrs. Cowan came to Traverse in 1856 when it was almost nothing. At her home in Baltimore, she had always had an afternoon at home, so decided to continue them here. She set aside Thursday and asked everyone in town, no matter what their situation in life, to come. My maiden name was Jane Donnelly, and she asked me to come and help pass things, assist as you call it now. She had tea and biscuits. Flour and tea were both scarce, so she warned me not to give anyone more than one biscuit or one cup of tea this we rigidly adhered to. She had the only piano in our part of the country, and we all took great pride in it. I could sing and play a little in the bosom of my family, but was most easily embarrassed. Judge Flandreau was our great man. He dropped in, bringing his tatting shuttle, and sat and made tatting as well as any woman. Mrs. Cowan explained that he had learned this on purpose to rest his mind and keep it off from weighty matters. Mrs. Cowan insisted that I should sing and play while he was there. I resisted as long as I could, then was led still protesting to the piano where I let out a little thin piping, all the while covered with confusion. When I arose, we both looked expectantly toward the judge, but he never raised his eyes, just kept right on tatting. Finally, Mrs. Cowan asked, Don't you like music, judge? He looked up with a faraway look in his eyes and said, Yes, martial music in the field. Then we knew he had never heard a thing, for as Mrs. Cowan explained to me as we were making a fresh pot of tea, he is the kindest man in the world. If he had noticed you were singing, he would have said something nice. Shortly after this, we took a claim out at Middle Lake and moved out there to live. The first time I came into town was on a load of wild hay drawn by my father's oxen. The man I later married saw me, a girl of sixteen, sitting there and said he fell in love with me then. A few days later he drove past our farm and saw me out in the cornfield trying to scare away the blackbirds. I was beating on a pan and whooping and hollering. That finished him, for he said he could see I had all the requisites for a good wife, industry and noise. During the outbreak of 1862, after my husband went to the war, we were repeatedly warned to leave our home and flee to safety. This we were loath to do as it would jeopardize our crops and livestock. We often saw the Indian scouts on a hill overlooking the place and sometimes heard shots. One day I was with my children at a neighbor's when a new alarm was given by a courier. Without waiting for us to get any clothes or tell my parents, the farmer hitched up and we fled to Fort Snelling. It was two months before I ever saw my home or parents. There were three grasshopper years when we never got any crops at Middle Lake. When I say that, I mean just what I say. We got nothing. The first time they came, the crops were looking wonderful. Wheat fields so green and corn way up. The new plowed fields yielded marvelously, and this was the first year for ours. 
I went out to the garden about 10 o'clock to get the vegetables for dinner and picked peas, string beans, onions, and lettuce that were simply luscious. The tomatoes were setting and everything was as fine as could be. I felt so proud of it. The men came home to dinner and the talk was all in praise of this new country and the crops. While we were talking, it gradually darkened. The men hastily went out to see if anything should be brought in before the storm. What a sight when we opened the door. The sky darkened by myriads of grasshoppers and no green thing could be seen. Everything in that lovely garden was gone. By the middle of the afternoon, when they left, the wheat fields looked as if they had been burned, even the roots eaten. Not a leaf on the trees. My husband's coat lying outside was riddled. Back of the house where they had flown against it, they were piled up four feet high. They went on after a while, leaving their eggs to hatch and ruin the crops the following year, and enough the second for the third, though we did everything. The last year, the county offered a bounty of three cents a bushel for them, and my little boy, four years old, caught enough with a net to buy himself a two-dollar pair of boots. You can perhaps get an idea how thick they were from that. The rail fences used to look as if they were enormous and bronzed. The grasshoppers absolutely covered them. We lived only a short distance from my father's farm. One afternoon I saw smoke coming from there and could hear explosions like that of cannon. I caught our pony, jumped on bareback, and dashed for their home. We trusted the Indians, and yet we did not. They were so different from the whites. I thought they had attacked the family. I don't know how I expected to help without a weapon of any kind, but on I went. When I got there, I saw my father and mother tearing a board fence down. A swamp on the place was a fire, and the fire coming through that long swamp grass very rapidly. The swamp had a number of large willows, and when the fire would reach them, they would explode with a noise like a cannon. I don't know why, but I have heard many of the old settlers tell of similar experiences. I jumped off the pony and helped tear down the fence. Governor Swift had paid me five dollars to make him a buffalo coat. I had put it all into nigger blue calico and had the dress on. When we went into the house, Mother said, What a shame you have spoiled your new dress. I could see nothing wrong, but in the back there was a hole over twelve inches square burned out. Another time, my husband was a short distance from the house putting up wild hay. We had several fine stacks of it near the house in the stubble. I happened to glance out and saw our neighbor's stacks burning and the fire coming through the stubble for ours. I grabbed a blanket, wet it soaking, and dragging that in a great pail of water made for the stacks. I run that wet blanket around the stacks as fast as I could several times. My husband came driving like mad with half a load of hay on the rack and grabbed me, but as the stubble was short, that sopping saved the stacks. We had a German hired man that we paid $30 a month for six months. Crops were plentiful and we hoped for a good price. No such good luck. Wheat was 25 cents a bushel and oats 12 and a half. He hauled grain to market with our ox team to pay himself and was nearly all winter getting his money. That was before the war. We boarded him for nothing while he was doing it. How little those who enjoy this state now think what has cost the makers of it. Mrs. Mary Robinson, 1856 We came to St. Anthony in 1856. Butter was 12 and a half cents a pound, potatoes 15 cents a bushel, and turnips 10 cents. I have never seen finer vegetables. We made our mince pies of potatoes soaked in vinegar instead of apples. One of our neighbors was noted for her molasses sponge cake. If asked for the recipe, she would give it as follows. I take some molasses and saleratus and flour and shortening and some milk. How much? Oh, a middling good-sized piece and enough milk to make it the right thickness to bake good. Needless to say, she continued to be the only molasses sponge cake maker. End of section 27. Recording by Andrea.
Section 28 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Margaret A. Snyder, 1856. Mr. Snyder and Mr. Pettit used to batch it in a cabin in Glencoe before our marriage. In 56, we decided to move to Glencoe and live in this place. We, together with Mr. Cook and Mr. McFarland, were 48 hours going the 60 miles. We stayed the first night at Carver and the next night got to 8 Mile Dutchman's. When we came to the cabin, we found the walls and ceiling covered with heavy cotton sheeting. My mother had woven me a Girton rag carpet, which we had with us. The stripes, instead of running across, ran lengthwise. There was a wide stripe of black and then many gaily colored stripes. When it was down on the floor, it made everything cheerful. We had bought some furniture, too, in Minneapolis, so everything looked homelike. Later, six of us neighbor women were invited into the country to spend the day. While we were gone, some of the neighbors said, The mosquitoes must be awful at the Snyders today. They have such a smudge. A little later, they saw the house was in flames. In this fire, we lost money and notes together with all our possessions. These notes were never paid, as we had no record, so we were left poor indeed. We were able to get boards for the sides of our new house, but lived in it six weeks without a roof, doors, or windows. We had a few boards over the bed. There was only one hard rain in all that time, but the mosquitoes were awful. During this time, we lived on King Philip's corn, a large yellow kind. We pounded it in a bag and made it into cakes and coffee. We had nothing to eat on the cakes nor in the coffee, and yet we were happy. My husband always kept his gun by the bed during this time. One morning we awoke to see two prairie chickens preening their feathers on the top of our house wall. Father fired and killed both, one falling inside and the other outside. Mrs. Colonel Stevens was our nearest neighbor. We just took a little Indian trail to her house. We had wild plums and little wild cherries with stems just like tame cherries on our farm. They helped out tremendously, as they with cranberries were our only fruit. One morning, twelve big braves came into my kitchen when I was getting breakfast. They said nothing to me, just talked and laughed among themselves, took out pipes and all smoked. They did not ask for anything to eat. Finally, they went away without trouble. Indian Charlie, afterwards hung at Mankato, was often at the house and became a great nuisance. He would follow me all over the house. I would say, go sit down, Charlie, at the same time looking at him determinedly. He would stand and look and then go. He once found my husband's gun and pointed it at me, but I said firmly, stamping my foot, Put it down, Charlie, and very reluctantly he finally did. Then I took it until he left. My husband enlisted, so in 1862 we moved to Fort Ridgely and lived in one room. One day three squaws, one of whom was Old Betts, came in to sell moccasins. I asked her to make some for my baby and showed her a piece of pork and some sugar I would give her for it. She brought them later. We had eaten that piece of pork, and I got another piece which was larger but not the same, of course. When she saw it as not the same, she said, Cheaty squaw, cheaty squaw, and was very angry. I then gave her the pork and two bowls of sugar instead of one, and she went away. Later I saw her in the next room where another family lived and said, Aunt Betts called me cheaty squaw, cheaty squaw. Quick as a flash, she drew a long, wicked-looking knife from her belt and ran for me, and it was only by fleeing and locking my own door that I escaped. She was never again allowed on the reservation. Later in the year, before the massacre, I went home to Pennsylvania. When we built on the corner of 4th Avenue and 10th Street, we could plainly hear the roar of St. Anthony Falls. I used to follow an Indian trail part of the way downtown. Mrs. Helen Horton, 1856, Minneapolis. When I came, things were pretty lonesome looking here. I found the young people just as gay as they could be anywhere, however. The first party I attended was a cotillion. 
I wore a black silk skirt, 18 feet around the bottom, with three flounces, over hoops too. A black velvet basque, pointed front and back, and cut very short on the sides, gave a great deal of style to the costume. My hair was brought low in front and puffed over horsehair cushions at the sides. It stuck out five inches from the sides of my head. We danced square dances mostly. We took ten regular dancing steps forward and ten back and floated along just like a thistle down, no clumping around like they do now. Just at this time I had a plaid silk too. It was green and brown broken plaid. The blocks were nine inches across. One evening we were to have a sociable. It was great fun playing games and singing. They wanted me to make a cake. It was in the spring months before the boats began to run and after the teams that brought supplies had stopped. It was always a scarce time. I wanted some white sugar to make a white cake as I knew a friend who was to make a pork and dried apple cake, a dark cake, so I wanted the opposite kind. We went everywhere but could find no sugar. I was so disappointed. Finally a friend took his horse and cutter and in one of the houses we were able to find a little. My cake was delicious. Did you ever make a pork apple pie? You cut the pork so thin you can almost see through it. Cover the bottom of a pie tin with it, then cut the apples up on top of this. Put two thin crusts, one on top of the other, over this. Then when cooked, turn upside down in a dish and serve with hard sauce. This recipe is over a hundred years old, but nothing can beat it. The first home we owned ourselves was at the corner of 9th Street and Nicollet Avenue. There was only one house in sight, that of Mr. Wells. Our whole house was built from the proceeds of land warrants that my husband had bought. My father had a store at the corner of Helen Street and Washington Avenue. To reach it from our home at 4th Street and 2nd Avenue North, we followed an Indian trail. There was generally a big cow with a bell to turn out for somewhere on it. Mrs. Mary Staring Smith, 1856 When we first came to live at Eden Prairie, I thought I had never seen anything so beautiful as that flowering prairie. In the morning we could hear the clear call of the prairie chickens. I used to love to hear it. There were great flocks of them and millions of passenger pigeons. Their call of Pidgey, Pidgey was very companionable on that lonely prairie. Sometimes when they were flying to roost, they would darken the sun there were such numbers of them. Geese and ducks were very numerous too. Blackbirds were so thick they were a menace to the growing crops. I used to shoot them when I was 12 years old. Once my father and uncle went deer hunting. They got into some poisonous wild thing, perhaps poison ivy. My uncle's face was awful and father nearly lost his sight. He was almost blind for seven years, but finally Dr. Daniels of St. Peter cured him. Once during wartime, we could get no one to help us harvest. I cut 100 acres strapped to the seat as I was too small to stay there any other way. We had a cow named Sarah, a lovely, gentle creature. Mr. Anderson brought her up on the boat. My dog was an imported English setter. These and an old pig were my only playmates. I used to love to dress my dog up, but when I found my old pig would let me tie my sunbonnet on her, I much preferred her. She looked so comical with that bonnet on lying out at full length and grunting little comfortable grunts when I would scratch her with a stick. I never saw such a sad expression in the eye of any human being as I saw in other days, the Sioux friend of the whites. It seemed as if he could look ahead and see what was to be the fate of his people. Yes, I have seen that expression once since. After the massacre, when the Indians were brought to Fort Snelling, I saw a young squaw, a beauty, standing in the door of her teepee with just that same look. It used to bring the tears to my eyes to think of her. There used to be a stone very sacred to the Indians on Alexander Gould's place near us. It was red sandstone and set down in a hollow that they had dug out. The Sioux owned it and never passed on the trail that led by it without squatting in a circle facing it, smoking their pipes. I have often stood near and watched them. I never heard them say a word. They always left tobacco, beads, and pipes on it. The Indian trails could be seen worn deep like cattle paths. At the time of the Indian outbreak, the refugees came all day long on their way to the fort. 
such a sad procession of hopeless, terrified women and children. Many were wounded and had seen their dear ones slain as they fled to the cornfields or tall grass of the prairies. I can never forget the expression of some of those poor creatures. End of section 28. Recording by Andrea. Section 29 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth wilder morris mrs mary massault 1856 i first lived at taylor's falls i was only fourteen and spoke little english as i had just come from france large bands of indians used to camp near us they never molested anything i took a great fancy to them and used to spend hours in their camps they were always so kind and tried so hard to please me. When the braves were dressed up, they always painted their faces, and the more they were dressed, the more hideous they made themselves. I would often stick feathers in their headbands, which pleased them very much. The storms were so terrible, we had never seen anything like them. One crash after another, and the lightning constant. Once I was sitting by a little stove, when the lightning came down the chimney. It knocked me one way off the bench, and moved the stove several feet without turning it over. Mrs. Anna Todd, 1856 We came to St. Anthony in 56, and lived in one of the Hudson Bay houses on University Avenue, between 4th and 5th Streets. They were in a very bad state of repair, and had no well or any conveniences of any kind. The chimneys would not draw, and that in the kitchen was so bad that Mr. Todd took out a pane of glass and ran the stovepipe through that. Everybody had a water barrel by the fence, which was filled with river water by contract, and in the winter they used melted snow and ice. Mr. Todd built the first piers for the booms in the river. The hauling was all done by a team on the ice. The contract called for the completion of these piers by April 15th. The work took much more time than they had figured on, and Mr. Todd realized if the ice did not hold until the last day allowed, he was a ruined man. There were many anxious days in the little fur house, as it was called, but the ice held, and the money for the contract was at once forthcoming. I remember those winters as much colder and longer than they now are. They began in October, and lasted until May. When we were coming from St. Paul to St. Anthony, just as we came to the highest point, I looked all around and said, This is the most beautiful country I have ever seen. When Mrs. Richard Shute lived in Minneapolis, the view was wonderfully beautiful. Near there was a house with the front door on the back side, so that the view could be seen better. Times were very, very hard, in 57 and 58. We never saw any money, and to our Yankee minds, this was the worst part of our new life. A friend had been staying with us for months, sharing what we had. One day he said to my husband, I'm here and I'm stranded. I can see no way to pay you anything, but I can give you an old mare, which I have up in the country. He finally induced Mr. Todd to take her, and almost immediately we had a chance to swap her for an Indian pony. A short time after, there was a call for ponies at the fort, and the pony was sold to the government for fifty dollars in gold. This seemed like one thousand dollars would now. The first time I saw an apple in Minnesota was in fifty-eight. A big spaniel had come to us, probably lost by some party of home seekers. After having him a short time, we became very tired of him. One of the teamsters was going to St. Paul, so we told him to take the dog and loose him. Better than that, 
he swapped him for a barrel of apples with a man who had brought them up the river as a speculation the new owner was to take the dog back down the river that day but that dog was back almost as soon as the teamster was we used to joke and say we lived on that dog all winter the early settlers brought slips of all kinds of house plants which they shared with all the windows were gay with fuchsias geraniums roses etc most everyone had a heliotrope too all started slips under an inverted tumbler to be ready for newcomers mr edwin clark eighteen fifty six on april twelfth eighteen sixty five president abraham lincoln two days prior to his assassination signed my commission as united states indian agent for the chippewas of the mississippi pillager and lake and winnebagosish bands and the indians of red lake and pembina the mississippi bands numbering about two thousand five hundred were principally located around mill lac gull and sandy lakes the pillager and winnebagosish bands about two thousand around leech winnebagosish cass and otter tail lakes the red lake bands numbering about fifteen hundred were located about red lake and the pembina bands about one thousand at pembina and turtle mountain dakota at that time there were no white settlers in minnesota north of crow wing long prairie and otter tail lake the chippewa indians were not migratory in their habits living in their birch bark covered wigwams around the lakes from which the fish and wild rice furnished a goodly portion of their sustenance and where they were convenient to wood and water the hunting grounds hundreds of miles in extent covering nearly one half of the state furnished moose deer and bear meat and the woods were full of rabbits partridges ducks wild geese and other small game the indians exchanged the furs gathered each year amounting to many thousand dollars in value with traders for traps guns clothing and other goods some of the indians raised good crops of corn and vegetables and they also made several thousand pounds of maple sugar annually they also gathered large amounts of cranberries blueberries and other wild fruit the chippewa indians had very few ponies having no use for them as it was more convenient to use their birch bark canoes in traveling about the lakes and rivers at that time the chippewas were capable of making good living without the government annuities which consisted of a cash payment to each man woman and child of from five dollars to ten dollars and about an equal amount in value of flour pork tobacco blankets shawls linsey woolsey flannels calico gilling twine for fish nets thread etc an indian in full dress wore leggings moccasins and shirt all made by the women from tanned deer skins and trimmed with beads over which he threw his blanket and with his gun over his arm and his long hair braided and hanging down and face streaked with paint he presented quite an imposing appearance the young men occasionally supplemented the above with a neat black frock coat the indians during the time i was agent were friendly and it was only upon a few occasions when whiskey had been smuggled in by some unprincipled persons that they had any quarrels among themselves the late bishops whipple and knickerbocker were my travelling companions at different times through the indian country as were general mitchell of st cloud daniel sinclair of winona rev f a noble of minneapolis rev stewart of sauk center mr ferris of philadelphia mr bartling of louisville doctors bernard and kennedy and others the late enigabo rev john johnson was appointed by me as farmer at mill lac upon the request of shalboshkung the head chief madosago on wind was head chief of the red lake indians and hole in the day head chief of the mississippi bands at the time i was agent captain isaac moulton eighteen fifty seven minneapolis the middle of december eighteen fifty seven it began to rain and rained for three days as if the heavens had opened the river was frozen and the sleighing had been fine 
After this rain, there was a foot of water on the ice. I was on my way to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, to get insurance on my store that had burned. You can imagine what the roads leading from St. Paul to Hastings were. It took us a whole day to make that twenty-mile trip, four stage loads of us. I have often thought you dwellers in the Twin Cities nowadays give little thought to the days when the stagecoach was the essence of elegance and travel. The four or six horses would start off with a flourish. The music of the horn I have always thought most stirring. The two rival companies vied with each other in stage effect. If one driver had an especial flourish, the other tried to surpass him, and so it went on. No automobile, no matter how high-powered, can hold a candle to those stagecoaches in picturesque effect, for those horses were alive. On this trip I hired a man with two yearling steers to take my trunk full of papers from the Zumbro River that we had crossed in a skiff, as the bridge was out, to Minieski, where we could again take the stage. Those steers ran, and so did we eight men who were following them in water up to our knees. We reached Minieski about as fagged as any men could be. End of section twenty nine. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section thirty of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Section 30. Mr. George A. Brackett, 1857, Minneapolis. Prior to the Indian outbreak, I had charge of the feeding of the troops, comprising Stone's division at Poolville, Maryland, with beef and other supplies. In this division were the 1st Minnesota, several New York, including the celebrated Tammany regulars, and Pennsylvania troops. I continued in that service until the Sioux outbreak, when Franklin Steele and myself were requested by General Sibley to go to Fort Ridgely and aid in the commissary department general sibley being a brother-in-law of franklin steele i remained in this position until the close of the sibley campaign other st paul and minneapolis men being interested with me in the furnishing of supplies just after the battle of birch coolie when general sibley had assembled at fort ridgely a large force to go up the minnesota river against the indians he sent franklin steele and myself to st peter to gather up supplies for his command we started in a spring wagon with two good horses a number of refugees from the fort went with us in burbank stages and other conveyances at that time burbank was running a line of stages from st paul to fort ridgely stopping at intervening points allen the manager of the lines was in fort ridgely a few miles out the cry was raised the indians are in sight Immediately the whole party halted. Allen went over the bluff far enough to see down to the bottoms of the river. Soon he returned very much frightened, saying, The valley is full of Indians. This caused such a fright that notwithstanding our protest, the whole party returned pell-mell to Fort Ridgely, except Steele and myself. The party was so panic-stricken that Allen was nearly left. He had to jump on behind. We determined to go on. A mile or so further on, we saw a man crawling through the grass. I said to Steele, There's your Indian, and drove up to him. It proved to be a German who, in broken English, said, The Indians have stolen my cattle, and I am hunting for them. Driving a few miles further, we came to what had been Lafayette, burned by the Indians days before. Some of the houses were still smoking. We stopped at the ruins of a house belonging to a half-breed, Mrs. Bush, and killed and ate two chickens with our lunch. When the refugees got back to the fort, they reported to General Sibley that we had gone on. He said we were reckless and sent George McLeod, captain of the Mounted Rangers, with fifty men to overtake us and bring us back. 
However, we drove on so fast that MacLeod got to St. Peter about the time we did. There he bought out a bakery and set them to baking hardtack and purchased cattle and made other arrangements for the feeding of the troops. One day before this, while I was at General Sibley's camp talking to him, I saw someone coming toward the camp. I called General Sibley's attention to it, and he sent an officer to investigate. It proved to be a friendly Indian who had stolen a widow and her children from the hostiles and brought them to the fort. Her husband had been killed by the Indians. Mrs. C. A. Smith, 1858 in the spring of 1858 we came to st paul we took a boat which plied regularly between st paul and minnesota river points to chaska there we left the boat and walked to watertown where our new home was to be my father carried two thousand dollars in gold in inside pockets of a knitted jacket which my mother had made him with this money we paid for two quarter sections of improved land and the whole family began to farm we lived just as we had in Sweden, as we were in a Swedish settlement. We were Lutheran, so there were no parties. Going to church was our only amusement. The prairies were perfectly lovely, with their wild flower setting. There had been a fire two years before, and great thickets of blackberry vines had grown up. I never saw such blackberries. They were as large as the first joint of a man's thumb. The flavor was wild and spicy. I never ate anything so good. Cranberries by the hundreds of bushels grew in the swamps. We could not begin to pick all the hazelnuts. We used to eat turnips as we would an apple. They were so sweet they were as good. We made sundials on a clear spot of ground and could tell time perfectly from them. We children made dolls out of grass and flowers. I have never seen prettier ones. We kept sheep, and mother spun and wove blankets and sheets. We had bolts and bolts of cloth that we made and brought with us from Sweden. Here we raised flax and prepared it for spinning, making our own towels. Nothing could be cosier than our cabin Christmas Eve. We had brought solid silver knives, forks, and spoons. These hung from racks. Quantities of copper and brass utensils burnished until they were like mirrors hung in rows. In Sweden, mother had woven curtains and bed coverings of red, white, and blue linen, and these were always used on holidays. How glad we were! They were the national colors here. We covered a hoop with gay colored paper and set little wooden candle holders that my father had made all around it. This was suspended from the ceiling all aglow with dips. Then, as a last touch to the decorations, we filled our brass candlesticks with real candles and set them in the windows as a greeting to those living across the lake. A sheaf for the birds, and all was done. The vegetables grew tremendous. We used to take turns in shelling corn and grinding it for bread in a coffee mill. Mother would say, if you are hungry and want something to eat, of course you will grind. We made maple sugar and fine granulated sugar from that. My sisters used to walk from Watertown to Minneapolis in one day, 37 miles, following an Indian trail, and then were ready for a good time in the evening. How many girls of today could walk that many blocks? The lake was full of the biggest fish imaginable. We used to catch them and dry and smoke them. They made a nice variety in our somewhat same diet. We used to fish through the ice, too. Major C. B. Heffelfinger, 1858, Minneapolis Well, I remember the St. Charles Hotel as it was when I first boarded there. The beds were upstairs in one room in two rows. Stages were bringing loads of passengers to Minneapolis. They could find no accommodations, so no unoccupied bed was safe for its owners. Although my roommate and I were supposed to have lodging and were paying for it, the only safe way was for one to go to bed early before the stage came in and repel all invaders until the other arrived. If the sentry slept at his post, the returning scout was often obliged to sleep on the floor or snuggle comfortably against a stranger sandwiched between them. The strangers who arrived 
had made a stagecoach journey from La Crosse without change and spent two nights sitting erect in the coaches and were so tired that they went to bed with the chickens. On lucky nights for us, they were detained by some accident and got in when the chickens were rising. Nothing was ever stolen, and many firm friendships were thus cemented. Our pocketbooks were light, but our hearts were also. It was a combination hard to beat. 1857 was the most stringent year in money that Minnesota has ever known. There was absolutely no money, and every store in the territory failed. Everything was paid by order. Captain Isaac Moulton, now of La Crosse, had a dry goods store. A woman, a stranger, came in and asked the price of a shawl. She was told it was fifteen dollars. It was done up for her. She had been hunting through her reticule and now put down the money in gold. The captain looked at it as if hypnotized, but managed to stammer. My God, woman, I thought you had an order. It is only five dollars in money. Mrs. Martha Gilpatrick, 1858, Minneapolis. When I married, my husband had been batching it. In the winter, his diet was pork, pork, pork. Mrs. Birmingham, who helped him sometimes, said she bet if all the hogs he ate were stood end to end, they would reach to Fort Snelling. We had a flock of wild geese that we crossed with tame ones. They were the cutest, most knowing things. I kept them at the house until they were able to care for themselves. Then I turned them out mornings. I would go in the pasture and say, Is that you, nice gooses? They would act so human, be so tickled to see me, and flop against me and squawk. When Mr. Fitzgerald came home, they would run for him the same way as soon as they saw the horse. They were handsome birds. I used to go to my sister's, she had a boarding house on the east side her boarders were mill workers and lathers that is what we used to call the river drivers they always had a pike pole in their hand it looked like a lathe from a distance so they got the name of lathers from this end of section 30section 31 of old rail fence corners this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Margaret Hearn, 1858. My husband enlisted in the fall of 1861. It was not a very easy thing for him to do, for our farm was not yet very productive, our three children were very young, one a tiny baby, and we had no ready money. However, he felt that his country called him, and when the recruiting officer told him that all soldiers' families would be welcome at the post, and that we could go there with him, he rented our farm to George Wells and went on to Fort Ridgely. We lived forty miles from there on the Crow River, near Hutchinson. We found that the officer had lied. We were not expected or wanted at the fort. We finally made arrangements to stay by promising to board the blacksmith in his quarters. His name was John Resoft. His rations and my husband supported us all. Mr. Hearn was very handy about the house, as he was a Maine Yankee, and daily helped me with the work. There was a great sameness about the life, as there were only about a hundred men stationed at the fort. Very few of them had their families with them. The only women were Mrs. Mueller, wife of the doctor, Mrs. Sweet, wife of the chaplain and their three children, Mrs. Edison, the captain's wife, Sergeant Jones's wife and three children, Mrs. Dunn and their three children, Mrs. Snyder and three children, Mrs. Mickle and three children, Mrs. Randall, the sutler's wife, and myself and our three children. The winter passed monotonously. We used to have some fun with the squaws. Once I was writing home to mother. I wanted a little lock of Indian hair to show her how coarse an Indian's hair was. Old Betts happened to come in just then, so I took my scissors and was going to cut a little bit of her raving locks. When she saw what I was going to do, she jumped away screaming and acting like a crazy woman. She never came near that house again, but in the spring, after my husband had gone to the front and Mrs. Dunn and I joined forces and gone to living in another cabin, she stuck her head in our window to beg. I jumped and grabbed a looking-glass and held it before her to let her see how she really did look. She was a sight. She had an old black silk hood I had given her, and her hair was straggling all over. When she saw the reflection, she was so mad she tried to break the glass. 
Three weeks before the outbreak, the Sioux, our Indians, had a war dance back of the fort and claimed it was against the Chippewas. At first we believed them, but when the half-breed Indian Charlie came in to borrow cooking utensils, he sat down and hung his head, as if under the influence of liquor. He kept saying, Too bad, too bad. Mrs. Dunn became suspicious, and knowing I knew him well, as he had often stopped at our cabin, said, Ask him what is too bad. He said, Injuns kill white folks, me like white folks, me like Injuns, me have to fight, me don't want to. He seemed to feel broken-hearted. I did not believe him and thought him drunk, but Mrs. Dunn said, You go over and tell Sergeant Jones what he said. I did. Sergeant Jones said, What nonsense! They are only going to have their war dance. All of you white people go over and see that dance. We all went. The soldiers were all there. The Indians had two tom-toms, and the squaws beat on them while the Indians, all painted hideously, jumped stiff-legged, cut themselves until they were covered with blood and sweat, and yowled their hideous war-hoop. They were naked excepting their breech-clout. Sergeant Jones had control of all the guns at the fort, and unknown to us, the cannon were all trained on the dancers. We could not understand why the soldiers were so near us, but later in the day learned that there was a soldier for every one of us to snatch away if it was necessary to fire on the Indians. On Monday morning, August 18, 1862, at about ten o'clock, we saw a great cloud of dust arising. Soon it resolved itself into teams, people on horseback and on foot, coming pell-mell for the fort. They said that Redwood Agency, twelve miles distance, had been attacked, and the Indians were killing all the white settlers. As they were flying for their lives, they passed the settler of the Redwood store lying face downwards with a board on his back, on which was written, Feed your own squaws and papooses grass. He had trusted the Indians until he could do so no longer. Their annuities were long, long overdue, and they were starving. They appealed to him again and again, and pleaded for food for their starving families. He finally told them to go eat grass. The settlers had seen the consequence. They had passed seven dead besides on the way. This was only the beginning of a sad multitude of refugees who, wounded in every conceivable way and nearly dead from terror, poured into the fort. Captain Marsh, as soon as he had heard the stories, called the soldiers out on the parade ground and called for volunteers who would go with him to try and stop the awful carnage. Every soldier came forward. Captain Marsh told them that he thought the sight of the soldiers would cow them, as it had so many times before. They at once departed, leaving about thirty men with us. We knew nothing of what was happening to this little handful of soldiers, but as more and more refugees came in, with the terribly mutilated, our fears increased. We knew a small group of the savages could finish us. Just at dusk, Jim Dunn, a soldier of nineteen who always helped us about our work, came reeling in, caked with blood and sweat. I said, For God's sake, what is the news, Jim? He only panted, Give me something to eat quick. After he had swallowed a few mouthfuls, he told us that nearly all of the boys had been killed by the Indians. He said, The devil's got us in the marsh by the river. Quinn told the captain not to go down there, but he held his sword above his head and said, All but cowards will follow me. The Indians on the other side of the river were challenging us to come by throwing up their blankets away above their heads. Only three more of the boys came in that night. All of us who were living outside had gone into the stone barracks with the refugees. That night we were all sitting huddled together, trembling with fear. We had helped feed the hungry and cared for the wounded all day long, and now were so fatigued we could hardly keep awake. I had brought my little kerosene lamp with me. I lit it and brought out of the darkness the sorrowful groups of women and children. Someone called, Lights out! I turned mine down and set it beside the door. We sat in darkness. A voice called, Upstairs! I gathered my baby in my arms, told Walter to hold on to Mother's dress on one side and Minnie on the other, and upstairs we went, all pushed from behind so we could not stop. We were pushed into a large room, dark as pitch. There we all stood panting through fear and exertion. How long, I do not know. A voice in the room kept calling, Oda, Oda, meaning many, many. We knew there were Indians with us, but not how many. I had the butcher knife sharpened when the first refugees came and covered with a piece of an old rubber. It was now sticking in my belt. I asked Mrs. Dunn what she had to protect herself with. She said she had nothing, but found her shears in her pocket. I told her to put out their eyes with them while they were killing us, for we expected death every minute after hearing those Indian voices. I heard Jim Dunn's voice and called him, and told him where my lamp was, and asked him to bring it up. He brought it to me. This was the crucial moment of my life. I sat the lamp on the floor, and with one hand on the butcher knife, slowly turned up the light. I saw only three squaws and three half-breed boys, instead of the large number of Indians I expected. Each declared, Me good Injun, me good Injun. All was confusion. William Holly was inside guard at the door of the room we were in upstairs. He was just out of the hospital and was very weak. 
in spite of this he had gone with the soldiers to redwood and had just returned after crawling out from under his dead companions and creeping through the brush and long grass those dreadful miles he was all in his gun had a fixed bayonet my eyes never left those squaws for a moment i was sure they were spies who would go to the devils outside and tell them of the weakness of the fort two of the squaws began to fight about a fine-tooth comb the more formidable of the two with much vituperation declared she would not stay where the other one was just at the height of the fight a gun outside was fired the minute it was fired the squaw started for the door i suspected that it was a signal for her to come outside and tell what she knew holly had left his post and come in among us our babies were on a field bed on the floor calling to mrs dunn to look after them i sprang to the door and grabbed the discarded gun at that moment the squaw tried to pass i ordered her back she called me a sichi do squaw meaning mean squaw and tried to push me back i raised the bayonet saying go back or i'll ram this through you she went back growling and swearing in sioux probably in half an hour i was relieved of my self-appointed task martin tanner taking my place i said to him don't let that squaw get away i sat down on a board over some chairs and made the squaw sit beside me there we all sat that long night with my right hand hold of my knife and the other holding her blue petticoat didn't she talk to me and revile me none of the others even tried to leave at last we saw the dawn appear have you ever been in great danger where all was darkness where that danger was if so you will know what an everlasting blessing that daylight was from our upper windows we could look out and see that our foes were not yet in sight all night long among the refugees praying supplicating and wailing for the dead was constant but as the light came and we began to bestir ourselves among them nursing the wounded and feeding the hungry this ceased and only the crying of the hungry children was heard the indians had driven away all the stock so there was no milk my baby had just been weaned all those ten days we stayed in the fort i fed her hardtack and bacon that was all we had i chewed this for her there were many nursing mothers but all were sustaining more than their own there was no well or spring near the fort all water had to be brought from the ravine by mule team early that morning under an escort with the cannon trained on them the men drove the mule teams again and again for water busy as all the women who lived at the fort were i never let that squaw out of my sight i kept hold of a lock of her hair whenever i walked around she swore volubly but came along about ten o'clock in the morning lieutenant jeer a boy of nineteen who was left in command when the senior officers were killed called on me on a hill to the northwest a great body of indians were assembled he wanted me to look through the field piece and see if little crow was the leader i knew him at once among the cavorting throng of challenging devils i knew too whose captive i would be if the fort fell for he had offered to buy me from my husband for three ponies he loved to hear me sing mr gideon pond had tried to teach him to sing we watched them breathlessly as they sat in council knowing that if they came then we were lost the council was long but finally after giving the blood-curdling war-hoop they rode away they were hardly out of sight before the soldiers who had been with us and had just left for fort ripley before the outbreak filed in captain marsh had sent for them just before leaving the fort for redwood those noble fellows nearly exhausted from the long march with no sleep for thirty hours immediately took their place with the defenders without rest or sleep the night before jeer had sent to st peter for the renville rangers and some of our own men they came in the evening the prayers of thanksgiving that could be heard in many tongues from that mournful group of refugees as they knew of the soldiers return could never be forgotten mrs dunn and i had asked for guns to help fight but there were none for us there was little ammunition too the blacksmith john resoft made slugs by cutting iron rods into pieces mrs mueller mrs dunn and i worked a large share of that day making cartridges of these or balls we would take a piece of paper give it a twist drop in some powder in one of these or a ball and give it another twist the soldiers could fire twice as fast with these as when they loaded themselves all the women helped my squaw was still with me the others made no effort to escape just as night came she broke away and when she really started she could run off with me as she was big and i only weighed one hundred and three pounds when i found i could not stop her i screamed to sergeant mcgrew this squaw is going to get away and i can't stop her he turned his gun on her and shouted if you don't go back i'll blow you to that night i had to sleep and she got away with a hundred and sixty soldiers in the fort all were so reassured that we all slept that night the next morning was a repetition of tuesday the care of the wounded under that great man dr mueller and his devoted wife was our work one woman who was my especial care had been in bed with a three days old baby when the smoke from the burning homes of neighbors was seen and they knew the time to fly had come a wagon with a small amount of hay on it stood near the door with part of a stack of hay by it 
her husband and the hired man placed her and the baby on this and covered them with as much hay as they could get on before the savages came then mounted the horses and started to ride away they were at once shot by the indians who then began to search for her they ran a pitchfork into the hay over and over again wounding the woman in many places and hurting the child so that it died they then set fire to the hay and went on to continue their devilish work elsewhere she crawled out of the hay more dead than alive and made her way to the fort besides the pitchfork holes which were in her legs and back her hair and eyebrows were gone and she was dreadfully burned none of the women seemed to think of their wounds they lamented their dead and lost but as far as they themselves were concerned were thankful they were not captives the suffering of these women stirred me to the depths one poor german woman had had a large family of children they all scattered at the approach of the indians she thought they were all killed she would sit looking into space calling mein schilder mein schilder enough to break your heart i thought she had gone crazy when i saw her look up at the sound of a child's voice then begin to climb on the table calling mein schilder mein schilder in a group on the other side she had seen four of her children that had escaped and just reached the fort that wednesday morning early in the afternoon the long-expected fighting began we were all sent upstairs to stay and obliged to sit on the floor or lie prone all the windows were shot in and the glass and spent bullets fell all around us i picked up a wash basin heaping full of these and mrs dunn as many more by evening the savages retired giving their awful war hoops thursday there was very little fighting as the rain wet the indians powder mrs dunn mrs sweet and i spent the time making cartridges in the powder room in our stocking feet we also melted the spent bullets from the day before and ran them in molds these helped out the supply of ammunition amazingly friday was the terrific battle a short distance from the fort was a large mule barn the indians swarmed in there sergeant jones understood their method of warfare so trained cannon loaded with shell on the barn at a signal these were discharged blowing up the barn and setting the hay on fire the air was full of legs arms and bodies which fell back into the flames we were not allowed to look out but i stood at the window all the time and saw this later i saw vast numbers of the indians with grass and flowers bound on their heads creeping like snakes up to the fort under cover of the cannon smoke i gave the alarm and the guns blew them in all directions there was no further actual fighting though eternal vigilance was the watchword it was those hundred and sixty men who saved even minneapolis and st paul and all the towns between if fort ridgely had fallen the sioux warriors would have come right through general sibley did not get there with reinforcements until the next thursday after the last battle you can imagine the sanitary condition of all those people cooped up in that little fort no words i know could describe it note mrs hearn has a medal from the government for saving the fort End of section 31. Recording by Denise Nordell, Modesto, California. Section 32 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Mary Ingenhut, 1858, Minneapolis. Mrs. Ingenhut, now 100 years old, for 90 years has made apple kuchen, fist trees, and wine as follows. Apple kuchen, mix a rich dough using plenty of butter and rich milk. Line a pan with this. Cut in squares and cover with apples sprinkled thick with sugar and cinnamon. Bake until apples are thoroughly cooked. Fist cheese. Take a pan of clabbered milk. Set over a slow fire. When the whey comes to the top, strain off and shape in balls. Let stand in warm place until it is ripe. That is, until it is strong. Wine. Grape, currant, rhubarb and gooseberry wine mash home-grown fruit with a home-made potato masher squeeze it through a coarse cloth add sugar and place in warm spot to ferment draw off in kegs and allow to stand at least two years i used to love to go to the picnics in the early days everyone had such a good time and was trying to have everyone else have them too then all were equal nowadays each one is trying to be prouder than the next one 
Captain L. L. McCormack. Georgetown on the Red River was the Hudson Bay post. After the railroad was built to St. Cloud, the Red River carts crossed there on a ferry and then on the Dakota side went from point to point on the river in the timber to camp. The river is very crooked. A day's journey with one of these carts was 12 miles. The first stop was at Elk River, now Dalrymple, then to Goose River, the present site of Caledonia, and then to Frog Point, and from there to what is now Grand Forks. The freight was teamed to and from St. Cloud and Benson. Mr. Charles M. Loring, 1860. On the 20th day of September, 1860, I reached Minneapolis with my wife and little son and went to the Nicolette Hotel, where I made arrangements for board for the winter. The hotel was kept by Eustace and Hill. They fixed the price at six dollars a week, including fire and laundry for the family, i.e. two dollars a week for each person. Mr. Lauren Fletcher occupied the rooms adjoining and paid the same price that I paid, notwithstanding there were but two in his family, but his rooms were considered to be more favorably located being on the corner of hennepin and washington avenues the cook at the hotel was a mrs tibbets from new england who was an expert in preparing the famous dishes of that section of our country and in the many years that have elapsed since that time i have never been in a hotel where cooking was so appetizing our first winter in minnesota was passed in the most delightful and pleasant manner the following spring i rented the house on the corner of what is now third avenue and sixth street for the sum of six dollars a month this house is still standing and is a comfortable two-story new england house at that time it stood alone on the prairie with not more than three or four houses south of it one of these is still standing at the corner of tenth street and park avenue and is occupied as a keely cure there were few luxuries in the market but everything that could be purchased was good and cheap there was but one meat shop which was kept by a mr hoblet he kept his place open in the forenoon only as his afternoons were spent in driving over the country in search of a fat critter the best steaks and roasts were eight cents a pound and chickens four to six cents a pound eggs we bought at six cents a dozen and butter at eight to ten cents a pound in winter we purchased a hind quarter of beef at three and four cents a pound chickens three cents and occasionally pork could be bought at six cents a pound but this was rarely in market mutton was never seen prairie chickens partridges ducks and venison was very plentiful in the season and very cheap we used to purchase these in quantities after cold weather came, freeze them, and pack them in snow. This worked well, provided we had no January thaw, and then we lost our supplies. The only fruit we had for winter use was dried apples, wild plums, wild crab apples, and cranberries. In the season, we had wild berries, which were very plentiful. There was a cranberry marsh, a half mile west of Lake Calhoun, on what is now Lake Street, where we used to go to gather berries. One day a party of four drove to the marsh, and just as we were about to alight, we saw that a large buck had taken possession of our field. We did not dispute his claim, but silently stole away. That same autumn, a bear entered the garden of W. D. Washburn, who lived on Fifth Street and Eighth Avenue and ate all of his sweet corn about this time the settlers on lake minnetonka were clearing their claims in the big woods burning most of the timber but some of the hard maple was cut as cordwood and hauled to minneapolis and sold for from two dollars to two dollars fifty a cord the winters were cold but clear and bright the few neighbors were hospitable and kind and I doubt if there has been a time in the history of Minneapolis when its citizens were happier than they were in the pioneer days of the early 60s. There were few public entertainments, but
but they enjoyed gathering at the houses of their neighbours for a game of euchre and occasionally for a dance in woodman's hall which was situated at the corner of helen street now second avenue and washington avenue one violinist furnished the music sleighing horse racing on the river and skating were the out-of-doors amusements for the winter a favorite place for skating was in a lot situated on nicolet avenue between fourth and fifth streets nicolet avenue had been raised above the grade of this lot causing a depression which filled with water in the fall there was a small white house in the centre of the lot and the skaters went around and around it and no skating park was more greatly enjoyed at the time the war broke out the town began to show signs of recovering from the effects of the panic of eighteen fifty seven and its wonderfully beautiful surroundings attracted new settlers and the foundation of the great commercial city was laid dr stewart of stork centre i was government physician for many years and so was back and forth all the time i used to meet old man bergeneck an old german who carried supplies for the government he always walked and knit stockings all the way this was very common among the german settlers the government paid such an enormous price for its freighting that one could almost pay for an outfit for supplies in one trip bergeneck became very wealthy i often passed the night near the bivouac of the red river drivers they knew me and were very glad to have me near i never saw a more rugged race they always had money even in the panic times of fifty seven if i treated them for any little ailment i could have my choice of money or furs the mosquitoes did not seem to bother them though they would drive a white man nearly crazy i started for fort wadsworth a four company post in january sixty eight the winters always severe had been doubly so in sixty seven and sixty eight I went by team, leaving Sork Centre, with the mercury at 40 below zero. It never got above 45 below in the morning, while we were on the trip. The snow was three feet on a level, and we broke the roads. It took us 12 days to make this three days trip. My driver was drunk most of the time. There were no trees from Glenwood to Big Stone Lake on the trail. When I drove up to Brown Station, a big lock house with a family of about forty people nelly met me to my inquiry as to whether i could stay overnight she answered yes but there is no food in the house we have had none for three days my father is somewhere between here and henderson with supplies he knows we are destitute so we'll hurry through about three o'clock we heard an indian noise outside it was joe with his indian companions all he had on that big sled was half a hog a case of champagne and half a dozen guns these men were always improvident and never seemed to think ahead his daughters amanda and emily twins had a peculiarity i never knew before in twins one day one would be gay the other sad the next day it would be reversed End of section 32。section 33 of old rail fence corners。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by natalia bykov。Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. J. M. Payne, Minneapolis. During the early days of the war, my husband raised a company of cavalry and wanted me to inspect them as they drilled. I was only a girl of seventeen, but had instructions enough how to behave when they were drilling for a regiment. I was mounted on one of the cavalry horses and was to sit sedately my eye on every maneuver, and a pleased smile on my face. I was ready with the goods, but unfortunately when I was ready, my steed was not. At the first bugle call, he started on a fierce gallop, squeezing himself in where he had belonged, 
while a terrified bride clung to his neck with both arms. The only reason that I did not cling with more was that I did not have them. I went once on a buffalo hunt with my husband. It does not seem possible that all those animals can be gone. The plains were covered with them. The steaks from a young male buffalo were the most delicious I have ever tasted. Miss Minnesota Neal My father, the Reverend Mr. J.D. Neal, first came to St. Paul in April 49, then returned east to get my mother. In July, when they arrived at Buffalo on their way west, at the hotel they met Governor and Mrs. Ramsey, who were on their way to Minnesota to take up their duties there. They were delighted to meet my father, as he was the first man they had ever met who had seen St. Paul. When they arrived, they were much surprised at the smallness of the place. My mother was not easily consoled over the size of their metropolis. Among other supplies, she had brought a broom as she had heard how difficult it was to get them. Mr. H. M. Rice, who came down to meet them, chided her for being disappointed and, putting the broom over his shoulder with pure military effect, led her along a little footpath which led over the bluff to the town and to the American house. Although this was a hotel par excellence for the times, the floor was made of splintered, unplaned boards. My mother was obliged to keep her shoes on until she had got into bed and put them on before arising to escape the slivers. The furniture of the bedroom consisted of a bed and washstand, on which last piece the minister wrote powerful sermons. My mother wished to put down a carpet and bring in some of her own furniture, but the landlady would not allow this, saying there was no knowing where it would stop if one was allowed to do the like. They early began the construction of a small chapel and a large brick house, which later became the stopping place of all ministers entering the state. In the fall of 49, the house was not completed, but the chapel was. They felt that the Scots, where they then lived, needed their room, so moved into the chapel and putting up their bed on one side of the pulpit and stove on the other, kept house there for six weeks. The only drawback was that the bed had to be taken down every Sunday. In all the six weeks, it never rained once on Sunday. My mother used often to go alone through a ravine at night to see the Ramses. She carried a lantern but was never molested or afraid, although it was often very dark. Their storeroom, in those days everyone had one, was stocked in the fall with everything for the winter. My father would buy a side of beef and then cut it up according to the directions his wife would read from a diagram in a cookbook. This was frozen and placed in an outside storeroom. One Sunday, my father announced from the pulpit that if anyone was in need, they always stood ready to help. That night, everything was taken from the storehouse. It was thought the act was done by someone who respected my father's wishes, as expressed in his sermon. Their first Christmas here, the doorbell rang. When it was answered, no one was there, but a great big bag containing supplies of all kinds hung from the latch. A large pincushion outlined in black was among the things. It was years before the donor was known. Once, some eastern people came to see us, and we took them for a long drive. The bridges were not built, so we had to cross the Mississippi on a ferry. We went first to Fort Snelling, which seemed to be abandoned. In one of the rooms, we found some peculiar high caps which had belonged to the soldiers. My father took one and amused the children much when he went under Minnehaha Falls by leaving his own hat and wearing that funny cap. Mr. L. L. Laffam When we were coming to Houston County, if we couldn't get game, we breakfast on codfish. I think it was the biggest slab of codfish I ever saw when we started. It made us thirsty. The fish called for water, and many's the time Mother and I knelt down and drank from stagnant pools that would furnish fever germs enough to kill a whole city nowadays. But I suppose we had so much fresh air that the germs couldn't thrive in our systems. Speaking of codfish reminds me that one day we met a man and his family making their way to the river. I halted him and asked him what he was going back for. You see, we met few turnouts on the road, for all were going the same way. Well, he said, 
I'm homesick. Homesick as a dog, and I'm going back east if I live to get there. Why, what's the matter with the West? I asked. Oh, nothing. Only it's too blame fur from God's country, and I got a hankering for codfish. And I'm a-going where it is. Go lang. And he moved on. I guess he was homesick. He looked, and he talked it, and the whole outfit said it plain enough. You can't argue with homesickness. Never. Arnold Stone and his good wife lived up there on the hill. One day in the early 60s, an Indian appeared in Mrs. Stone's kitchen and asked for something to eat. They were just sitting down to dinner, and he was invited to join the family. The butter was passed to him, and he said, Me no butter knife. I told Arnold, said Mrs. Stone, that when it gets so the engines ask for butter knives, it's high time we had one. End of section 33. Recording by Natalia Baikov. Section 34 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reed All Day. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Anthony Wayne Chapter. Mankato. Lillian Butler Moorhart. Mrs. William J. Moorhart. Mrs. Margaret Rathburn Funk, 1853. I came to Mankato in the year 1853 on the steamer Clarion from St. Paul. I was 11 years old. My father, Hoxie Rathburn, had left us at St. Paul while he looked for a place to locate. He went first to Stillwater and St. Anthony, but finally decided to locate at the great bend of the Minnesota River. We landed about four o'clock in the morning and father took us to a little shack he had built on the brow of the hill west of Front Street, near the place where the old Turutolot Hospital used to be. Back of this shack, at a distance of a couple of blocks, were twenty Indian tepees, which were known as Wyakutha's Band. As nearly as I can remember, there were nine families here at that time, and their names were as follows. Maxfield, Hannah, Van Brunt, Warren, Howe, Mills, Jackson, and Johnson, our own family being the ninth. The first winter here, I attended school. The schoolhouse was built by popular subscription and was on the site of the present Union School on Broad Street. It was a log structure of one room and in the middle of this room was a large square iron stove. The pupils sat around the room facing the four walls, the desks being wide boards projecting out from the walls. Miss Sarah Jane Hanna was my first teacher. I came from my home across the prairie through the snow in the bitter cold of the winter. Oftentimes I broke through the crust of the snow and had a hard time getting out. One of the incidents I remember well while going to school was about a young Indian whom we called Josh, who pretended he was very anxious to learn English. Most every day he would come to the school, peer in at the windows, shade his eyes with his hand and mutter A, B, C, which would frighten us very much. The education the children received in those days had to be paid for either by their parents or by someone else who picked out a child and paid for his or her tuition. That was how I received my education. My parents were too poor to pay for mine, and a man in town who had no children volunteered to pay for same. I went to school for a few years on this man's subscription. The first winter was a very cold one, and although we were not bothered much by the Indians as yet, they often came begging for something to eat. Although the Indians had never harmed us, we were afraid of them. When we came to this country, we brought a dog, and when these Indians came begging, we took the dog into the house with us and placed him beside the door, where his barking and growling soon frightened them away. They seemed afraid of dogs, as there were very few in this country at that time. One time, when father was on his way home, he saw an Indian boy who had been thrown from his horse. He picked him up and put him back on his horse and took him to his teepee. Later, this same Indian remembered my father's kindness to him by warning us that the Indians were planning an uprising and telling us to leave the country. My father was the first mail carrier through this part of the country. John Marsh and his brother, George Marsh, contracted with him to carry the mail, they having previously contracted with the government. He was to carry the mail from Mankato to Sioux City and return. He made his first trip in the summer of 1856. 
The trip took about three weeks. He made several trips during the summer. His last trip was in the fall of 1856, when he started from here to Sioux City. The government was supposed to have built shacks along his route at regular intervals of about 20 miles where he could rest and seek shelter during cold weather and storms, but this had been neglected. He often slept under haystacks and wherever shelter was afforded. On his way to Sioux City, he encountered some very severe weather and froze one of his sides. The lady where he stopped in Sioux City wanted him to stay there for a while before returning home and until his side had been treated and he had recovered, but he would not have it so and started on his return trip during exceedingly cold weather. He did not return on scheduled time from Sioux City on this trip, and mother became very much worried about him. She went to the men who were contracted with father to carry the mail and asked them to send out men to look for him. They promised to send out a Frenchman and a dog team. This contented mother for a while, but as father did not return, she again went to these men, and this time they sent out three men with a horse and cutter to look for him. After traveling over the route for some time, they came to a shack on the Des Moines River, near where Jackson, this state, now is, and in this shack they found my father, badly frozen and barely alive. He lived but a few moments after shaking hands with the men who found him. They brought the body back to Mankato, and he was buried out near our place of residence, at the foot of the hill. The weather was so extremely cold at that time that the family could not go out to the burial. Later, after I was married, myself and husband came down to what is now the central part of town for the purpose of, of buying a lot for building a home, and we selected the lot where I now live, at the corner of Walnut and Broad Streets. We purchased the same for four hundred and eighty seven dollars. We could have had any lot above this one for two hundred dollars, but selected this for the reason that it was high. The country around us was all timber, and we had no sidewalks or streets laid out at that time. At the time of the Indian outbreak, I lived on what is now Washington Street, directly across from where the German Lutheran School now stands. The Indians started their outbreaks during the Civil War. They started their massacres in this neighborhood in July and August of 1862. I can distinctly remember seeing, while standing in the doorway of my home, a band of Indians coming over the hill. This was Little Priest and his band of Winnebagoes. These Winnebagoes professed to be friendly to the white people and hostile to the Sioux. They claimed that a Sioux had married a Winnebago maiden, and for that reason they were enemies to the Sioux. To prove that they were their enemies, they stalked the Sioux, who had married a maid of one of their tribes, and murdered him, bringing back to show us his tongue, heart, and scalp, and also dipped their hands in the Sioux's lifeblood, and painted their naked bodies with it. End of section 34「Section 35 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Mary Pitcher, 1853. The old nominee with a cabin full of passengers and decks and hold loaded with freight bound for st paul was the first boat to get through lake pepin in the spring of eighteen fifty three the journey from dubuque was full of interest but although on either side of the mississippi the indians were the chief inhabitants nothing of exciting nature occurred until pig eyes bar on which was caposia the village of the never to be forgotten little crow was reached then as the engines were slowed down to make the landing a sight met our gaze that startled even the captain the whole village of several hundred indians was in sight and a most frightful sight it was every one young and old was running about crying wailing with faces painted black and white they did not seem even to see the big steamer it was such an appalling spectacle that the captain deemed it best not to land but there were two men on board residents of st paul returning from st louis who got into a boat and went ashore they learned that there had been a fight in st paul the day before 
between the band of the Sioux and a party of the Chippewas, in which one of the Sioux was killed and several wounded. It was not a very pleasant thing to contemplate, for these people on board the boat were going to St. Paul with their families to make homes in this very far away west. There were also on board some sisters of charity from St. Louis, one of them Sister Victorian, a sister of Mrs. Louis Robert. They all fell on their knees and prayed and wept, and they were not the only ones who wept either. There were many white faces, and no one seemed at ease. I remember my mother saying to my father, Oh, Thomas, why do we bring these children into this wild place where there can be an Indian fight in the biggest town and only ten miles from a fort at that? The excitement had not subsided when St. Paul was reached. But the first man that came on board as the boat touched the landing was my mother's brother, Mr. W. W. Paddock. The sight of him seemed to drive away some of the fear. As he was smiling and made light of the incident of the day before, he took us up to the old merchant's hotel, then a large rambling log house, and as soon as we had deposited some of our luggage, he said, well we will go out and see the battlefield it was in the back yard of our hotel an immense yard of whole block filled with huge logs drawn there through the winter for the year's fuel the morning of the fight a party of chippewas coming into st paul from the bluffs saw the sioux in canoes rounding the bend below and knowing that they would come up third street from their landing place just below Forbes' store and exactly opposite the hotel. The Chippewas made haste to hide behind the logs and wait the coming of the Sioux. The landlady, Mrs. Kate Wells, was standing up on one of the logs, hanging up some clothes on a line, frightened almost to death at the sight of the Indians running into the yard and hiding behind the logs. She jumped down and started to run into the house, Instantly, she was made to understand she could not go inside. The Indians pointed their guns at her and motioned her to get down behind the logs out of sight, which she did, and none too soon, as just then the Sioux came in sight and were met by a most deadly fusillade that killed old Peg Leg Jim and wounded many others. Some of the Sioux took refuge in Forbes' store and opened fire on any Chippewa who left his hiding place. Pretty soon the inhabitants began to come into hailing distance, and the Chippewas concluded to beat a hasty retreat, but not before they had taken old Jim's scalp. When the Sioux ran into Forbes' store, the clerk, thinking his time had come, raised a window, and taking hold of the sill, let himself drop down into the river's edge, a distance of over fifty feet. Between the Sioux and the Chippewas ran a feud farther back than the white men knew of, and no opportunity was ever lost to take the scalp of a fallen foe. The Indians mourned for the dead, but doubtly so if they had lost their scalps, as scalpless Sioux cannot enter the happy hunting grounds. One of the things about this same trip of the old nominee was the fact that almost every citizen of St. Paul came down to see this welcome messenger of spring. Provisions had become very scarce, and barrels of eggs and boxes of crackers and barrels of hams. In fact, almost everything eatable was rolled out on the land and sold at once. It didn't take long to empty a barrel of eggs or a box of crackers, and everyone went home laden. End of section 35section 36 of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org old rail fence corners edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris 
Mrs. J. R. Beatty, 1853. I landed in Mankato on my twelfth birthday, May 26th, 1853. We came from Ohio. My father, George Maxfield, and his family, and my uncle, James Hanna, and family, and friend, Basil Moreland, from Quincy, Illinois. We took the Ohio River steamboat at Cincinnati. Somewhere along the river, we bought a cow. This cow started very much against her better judgment, and after several days on the boat, decided she wouldn't go west after all, and in some way jumped off the boat and made for the shore. We did not discover her retreat until she had reached the high bank along the river, and amid great excitement, the boat was turned around, and everybody landed to capture the cow. She was rebellious all along the way, especially when we had to transfer to a Mississippi boat at St. Louis, and when we transferred to a boat on the Minnesota River at St. Paul. But she was well worth all the trouble, for she was the only cow in the settlement that first summer. She went dry during the winter, and not a drop of milk could be had for love or money in the town. The want of salt bothered the pioneers more than anything else. Game abounded. Buffalo herds sometimes came near, and deer often came through the settlement on the way to the river to drink. The streams were full of fish, but we could not enjoy any of these things without salt. However, our family did not suffer as much inconvenience as some others did. One family we knew had nothing to eat but potatoes and maple syrup. They poured the syrup over the potatoes and managed to get through the winter. Sometimes flour would be as high as $24 a barrel during the summer when the water was low, and in the winter when the river was frozen and the boats could not come down from St. Paul. The storekeepers could charge any price they could get. Our family had a year's supply of groceries that father had bought at St. Louis on the way up. We had plenty of bedding and about sixty yards of ingrain carpet that was used as a partition in our house for a long time. There was very little to be bought in St. Paul at that time. Father bought the only set of dishes to be had in St. Paul, and the only clock. There were only a few houses in Mankato, and the only thing we could find to live in was the frame of a warehouse that Minard Mills had just begun to build on the south end of the levee, where Otto's grocery store now stands. My uncle purchased the building, and we put a roof on and moved in. We were a family of twenty-one, and I remember to this day the awful stack of dishes we had to wash after each meal. A frame addition was put alongside of the building, and in July my cousin, Sarah J. Hanna, later Mrs. John Q. A. Marsh, started a day school with twenty-four scholars. It was the first school ever held in Mankato. In 1855, a tract of land twenty-four miles long and twelve miles wide was withdrawn from civilization and given as a reservation to two thousand Winnebago Indians, who took possession in June of that year against the vigorous protest of the people. Everyone in the town was down to see them come in. The river was full of their canoes for two or three days. As soon as they landed, the Indians began the erection of a rude shelter on the levee of poles and bark, perhaps twenty feet long and twelve feet wide. The squaws were all busy cooking some kind of meat and a cake something like a pancake. We soon discovered that they were preparing a feast for the Sioux, who had come down in large numbers from Fort Ridgely, which was near New Ulm, to meet them. After the shelter was finished, the feast began. Blankets were spread on the ground, and rows of wooden bowls were placed before the Indians, one bowl to about three Indians. The cakes were broken up and placed near the bowls. After the feast was over, the peace pipe was passed, and the speaking began. The first speaker was a Sioux chief, evidently delivering an address of welcome. He was followed by several others, all very dignified and impressive. We had heard that the Sioux would give a return feast on the next day, and when we got tired of watching the speakers, we went down to the Sioux wigwams to see what was going on there, and found an old Indian squatting before the fire. Dog meat seemed to be the main article of food. Evidently, it was to be a ceremonial feast, for he had a large supply of dog beside him on the ground, and was holding one over the fire to singe the hair off. When we came near, he deftly cut off an ear and offered it to me with a very fierce look. When I refused it, he laughed very heartily at his little joke. The Winnebagoes were sent to the agency four miles from town soon after. 
The agency buildings were where St. Clair is now located. One day at noon, the school children heard that the Indians were having a squaw dance across the river. It was in the spring, just as the snow was beginning to melt. We found about twenty-five squaws dancing around in a circle and making a fearful noise in their high, squealing voices. They danced in the same way that the Indians did, and I had never seen any other form of dance among them. They were wearing moccasins and were tramping around in the water. The Indians were sitting on logs watching them. One was pounding on a tom-tom. One day, when we were eating dinner, about twenty-five Indians came to the house and looked in the window. They always did that and then would walk in without knocking. They squatted down on the floor until dinner was over and then motioned for the table to be pushed back to the wall. Then they began to dance the begging dance. In their dances they pushed their feet, held close together over the floor, and came down very heavily on their heels. There were so many of them that the house fairly rocked. Each Indian keeps up a hideous noise, and that, with the beating of the tom-tom, makes a din hard to describe. The tom-tom is a dried skin drawn tightly over a hoop, and they beat on this with a stick. After they were through dancing, they asked for a pail of sweetened water and some bread, which they passed around and ate. This bread and sweetened water was all they asked for. It is a part of the ceremony, although they would take anything they could get. The Sioux were the hereditary foes of the Chippewas, who lived near the headwaters of the Mississippi, and during this summer about three hundred Sioux on their way to Fort Ridgely, where they were to receive their annuity, pitched their wigwams near our house. They had been on the warpath, and had taken a lot of Chippewa scalps, and around these bloody trophies they held a savage scalp dance. We children were not allowed to go near, as the howling, hooting, and yelling frightened everybody. It continued for three nights, and the whole settlement was relieved when they went away. Mrs. A. M. Pepper, 1858 My father, Minor Porter, had been closely connected with the early history of Fox Lake, Wisconsin. He had conducted the leading hotel and store for years, was postmaster, and did much by his enterprise and liberality for the town. He went to bed a wealthy man, and awoke one morning to find everything but a small stock of merchandise swept away by the state bank failures of that state. Selling that, he came to Mankato in 1857, and preempted a tract of land near Miniopa Falls, now our state park. It was one half mile from South Bend, located on the big bend of the Minnesota River. The following year, 1858, father started to build on our claim. There were sawmills in our vicinity, where black walnut and butternut for the inside finishing could be bought, but the pine that was needed for the other part of the building had to be hauled from St. Paul by team. It took all summer to get the lumber down. After our house was finished, it came to be the stopping place for lodging and breakfast for settlers traveling over the territorial road towards Winnebago and Blue Earth City. Pigeon Hill, a mile beyond our house, was used as a camping ground for the Sioux all of that winter. We could see the smoke from their campfires curling up over the hill. Although they were supposed to stay on their reservation at Fort Ridgely, they were constantly coming and going, and they and the Winnebagoes roved at will over the entire country. One night, Mother was awakened by an unusual noise. She called Father, who got up and opened the bedroom door. The sight that met their eyes was enough to strike terror to the heart of any settler those days. The room was packed with Indians, Winnebagoes, men, women, and children, but they were more frightened than we were. They had had some encounter with the Sioux and had fled in terror to our house. After much persuasion, father induced them to leave the house and go down to a small pond where the timber was very heavy and they remained in hiding for two days. We were in constant terror of the Sioux. All the settlers knew they were a bloodthirsty lot, and often an alarm would be sent around that the Sioux were surrounding the settlement. Mother would take us children and hurry to the old stone mill at South Bend, where we would spend the night. They became more and more troublesome until Father thought it unsafe to remain any longer and took us back to our old home in Wisconsin. End of section 36
Section 37 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Old Rail Fence Corners. Edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. I. A. Pelton, 1858. I came into the state of Minnesota in April 1858, and to Mankato May 1st, 1858, from the state of New York, where I was born and raised. This was a pretty poverty-stricken country then. The panic they had in November 1857 had struck this country a very hard blow. It stopped immigration. Previous to this panic, they had good times and had gone into debt heavily, expecting to have good times right along everybody was badly in debt and money was hard to get currency consisted of old guns town lots basswood lumber etc these things were traded for goods and groceries money was loaned at three to five per cent per month or thirty six to sixty per cent per year i knew of people who paid sixty per cent in a year for a short time three per cent a month was a common interest i hired money at that myself the farmers had not developed their farms much at that time. A farmer who had twenty to twenty-five acres under plough was considered a big farmer in those days. The summer of 1858 was a very disastrous, unprofitable one. It commenced very wet and kept raining during the summer until North Mankato was all under water, and the river in places was a mile wide. The river was the highest about the 1st of August. The grain at the time of this heavy rain was ripening, causing it to blight, ruining the crop. Wheat at this time was worth from two to three dollars per bushel. A great many of the farmers did not cut their grain because there was nothing in it for them. A man where I boarded cut his grain, but he had little or nothing, and that which he did get was soft and smutty. He took the same to be ground into flour, and the bread the flour made was almost black, as they did not at that time have mills to take out the smut. The people in the best condition financially were mighty glad if they had johnny cake, pork and potatoes, and milk, and when they had these they thought they were on the top shelf. At this time, too, they had to watch the fields with guns, or protect them with scarecrows, and have the children watch them to keep them clear from the blackbirds, which were an awful pest. There were millions of these birds, and there was not a time of day when they were not hovering over the fields. These birds would alight in the cornfields, tear the husks from the corn, and completely ruin the ears of corn. Also feed on the oats and wheat when it was not quite ripe and in a milky condition. During the winter they would go south, but come back in the spring when there would be considerable bother again by alighting on the fields that had just been sown and taking the seed from the ground. Farmers finally threw poison grain in the fields. This was made by soaking wheat and oats in a solution of strychnine. It was ten years before these birds were exterminated enough to make farming a profitable occupation. Farming was more successful after that, for the reason that these birds did not need watching. During the summer of 1858, and all during the summer of 1859, the river was navigable. St. Paul boats came up often, and sometimes a Mississippi boat from St. Louis. We had no railroads in the state at that time. During the year of 1859, state banks were put into the state, but these did not last long. I know at that time my brother sent out $150 that I had borrowed of Harry Lamberton. He sent this money by a man named David Lyon from New York. He came to where I was boarding and left state bank money. The people where I was staying gave me the money that night when I came home and told me about what it was for. I started for St. Peter the next day to pay the debt and during the time the money was left and when I arrived at St. Peter it had depreciated in value ten per cent, and it kept on going down until it was entirely valueless. Money was very scarce at that time, and times were hard. We had some gold and a little silver. In the year of 1859, we had the latest spring I had ever experienced. We did not do any farming of any kind until the first week in May, and this made it very late for small grain. We had a short season, but the wheat was very good. We had an early frost that year, about the 3rd of September, and it killed everything. I saw killdeers frozen to death the third day of that month. Corn was not ripe yet and was ruined. It would have been quite a crop. It was dried up afterwards and shrunk, but was not good. Oats and wheat, however, were good, and it made better times. 
the country was gradually developing in the spring of eighteen sixty we had an early spring the bees flew and made honey the seventeenth of march we commenced ploughing on the sixteenth of march i brought down potatoes that spring and put them in an open shed and they did not freeze this summer was a very productive one wheat went as high as forty bushels to the acre number one all crops were good the fall of eighteen sixty was the time they held the presidential election and lincoln was elected that fall we had very many speakers here at mankato and excitement ran high general baker governor ramsey william windham afterwards secretary of the treasury and other prominent men spoke after the war commenced and the volunteers were called out most of the able-bodied men joined the army these men sent their pay home and afterwards the business began to get better and conditions improved early in august of eighteen sixty two lincoln called for five hundred thousand men and those men in this immediate vicinity who had not already joined went to war leaving only those not able to join to protect their homes and property mr john a jones we were among the very earliest settlers in the vicinity of mankato and came from wisconsin i had come in april and preempted a claim at the top of what is known as pigeon hill two other families came with us traveling across country we and our teams and livestock made quite a procession we had five yoke oxen several span of horses and about forty head of cattle among them a number of milk cows the wagons in which we rode and in which we carried our household goods were the real prairie schooner of early days we found our way by compass and made our own road west traveling over the soft earth in which deep ruts were made by our wheels the following teams were compelled to proceed with care in order not to get stalled in the ruts made by the first wagons we made the trip in four weeks fording all the rivers and streams on the way at la crosse we hired both ferries and took all day to cross during the difficult journey we averaged about twenty-two miles some of us walking all the time driving large drove of cattle no indian villages were passed although we met a number of friendly redskins at night we slept in the wagons and cooked our meals as all emigrants did we brought a large store of provisions and on saturdays would set a small stove up in the open and do our weekly bread baking we passed through eighteen miles of heavy timber beyond what is now Casota coming out from the forest about three miles this side into a very nice road we finally arrived at the homestead we set our stove up in the yard by a tree and lived in the shanty until our new log house was completed the shanty was covered with seven loads of hay to make it warm inside and a quilt was hung over the door here we lived for two months suffering at times from rain penetrating at one time a heavy cloudburst nearly drowned us out the first winter in our new home was a severe one for three weeks the cold was very intense and what was known as three dog moons at night and three dog suns during the day heralded the cold weather the moon and the sun being circled with these halos for the entire three weeks provisions began to run low prices were very high and mr jones went to st paul to lay in a stock of provisions among other things he brought home sixty barrels of flour and eight barrels of salt the superfine flour was sixteen dollars a barrel and the second grade thirteen dollars the provisions were brought by boat to Casota, where they were stranded in the sand and were brought the rest of the way by team there was also a barrel of sugar and one of apples sugar in those days sold at the rate of six pounds for a dollar the family used this flour until they raised their own wheat and after that they used graham flour the joneses planted five acres to wheat the following spring End of section 37。section 38 of old rail fence corners。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording。by greg giordano old rail fence corners edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris section thirty eight mrs clark kaiser after my husband had enlisted and went to fort snelling i was quite timid about staying alone and got a neighbor girl to stay with me 
The third night I thought I might as well stay alone. That night a rap came at the door. A neighbor was there and wanted to know if Mr. Kaiser had a gun. He said the Indians had broken out, and they wanted to get all the guns they could. Of course we were paralyzed with fear. From that on the trouble began. As soon as the rumor reached Fort Snelling, my husband's company was sent back. On the day they arrived, I got a good dinner for them. I knew they would be tired, and when he arrived he looked worn and haggard, having marched all the way from Fort Snelling to Mankato. We could not eat much dinner, we were so excited. He left right away for the frontier. The last thing he told me before he went away was, Fight till you die. Never be taken prisoner. The bluest day of all was one Sunday. Everyone who could get away was packing up. Women and children were walking the streets and crying. They expected the Sioux to start from Fort Ridgely to kill all the whites, but when they got to Birch Cooley, where the Winnebagoes were to join them, the Indians found a barrel of whiskey there. They became intoxicated and had a big fight, so they did not come to Mankato. That was one time when whiskey served a good purpose. One night not very long after, the Indians broke out. There were four of our neighbor's families came into our house, as they felt safer together. There were twelve children in the house. About midnight we heard the town bell begin to ring, and one of the women got up and went to the door to see what the trouble was. When she opened the door she saw a fire, which was Seward's mill, but she cried out, The Indians have come, the town is all on fire. The children began screaming, and we were all nearly frightened to death, but it proved it wasn't Indians at all. Someone had set the mill on fire. A few of the men who were left thought that we had better pack a few of our best things and go to Leech's old stone building for protection. What few men there were could protect us better there than at different homes. This old building was three stories high. Some women were sick, some screaming. It was a scene of trouble and distress. It was the worst bedlam I ever got into. Mr. Holtling was then our best friend, and helped me get my things over to the store building. We stayed one night. The cries of women in pain and fright were unbearable, so the next day I went back home thinking I would risk my chances there. Judge Lauren Cray, 1859 While at St. Peter, and in the early part of December, 1862, a few of us learned by grapevine telegraph late one afternoon that an effort was to be made the following evening by the citizens of mankato new ulm and vicinity to kill the indian prisoners three hundred and more than in camp at mankato near the present site of sibley park as no admission fee was to be charged the select few determined to be present at the entertainment the headquarters of the bloodthirsty citizens was the old mankato house located where the National Citizens Bank now stands, where liquid refreshments were being served liberally, without money and without price. I have never seen a correct history of this fiasco in print. A very large crowd congregated there, and there seemed to be no great haste to march on the Indian camp. Several times starts were made by a squad of fifty or one hundred persons, who would proceed for a few hundred feet, and then halt, and return for more refreshments. Finally, at nearly midnight, the supply of refreshments must have been exhausted, for the army moved. Several hundred citizens started south along Front Street for the Indian camp, straggling for a distance of several blocks. When the head of the column reached West Mankato, it halted until the rear came up, and while a rambling discussion was going on as to what they should do and how they should do it, Captain, since Governor, Austin, with his company of cavalry, surrounded the whole squad and ordered them to move on towards Colonel, since Governor, Miller's headquarters, right at the Indian camp. They seemed reluctant to go, and refused to move. Captain Austin ordered his men to close in, which they did, crowding the citizens, and yet they refused to move. Finally, Captain Austin gave the command to draw sabers, and when a hundred sabers came out in one movement, the army again moved on, Colonel Miller's headquarters at the Indian camp. The scene here was supremely ridiculous. Colonel Miller came out from his tent, and spoke kindly to the citizens, and asked why they were congregated in such large numbers. 
he finally ordered their release and suggested that they go home which they hastened to do the next morning these indians were removed under guard of all the troops in the city to log barracks which had been built for them on front street diagonally across the street from where the sawpaw now stands the indians remained in these barracks only about two weeks they had been there but a short time when the officer of the day making his morning inspection which was very formal thought that he saw a hatchet or knife under the blanket of one of the indians without a change of countenance or a suspicious movement he proceeded with the inspection until it was completed and retired from the barracks and at once caused to be mustered around the barracks every soldier in the city with loaded guns and fixed bayonets then with a squad of soldiers he entered the barracks and searching every indian he secured a large number of hatchets knives clubs and other weapons these weapons it was learned had been gotten at the winnebago agency about twelve miles away by several squaws who prepared food for these indians and who were allowed to go to the woods to gather wood for their fires immediately after this discovery the indians who were under sentence of death were removed to a stone building near by where they were kept under heavy guard a few days after this incident december twenty sixth eighteen sixty two my company came from st peter to act as guard on one side of the scaffold at the execution of the thirty-eight indians who were then hanged on what is now the southerly end of the grounds of the chicago and northwestern freight depot in mankato a granite monument now marks the place end of section thirty eight recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section thirty nine of old rail fence corners this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano old rail fence corners edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris section thirty nine captain clark key sir i served as first lieutenant company e ninth minnesota of the frontier extending from fort ridgely through the settlement at hutchinson long lake and pipe lake at the latter place we built a sod fort and i was in charge mounted couriers usually three in number traveling together reported daily at these forts i was stationed along the frontier for more than a year and we had many encounters with the indians and i soon learned that a white man with the best rifle to be bought in those days had a poor chance for his life when he had to contend with an indian with a double-barrel shotgun the indian with one lightning-like movement throws a handful of mixed powder and shot into his gun loading both barrels at once and takes a shot at his enemy before the white man can turn around and when the indian is running to escape he jumps first to this side and then to that never in a straight line and it is an expert marksman indeed who can hit him i worked on the winnebago agency as carpenter and millwright and learned to know the habits of the indians very well i learned to follow a trail and later during the indian trouble that knowledge came in very handy it is very easy for a white man to fall into the habits of the indian but almost impossible to raise the indian to the standard of the white man the head chief of the winnebagoes was well known to me and we became fast friends he was a friendly man to all the settlers but i knew the characteristics of the indian well enough to trust none of them he never overcomes the cunning and trickery in his nature and i learned to know that when he seemed most amiable and ingratiating was the time to look out for some deviltry the indians were great gamblers the squaws especially they would gamble away everything they owned stopping only at the short cotton skirt they wore crazy jane was an educated squaw and could talk as good english as any of us she was very peculiar and one of the funny things she did was to ride her indian pony muffled up in a heavy wool blanket carrying a parasol over her head she had the habit of dropping in to visit the wives of the settlers and would frequently on these visits wash her stockings and put them on again without drying one day when we were living at the agency i came home and found my wife in a great fright 
our little three-year-old girl was missing she looked everywhere but could not find her i ran to the agency buildings nearby but no one had seen her they were digging a deep well near our house and i had not dared to look there before but now i must after peering down into the depths of the muddy waters and not finding her i looked up and saw crazy jane coming towards me with a strange-looking papoose on her back when she came nearer i found it was my child i snatched the little girl away from her she said she was passing by and saw the child playing outside the door and had carried her away on her back to her teepee where she had kept her for several hours but had meant no harm we were ordered to new ulm after the outbreak we found the place deserted the doors had been left unlocked and everyone had fled for their lives the desk and stamps from the post office were in the street and all the stores were open i put out scouting parties from there and we stood guard all night after two or three days a few came back to claim their property they had to prove their claim before i would allow them to take charge again uncle tommy ireland came to us a few days after we arrived there he was the most distressed looking man i ever saw in my life he had been hiding in the swamps for seven days and nights he lay in water in the deep grass when we examined him we found seventeen bullet holes where he had been shot by the indians he told me about falling in with mrs eastlake and her three children they had all come from lake shetek the settlement there comprised about forty-five people they had been attacked by the indians under lean bear and eight of his band and the bands of white lodge and sleepy eye although sleepy eye himself died before the massacre many of the settlers knew the indians quite well and had treated them with great kindness mr ireland and his family were with the rest of the settlers when they were overtaken by the indians mrs ireland mr eastlake and two of his children were among the killed mrs eastlake was severely wounded and wandered for three days and nights on the prairie searching for her two children hoping they might have escaped from the slow where the others met their death finally on the way to new ulm she overtook her old neighbor mr ireland whom she supposed killed as she had last seen him in the slough pierced with bullets but he had revived and managed to crawl thus far though in a sorry plight from him she received the first tidings from her two missing children later on when she found her children they were so worn by their suffering she could hardly recognize them the eldest boy eleven years old had carried his little brother fifteen months old on his back for fifty miles all the baby had to eat was a little piece of cheese which the older boy happened to have in his pocket when within thirty miles from new ulm they found the deserted cabin of j f brown in brown county where mrs eastlake and children a mrs hurd and her two children and mr ireland lived for two weeks on raw corn the only food they could find they dared not make a fire for fear the indians would see the smoke mr ireland had been so badly injured that he had not been able to leave the cabin to get help but finally was forced by the extreme need of the women and children to start for new ulm he fell in with the priest on the way and together they came to our headquarters and told their story we started at four o'clock next morning with a company of soldiers and a wagon with a bed for the injured women when we reached the cabin the women were terribly frightened and thought it was the indians after them again on our return to new ulm we took a different turn in the road it was just as near and much safer one of our men joe gaffillion had not had his horse saddled when the rest started and when he came to the fork in the road he took the one he had come by and was killed by the indians undoubtedly we would have met the same fate had we taken that road as the indians were on our trail and were in ambush waiting for our return however we got safely back to new ulm and later mrs eastlake and her children and mr ireland came to mankato where they were cared for with the other refugees the sufferings and hardships endured by the older East Lake boy soon carried him to an untimely grave. End of section thirty nine. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section forty of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano old rail fence corners 
edited by lucy leavenworth wilder morris section forty colonial chapter minneapolis carrie seacombe chatfield mrs e c chatfield ruth hall van sant mrs s r van sant miss carrie stratton eighteen fifty two my father was levi w stratton who was born in bradford new hampshire who came to st croix valley in eighteen thirty eight taking up a claim where marine now stands he helped to build the old mill there the ruins of which are still to be found there after two or three years he removed to alton illinois where he remained for ten or twelve years marrying my mother there in eighteen forty two in eighteen fifty two he returned to minnesota coming up the river in the old war eagle his family consisted of my mother myself and my four brothers and sisters the youngest an infant of six months we arrived at st paul on june eighth being a child of but seven years my memory of the appearance of the town at that time is very indistinct in fact the only clear remembrance of anything there is of a large sign upon a building directly across the street from the little inn or tavern where we stopped for the night it was minnesota outfitting company on account of our large family of little children i had been put into school when i was between two and three years of age and so was able to read write and spell and have a very vivid recollection of the three long words of that sign we came from st paul to st anthony in the stage of the willoughby company which was the first stage line in minnesota the driver stopped to water his horses at the famous old de neuer halfway house we stopped at the old st charles hotel while the house my father had engaged was made ready for us it was the calvin tuttle home which was on the river bank at the foot of the university hill my father's previous residence in minnesota had taught him to understand and speak the indian language and so the indians were frequent visitors at our house on one errand or another generally however to get something to eat the first time they came my father was absent and my mother never having seen any indians before was very much frightened not being able to understand what they wanted she imagined with a mother's solicitude that they wanted the baby and being actually too terrified to stand any longer she took the baby and went into her room and lay down upon the bed after a while either from intuition or from the motions the indians made it occurred to her to give them something to eat which was what they wanted and they then went peaceably away the rest of the children like myself did not appear to be at all frightened but instead were very much entertained by the novel sight of the indians in their gay blankets and feathered headdress after that they were frequent visitors but always peaceable ones never committing any misdemeanor one of the earliest diversions i can remember was going up university hill to the old cheever tower and climbing to the top in accordance to the mandate at the bottom to pay your dime and climb to get the magnificent view of the surrounding country which included that of the great falls in their pristine glory i can remember too like all the others here who were children at that time the stupendous roar of the falls which was constantly in our ears especially if we were awake at night when every other noise was stilled in the fall of that first year i entered school which was an academy in a building on university avenue opposite the present east high school this school was the nucleus of the state university and was presided over by mr e w merrill who was afterward a congregational minister and home missionary after two or three years we moved into the home of the rev mr seth barnes above central avenue and between main and second streets here my father cultivated a fine garden which included besides corn beans and other usual vegetables some fine sweet potatoes which were quite a novelty in the town at that time mr irving a dunsmore 1853 in eighteen fifty two on account of poor health my father resolved to come to minnesota and become a farmer 
and in the fall of that year he set out with his family consisting of my mother myself and my three brothers we arrived at galena illinois only to find that the last boat of the season had gone up the river the day before so my father left us there for the winter and came up by the stage the end of his journey found him in the little town of harmony which was afterwards changed to richfield and is now within the city limits of minneapolis here he was able to buy for one hundred dollars a claim of two hundred and sixty acres with a house upon it which was only partly finished being however entirely enclosed this particular claim attracted his attention on account of the house as his family was so soon to follow it began at what is now fiftieth street and lindale avenue and continued out lindale three-quarters of a mile the house with some addition is still standing on lindale avenue between fifty-third and fifty-fourth streets minnehaha creek ran through the farm and the land on the north side of the creek part of which is now in washburn park was fine wooded land when the first boat came up the river in the spring it brought my mother and us boys my father had sent us word to come up to fort snelling on the boat but we had not received the message and so we got off at st paul and came up to st anthony by stage and got a team to take us to our new home we found it empty as my father and an uncle who was also here had gone to the fort to meet us as we went into one of the back rooms a very strange sight met our eyes my father and uncle had set a fish trap in the creek the night before and had poured the results of their catch in a heap on the floor and there was such a quantity of fish that it looked like a small haycock this was done for a surprise for us and as such was a great success as we were only accustomed to the very small fish that lived in the creek that ran through our home town in maine and these long pickerel and large suckers were certainly a novelty we salted them down and packed them in barrels and for a long time had plenty of fish to eat to sell and to give away our house soon took on the character of a public building as my father was made postmaster town treasurer and justice of the peace and all the town meetings were held there as well as church and sunday school my father gave five acres down at the creek to a company who erected a grist mill and the settlers from fifty or sixty miles away would come to have grain ground and would all stop at our house to board and sleep while there then the house would be so full that we boys would have to sleep on the floor or out in the barn or anywhere else we could find a place during our first winter a party of about fifty sioux indians came and camped in our woods just west of where the washburn park water tower now stands they put up about twenty teepees made partly of skins and partly of canvas we boys would often go in the evening to visit them and watch them make moccasins which we would buy of them they would often come to our house to beg for food but in all the time they remained there nearly the whole winter they committed no depredations except that they cut down a great deal of our fine timber and killed a great quantity of game so that when they wanted to come back the next winter father would not allow it once after they had gone away they came back through the farm and went off somewhere north of us where they had a battle with the chippewas when they returned they brought two scalps and held a powwow on the side of our hill we had a great deal of small game in our woods and great quantities of fish in the creek we used to spear the fish and sometimes would get two upon our spears at once my mother was very fond of dandelion greens and missed them very much as she could find none growing about our place so she went back to maine for seed and planted them but i hardly think that the great quantities we have now are the result of that one importation after a few years we had a school at wood lake which is down lindale avenue two or three miles end of section forty recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 41 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalia Baikov. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mrs. Mary Pribble, 1854. 
My father, Hiram Smith, arrived in Minnesota April 21, 1854, settling first in Brooklyn, Hennepin County. My mother followed in July of the same year with a family of three children, myself, age seven, and two brothers, age two and five years. We arrived in St. Paul July 9th, and my mother, with her usual forethought and thrift, realizing that before long navigation would close for the winter and shut off all source of supplies, laid in a supply of provisions while we were in St. Paul. Among other things, she bought a bag of rice flour, which was all the flour in our colony until April of the next year. We came by stage to Anoka and were to cross the Mississippi River in a canoe to the trading post of Mr. Miles, which was on a high point of land in what is now Champlain. It was where Elm Creek empties into the Mississippi. But the canoe was too small to carry us all at once, and so I was left on the east shore, sitting upon our baggage to wait for a return trip. When I finally arrived across the river, there were Indians gathered at the landing, and they touched me on the cheek and called me Heap Pale Face. There was a great joy in our little colony when that same autumn my father discovered a fine cranberry marsh. Much picnicking and picking followed. My parents secured seven bushels and allotted very much on the winter supplies that these cranberries would buy when they could send them to St. Paul, our only market. Soon one of the neighbors prepared to set out on a trip by ox team to St. Paul. The only road at that time was by the Indian Trail, which for several miles was where the county road now leads from Robbinsdale to Champlain, then to the ferry at St. Anthony Falls, and so on down the east side of the river to St. Paul. My mother had made out a careful list of all the real necessities to be purchased, putting them in the order of the need for them, in case he would not be able to buy them all. She knew very well that there would be no possible way to purchase any new clothing all winter, and so the first items on the list were new cloth for patches and thread to sew them with. This latter came in hanks then instead of on spools. After that came the list of provisions, as seven bushels of cranberries were expected to buy a great many supplies. How well I remember the joy upon my mother's face when those precious cranberries were loaded on the neighbor's already full wagon and the oxen slowly disappeared down the old trail. It was a long, tedious journey to be made in that way, and they had many days to wait before they would receive the fruits of that wonderful wagon load. Finally, the neighbor was back and came to my mother and said, Thee will be disappointed when I tell thee that the last boat left for St. Louis the day before I arrived in St. Paul. There is not a yard of cloth or a hank of thread in the town, and I could only get thee three brooms for thy fine cranberries. The next spring my father made maple sugar and was able to buy a cow and six hens from a man who came overland from southern Illinois, driving several cows and bringing a box of hens, and so we began to live more comfortably. In 1856 many people came, and by that time we had school, church, and Sunday school, and a lyceum, the pleasure of which I can never forget. We also had a portable sawmill. I think it was in the winter of 1855 that an agent, a real live agent, appeared in our midst to tell us of the remarkable qualities of a new oil called kerosene. He said if he could be sure of the sale of a barrel, it would be brought to St. Paul and delivered to any address on or before August 15th. I have the lamp now, in which part of that first barrel was burned. Mrs. Edmund Kimball, 1855. My father, Freeman James, left his home in New York State and came to Hassan, Minnesota in 1854. The next year he decided to go after his family and so wrote my mother to be ready to start in August. My mother got everything in readiness to start, but for some reason my father was delayed in getting back home and my mother, thinking that she had misunderstood his plans in some way, decided to start anyway, and so she loaded our belongings on the wagon, and we started alone. I was only eleven years old, and well I remember how great an undertaking it seemed to me to leave our pleasant home and all my playmates and start without father on such a long trip. 
But when we arrived at Dunkirk, where we took a boat to cross Lake Erie, we found father, and so made our journey without mishap. We arrived by boat in St. Paul in August 55 and started at once for Hassan, stopping that first night at the home of Mr. Longfellow at a place called Long Prairie. We were most cordially received and found other settlers stopping there for the night, too, which made the house so crowded that they were obliged to make beds on the sitting room floor for all the children. After we were put in bed, still another traveler arrived, a man who was expecting his family and had come part way to meet them. Just for fun, the family told him that his family had arrived and pointed to us children on the floor. He was overjoyed and came and turned the covers down to see us. Only for a moment was he fooled, but shook his head and said we were none of his. I shall never forget the shock I felt at the first view I had of our home. It was so different from what we had left behind that to a child of my age, it seemed that it was more than I could possibly endure. It was growing dark, and the little log cabin stood in the deep woods and the grass was so long in the front yard, it seemed the most lonely place in the world. And dark as it was, and as long as I knew the way back to be, I was strongly tempted and half inclined to start right off to my dear old home. This was all going through my mind while I stopped outside to look around after the rest had gone in. When they had lighted one or two candles and I followed them in, the homesick feeling was increased by the new prospect. My father had evidently left in a great hurry, for every dish in the house was piled dirty upon the table, and they were all heavy yellow ware, the like of which I had never seen before. The house had been closed so long that it was full of mice, and they ran scurrying over everything. But there was much work to do before we could get the place in order to go to bed, and it fell to my lot to wash all those dishes. No small task for an eleven-year-old girl. In the morning when the house was in order and the sun was shining in, and we could see what father had done to make us comfortable, the place took on a very different aspect and soon became another dear home. He had made every piece of the furniture himself. The bed was made of poles with strips of bark in place of bed cords. The mattress was of husks and the pillows of cattail down. There were three straight chairs and a rocking chair with splint bottoms. The splints were made by peeling small ash poles and then pounding them for some time with some heavy instrument, when the wood would come off in thin layers. The floor was of split logs. Father had made some good cupboards for the kitchen things. That first year, Mother was not well, and young as I was, I was obliged to do a great deal of housework. I did the washing and made salt-rising bread and one time I surprised the doctor who came to see Mother by making him a very good mustard poultice. End of section 41. Recording by Natalia Baikov. Section 42 of Old Rail Fence Corners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Simonon. Old Rail Fence Corners, edited by Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris. Mr. Frank G. O'Brien, 1856. The Reason I Did Not Graduate. In the winter of 1856-57, I worked for my board at the home of Bill Stevens, whose wife was a milliner. The shop or store was located a short distance below where the Pillsbury Mill stands on Main Street. My duty while there this particular winter was to take care of the house and chaperone Lola Stevens, the young daughter, to the private school which was called the Academy, the same being the stepping stone to our great state university. There were two departments upstairs and two below, hallway in the center and stairs leading from this hallway to the upper rooms. I do not recall who were the teachers in the primary department on the lower floor, but I do remember those on the floor above. 
Miss Stanton, later on the wife of D.S.B. Johnston, taught the girls in the East Room, and Daddy Rowe the boys. I was a pupil of Mr. Rowe, and Lola of Miss Stanton, and were it not that I was wrongfully accused of making charcoal sketches on the wall of the hall, I might have been numbered among the charter members of the first graduating class of the Academy, the forerunner of the State University. Daddy Rowe informed the boys at recess time that he was going to flog the perpetrator of the act. Yet, if they would own up and take a basin of water and scrub same from the walls, he would spare the rod. The guilty one, no doubt, held his hand up and gained the attention of Mr. Rowe and stated that Frank O'Brien did it. I denied it, but it did not go. Yet I, being innocent, was determined I would not take the basin from the teacher's hand. But he forced same upon me and said if it was not washed off within half an hour, he would give me a severe flogging. The threat did not prove effective because I was so worked up over the affair that when I closed the door to enter the hall, I gave the basin and its contents a fling downstairs, the sound of which aroused all four of the departments, while I double-quicked it for home, leaving Lola to reach home as best she could. I explained matters to Mr. Stevens, and had it not been for Mrs. Stevens and her sister, Miss Jackman, he would have proceeded at once to the schoolroom and meted out punishment on Daddy Rowe, which he intended for me. Something to crow over. The little village of St. Anthony had good reason to become elated when the news spread up and down Main Street and was heralded to St. Paul that three crows had perched on the banner of our village during the early morning of June 26, 1859, when Mrs. Isaac Crow gave birth to three white crows, two girls and one boy. The father of these three birds, wingless, though fairest of the fair, was a prominent attorney of St. Anthony and one of its aldermen. Bridge of size, 900 feet long. It was while our family resided on the picturesque spot overlooking St. Anthony's Falls in the year 1857, the Howe Trust Passenger Bridge was completed from the east to the west side of the Mississippi River, a short distance down the hill from the State University, at a cost of $52,000. All went well as a means of traffic, and many a dollar was taken in for toll, but an evil time came to disturb conditions, owing to an overabundance of rain which came in torrents, which caused the river to rise to that extent that the logs which followed in the wake of the flood acted as a battering ram and proved too much for the structure, and great was the fall thereof. I, among others of our family, were witnesses of this event, which took place at eight o'clock on the morning of June 1st, 1859. Mr. Michael Teeter, 1857. Tom and Bill were the first horses which came into Lyle Township. They were fine, powerful fellows, and created much comment throughout that section of the country. Some of my neighbors envied me my prize, while others thought that a fool and his money had easily parted, for I had paid three hundred and forty dollars for them, and the best yoke of oxen in the countryside could be bought for seventy. But I was well satisfied, for I was able to do my work and get about quickly. When haste was necessary, Bill and Tom were pressed into service. I recall very well one dark, rainy night when I was taking a neighbor to nurse a settler who lived at some distance to the west. So thick was the darkness that we could never have kept the trail had it not been for the flashes of vivid lightning. The horses showed so much intelligence through it all that I finally gave them the lines and they brought us safely to our destination. New Year's Day, 58, we took the ladies of Otranto Village for a sleigh ride, not on the snow, for the ground was bare, but on the Red Cedar River, which was frozen clear and smooth as glass. We fairly flew over the ice, 
and the homemade sleigh swerved from side to side as Bill and Tom took it upon themselves to show off their speed to friends who were in the habit of riding behind deliberate and stubborn oxen. Suddenly, without warning, the sleigh tipped, and we found ourselves in a heap, and although there was much shouting and crying, no damage was done, and the little shaking up tended to make the day memorable. Another incident that stands out vividly in my mind after all these years has no amusing aspect. Late in the fall of 57, I found it necessary to make a trip to Decorah, Iowa, for supplies of various kinds. My absence from home was to be shorter than usual on such trips, for Bill and Tom had endurance as well as speed. All went well during the journey, and on my return I halted for supper at Little Cedar and hoped to reach home that evening. When I was ready to start, the tavern keeper told me that I had better stay the night, for a prairie fire was sweeping from the northwest. This was unwelcome news, but sure enough, the red light was very bright and growing more so all the time. I calculated the distance and decided to hasten on across the path of the fire before it reached the road, so I started. I had miscomputed both time and distance, so before I was aware of it, I found myself on a small knoll with a fire directly in front and coming on at a great rate through the tall, dry weeds and grass. The horses snorted and shook their heads, but I urged them on. They plunged forward, and in a very short time, although it seemed hours, we found ourselves out of the flames. We paused but a moment to rest, for the ground was very hot. The horses shook with fright, and their bodies were badly singed. We reached home in safety, and I think Bill and Tom were no less thankful than was I to be out of the danger and discomfort of the situation. In 1857, I moved from Decorah, Iowa, to Otranto on the state line. There I found a number of families living in rude houses, which were a poor protection against the hard winters we had those early years. There was plenty of good timber along the Red Cedar River, but the settlers were farmers who had little or no experience in cutting and dressing logs, and for that reason handled their few small tools to poor advantage. They were anxious, too, to be breaking the prairie so that a crop could be harvested that first year. So, after all, these first houses were rather poor specimens of the joiner's craft. I was a carpenter and put up a rather more substantial house than the others, but none too comfortable during the winters that were to follow. The unbroken stretch of prairie to the north and west of Otranto gave those old northwesters a splendid sweep before they struck our frail little homes. Fortunately, there was plenty of fine wood, but the cracks were so numerous and large in our houses that we veritably warmed the outdoors in keeping ourselves warm. We chopped and sawed wood every spare moment in winter and summer in order to keep the booming fires which were necessary all winter long. We used to talk and think much of the settlers who were on the prairie, who were so unsheltered and far from standing timber. This yarn about one of them went the rounds and was enjoyed by all, for the victim was a merry fellow and always ready for a joke, no matter how great the privations and anxieties. The story runs thus. Jim sat before a fine fire washing his feet. Soothed by the warmth of the room and the water, he fell asleep, to awaken suddenly toward morning with his feet nearly to his knees embedded in a solid cake of ice. We laughed at our hardships, for there was no escaping them, and we learned to turn them, as well as everything else we possessed, to some useful purpose. Robes, buffalo coats, all available garments were used during those first winters for bed clothing. There was one flock of chickens in Otranto, but not until much later were flocks of ducks and geese raised so that feather pillows and beds could be used. Floor covering at first was uncommon, but finally rag carpets added to the comfort of the home during the winter. Had food been abundant, or even sufficient, we would have felt less anxious 
but with the winter hanging on far into the spring months, we had good reason to watch our stores carefully. Buckwheat ground in a coffee mill kept one family for two months in the winter of 57. Another neighbor's family subsisted upon musty cornmeal ground by revolving a cannonball in the scooped-out trunk of a tree. So long drawn out was the winter that the amount of meal for each member of the family was carefully measured out each day. One family, living near the river, could get plenty of fish through the ice, but having no fat in which to fry them, were obliged to use them boiled. When their salt was exhausted, they ate the fish unflavored. I possessed a good team of horses and made trips to Decorah for supplies. I went only when it was really necessary, for the journey was beset with many dangers and discomforts. Flour and salt pork were the foods purchased, which I sold to the other settlers in small quantities. Prairie chickens were abundant, and some of the pioneers tried drying the breasts and found that one way to provide meat for the winter. In the winter of 56, there was a thick coating of ice over the snow, sufficiently strong to hold a man's weight, but the deer's legs cut through the crust. My neighbors told of how easily they were able to get plenty of venison without venturing far from home. Never did a settler dare to go far away to hunt during those first winters, for the dangers of being lost and frozen were very great. I have often heard the wish expressed that fresh meat could be had every winter, with as few risks as in that year before I moved to Otranto. We all felt the lack of fruit, for all of us had come from districts where fruit was grown. So on festive days, such as Thanksgiving and Christmas, we had dried wild crab apples boiled up in soda water, then sweetened with molasses. We were all used to better than this, but we never complained and felt that better times were coming. End of section 42. Recording by Paul Simonon.